Feminine Intuition For the first time in the history of United States Robots and Mechanical Men Corporation, a robot had been destroyed through accident on Earth itself. No one was to blame. The air vehicle had been demolished in mid-air, and an unbelieving investigating committee was wondering whether they really dared announce the evidence that it had been hit by a meteorite. Nothing else could have been fast enough to prevent automatic avoidance. Nothing else could have done the damage short of a nuclear blast, and that was out of the question. Tie that in with a report of a flash in the night sky just before the vehicle had exploded, and from Flagstaff Observatory, not from an amateur, and the location of a sizable and distinctly meteoric bit of iron freshly gouged into the ground a mile from the site, and what other conclusion could be arrived at? Still, nothing like that had ever happened before, and calculations of the odds against it yielded monstrous figures. Yet even colossal improbabilities can happen sometimes. At the offices of United States Robots, the hows and whys of it were secondary. The real point was that a robot had been destroyed. That in itself was distressing. The fact that JN-5 had been a prototype, the first after four earlier attempts to have been placed in the field, was even more distressing. The fact that JN-5 was a radically new type of robot, quite different from anything ever built before, was abysmally distressing. The fact that JN-5 had apparently accomplished something before its destruction that was incalculably important, and that that accomplishment might now be forever gone, placed the distress utterly beyond words. It seemed scarcely worth mentioning that, along with the robot, the chief robopsychologist of United States robots had also died. Clinton Medarian had joined the firm ten years before. For five of those years he had worked uncomplainingly under the grumpy supervision of Susan Calvin. Medarian's brilliance was quite obvious, and Susan Calvin had quietly promoted him over the heads of older men. She wouldn't in any case have deigned to give her reasons for this to research director Peter Bogert, but as it happened no reasons were needed, or rather they were obvious. Medarian was utterly the reverse of the renowned Dr. Calvin in several very noticeable ways. He was not quite as overweight as his distinct double chin made him appear to be, but even so he was overpowering in his presence, where Susan had gone nearly unnoticed. Medarian's massive face, his shock of glistening red-brown hair, his ruddy complexion and booming voice, his loud laugh, and most of all his irrepressible self-confidence and his eager way of announcing his successes, made everyone else in the room feel there was a shortage of space. When Susan Calvin finally retired, refusing, in advance, any cooperation with respect to any testimonial dinner that might be planned in her honor, with so firm a manner that no announcement of the retirement was even made to the news services, Medarian took her place. He had been in his new post exactly one day when he initiated the JN project. It had meant the largest commitment of funds to one project that United States robots had ever had to undertake, but that was something which Medarian dismissed with a genial wave of the hand. "'Worth every penny of it, Peter,' he said, "'and I expect you to convince the board of directors of that.' "'Give me reasons,' said Bogart, wondering if Medarian would. Susan Calvin had never given reasons. But Medarian said, Sure, and settled himself easily into the large armchair in the director's office. Bogart watched the other with something that was almost awe. His own once black hair was almost white now, and within the decade he would follow Susan into retirement. That would mean the end of the original team that had built United States robots into a globe-girdling firm that was a rival of the national governments in complexity and importance. Somehow neither he nor those who had gone before him ever quite grasped the enormous expansion of the firm. But this was a new generation. The new men were at ease with the Colossus. They lacked the touch of wonder that would have them tiptoeing in disbelief. So they moved ahead, and that was good. Medarian said, I propose to begin the construction of robots without constraint. 
without the three laws? Surely. No, Peter. Are those the only constraints you can think of? Hell, you contributed to the design of the early positronic brains. Do I have to tell you that, quite aside from the three laws, there isn't a pathway in those brains that isn't carefully designed and fixed? We have robots planned for specific tasks, implanted with specific abilities. And you propose that at every level below the three laws the paths be made open-ended. It's not difficult. Bogert said dryly, It's not difficult indeed. Useless things are never difficult. The difficult thing is fixing the paths and making the robot useful. But why is that difficult? Fixing the paths requires a great deal of effort because the principle of uncertainty is important in particles the mass of positrons, and the uncertainty effect must be minimized. Yet why must it? If we arrange to have the principle just sufficiently prominent to allow the crossing of paths unpredictably, we have an unpredictable robot. We have a creative robot, said Medarian, with a trace of impatience. Peter, if there's anything a human brain has that a robotic brain has never had, it's the trace of unpredictability that comes from the effects of uncertainty at the subatomic level. I admit that this effect has never been demonstrated experimentally within the nervous system, but without that the human brain is not superior to the robotic brain in principle. And you think that if you introduce the effect into the robotic brain, the human brain will become not superior to the robotic brain in principle? That, said Medarian, is exactly what I believe. They went on for a long time after that. The board of directors clearly had no intention of being easily convinced. Scott Robertson, the largest shareholder in the firm, said, It's hard enough to manage the robot industry as it is, with public hostility to robots forever on the verge of breaking out into the open. If the public gets the idea that robots will be uncontrolled, oh, don't tell me about the three laws. The average man won't believe the three laws will protect him if he as much as hears the word uncontrolled. Then don't use it, said Medarian. Call the robot, call it intuitive. An intuitive robot, someone muttered. A girl robot? A smile made its way about the conference table. Medarian seized on that. All right. A girl robot. Our robots are sexless, of course, and so will this one be, but we always act as though they're males. We give them male pet names and call them he and him. Now this one, if we consider the nature of the mathematical structuring of the brain which I have proposed, would fall into the JN coordinate system. The first robot would be JN1, and I've assumed that it would be called John 1. I'm afraid that is the level of originality of the average roboticist. But why not call it Jane One, damn it? If the public has to be let in on what we're doing, we're constructing a feminine robot with intuition. Robertson shook his head. What difference would that make? What you're saying is that you plan to remove the last barrier which in principle keeps the robotic brain inferior to the human brain. What do you suppose the public reaction will be to that? Do you plan to make that public? said Medarian. He thought a bit and then said, Look, one thing the general public believes is that women are not as intelligent as men. There was an instant apprehensive look on the face of more than one man at the table, and a quick look up and down as though Susan Calvin were still in her accustomed seat. Medarian said, If we announce a female robot, it doesn't matter what she is. The public will automatically assume she is mentally backward. We just publicize the robot as Jane One, and we don't have to say another word. We're safe. Actually, said Peter Bogert quietly, there's more to it than that. Medarian and I have gone over the mathematics carefully, and the JN series, whether John or Jane, would be quite safe. They would be less complex and intellectually capable, in an orthodox sense, than many another series we have designed and constructed. There would only be the one added factor of, well, let's get into the habit of calling it intuition. Who knows what it would do, muttered Robertson. Medarian has suggested one thing it can do. As you all know, the space jump has been developed in principle. It is possible for men to attain what is, in effect, hyperspeeds beyond that of light, and to visit other stellar systems and return in negligible time, weeks at the most. 
Robertson said. That's not new to us. It couldn't have been done without robots. Exactly, and it's not doing us any good because we can't use the hyperspeed drive except perhaps once as a demonstration, so that U.S. robots gets little credit. The space jump is risky. It's fearfully prodigal of energy, and therefore it's enormously expensive. If we were going to use it anyway, it would be nice if we could report the existence of a habitable planet. Call it a psychological need. Spend about twenty billion dollars on a single space jump and report nothing but scientific data, and the public wants to know why their money was wasted. Report the existence of a habitable planet, and you're an interstellar Columbus, and no one will worry about the money. So? So, where are we going to find a habitable planet? Or put it this way, which star within reach of the space jump as presently developed, which of the 300,000 stars and star systems within 300 light years has the best chance of having a habitable planet? We've got an enormous quantity of details on every star in our 300 light year neighborhood, and a notion that almost every one has a planetary system. But which has a habitable planet? Which do we visit? We don't know. One of the directors said, How would this Jane robot help us? Madarian was about to answer that, but he gestured slightly to Bogert, and Bogert understood. The director would carry more weight. Bogert didn't particularly like the idea. If the JN series proved a fiasco, he was making himself prominent enough in connection with it to ensure that the sticky fingers of blame would cling to him. On the other hand, retirement was not all that far off, and if it worked he would go out in a blaze of glory. Maybe it was only Madarian's aura of confidence, but Bogart had honestly come to believe it would work. He said, It may well be that somewhere in the libraries of data we have on those stars there are methods for estimating the probabilities of the presence of Earth-type habitable planets. All we need to do is understand the data properly. Look at them in the appropriate creative manner. Make the correct correlations. We haven't done it yet, or if some astronomer has, he hasn't been smart enough to realize what he has. A JN-type robot could make correlations far more rapidly and far more precisely than a man could. In a day, it would make and discard as many correlations as a man could in ten years. Furthermore, it would work in truly random fashion whereas a man would have a strong bias based on preconception and on what is already believed. There was a considerable silence after that. Finally, Robertson said, But it's only a matter of probability, isn't it? Suppose this robot said the highest probability habitable planet star within so-and-so light years is Squidgy 17 or whatever, and we go there and find that a probability is only a probability, and that there are no habitable planets after all. Where does that leave us? Madarian struck in this time. We still win. We know how the robot came to the conclusion, because it, she, will tell us. It might well help us gain enormous insight into astronomical detail, and make the whole thing worth while even if we don't make the space jump at all. Besides, we can then work out the five most probable sites of planets, and the probability that one of the five has a habitable planet may then be better than 0.95 it would be almost sure. They went on for a long time after that. The funds granted were quite insufficient, but Madarian counted on the habit of throwing good money after bad. With two hundred million about to be lost irrevocably when another hundred million could save everything, the other hundred million would surely be voted. Jane One was finally built and put on display. Peter Bogert studied it, her, gravely. He said, Why the narrow waist? Surely that introduces a mechanical weakness. Madarian chuckled. Listen, if we're going to call her Jane, there's no point in making her look like Tarzan. Bogert shook his head. Don't like it. You'll be bulging her higher up to give the appearance of breasts next, and that's a rotten idea. If women start getting the notion that robots may look like women, I can tell you exactly the kind of perverse notions they'll get, and you'll really have hostility on their part. Madarian said, Maybe you're right at that. No woman wants to feel replaceable by something with none of her faults. Okay. Jane, too, did not have the pinched waist. 
She was a somber robot which rarely moved and even more rarely spoke. Madarian had only occasionally come rushing to Bogert with items of news during her construction, and that had been a sure sign that things were going poorly. Madarian's ebullience under success was overpowering. He would not hesitate to invade Bogert's bedroom at 3 a.m. with a hot flash item rather than wait for the morning. Bogert was sure of that. Now Madarian seemed subdued, his usually florid expression nearly pale, his round cheeks somehow pinched. Bogert said, with a feeling of certainty, She won't talk. Oh, she talks. Madarian sat down heavily and chewed at his lower lip. Sometimes, anyway, he said. Bogert rose and circled the robot. And when she talks, she makes no sense, I suppose. Well, if she doesn't talk, she's no female, is she? Madarian tried a weak smile for size and abandoned it. He said, The brain, in isolation, checked out. I know, said Bogart. But once that brain was put in charge of the physical apparatus of the robot, it was necessarily modified, of course. Of course, agreed Bogart unhelpfully. But unpredictably and frustratingly. The trouble is that when you're dealing with n-dimensional calculus of uncertainty, things are— Uncertain, said Bogart. His own reaction was surprising him. The company investment was already most sizable, and almost two years had elapsed, yet the results were, to put it politely, disappointing. Still, he found himself jabbing at Madarian and finding himself amused in the process. Almost furtively, Bogart wondered if it weren't the absent Susan Calvin he was jabbing at. Madarian was so much more ebullient and effusive than Susan could ever possibly be when things were going well. He was also far more vulnerably in the dumps when things weren't going well, and it was precisely under pressure that Susan never cracked. The target that Madarian made could be a neatly punctured bullseye, as recompense for the target Susan had never allowed herself to be. Madarian did not react to Bogart's last remark any more than Susan Calvin would have done, not out of contempt, which would have been Susan's reaction, but because he did not hear it. He said argumentatively, The trouble is the matter of recognition. We have Jane, too, correlating magnificently. She can correlate on any subject, but once she's done so, she can't recognize a valuable result from a valueless one. It's not an easy problem, judging how to program a robot to tell a significant correlation, when you don't know what correlations she will be making. I presume you've thought of lowering the potential at the W-21 diode junction and sparking across the— No, 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 Madarian faded off into a whispering diminuendo. You can't just have it spew out everything. We can do that for ourselves. The point is to have it recognize the crucial correlation and draw the conclusion. Once that is done, you see, a Jane robot would snap out an answer by intuition. It would be something we couldn't get ourselves except by the oddest kind of luck. It seems to me, said Bogart dryly, that if you had a robot like that, you would have her do routinely what, among human beings, only the occasional genius is capable of doing. Madarian nodded vigorously. Exactly, Peter. I'd have said so myself if I weren't afraid of frightening off the execs. Please don't repeat that in their hearing. Do you really want a robot genius? What are words? I'm trying to get a robot with the capacity to make random correlations at enormous speeds, together with a key significance high recognition quotient. And I'm trying to put those words into positronic field equations. I thought I had it, too, but I don't. Not yet. He looked at Jane, too, discontentedly, and said, What's the best significance you have, Jane? Jane, too's head turned to look at Madarian, but she made no sound, and Madarian whispered with resignation, She's running that into the correlation banks. Jane, too, spoke tonelessly at last. I'm not sure. It was the first sound she had made. Madarian's eyes rolled upward. She's doing the equivalent of setting up equations with indeterminate solutions. I gathered that, said Bogart. Listen, Madarian, can you go anywhere at this point, or do we pull out now and cut our losses at half a billion? Oh, I'll get it, muttered Madarian. 
Jane Three wasn't it. She was never as much as activated, and Madarian was in a rage. It was human error, his own fault, if one wanted to be entirely accurate. Yet though Madarian was utterly humiliated, others remained quiet. Let he who has never made an error in the fearsomely intricate mathematics of the positronic brain fill out the first memo of correction. Nearly a year passed before Jane Four was ready. Madarian was ebullient again. She does it, he said. She's got a good high recognition quotient. He was confident enough to place her on display before the board and have her solve problems. Not mathematical problems, any robot could do that but problems where the terms were deliberately misleading without being actually inaccurate. Bogert said afterward, That doesn't take much, really. Of course not. It's elementary for Jane Four, but I had to show them something, didn't I? Do you know how much we've spent so far? Come on, Peter, don't give me that. Do you know how much we've got back? These things don't go on in a vacuum, you know. I've had over three years of hell over this, if you want to know but I've worked out new techniques of calculation that will save us a minimum of $50,000 on every new type of positronic brain we design, from now on and forever, right? Well, well me no wells, it's so. And it's my personal feeling that n-dimensional calculus of uncertainty can have any number of other applications if we have the ingenuity to find them, and my Jane robots will find them. Once I've got exactly what I want, the new JN series will pay for itself inside of five years, even if we triple what we've invested so far. What do you mean by exactly what you want? What's wrong with Jane Four? Nothing. Or nothing much. She's on the track, but she can be improved, and I intend to do so. I thought I knew where I was going when I designed her. Now I've tested her, and I know where I'm going. I intend to get there. Jane Five was it. It took Madarian well over a year to produce her, and there he had no reservations. He was utterly confident. Jane Five was shorter than the average robot, slimmer. Without being a female caricature, as Jane One had been, she managed to possess an air of femininity about herself, despite the absence of a single clearly feminine feature. "'It's the way she's standing,' said Bogart. Her arms were held gracefully, and somehow the torso managed to give the impression of curving slightly when she turned. Madarian said, Listen to her. How do you feel, Jane? In excellent health, thank you, said Jane Five, and the voice was precisely that of a woman. It was a sweet and almost disturbing contralto. Why did you do that, Clinton? said Peter, startled and beginning to frown. Psychologically important, said Medarian. I want people to think of her as a woman, to treat her as a woman, to explain. What people? Medarian put his hands in his pockets and stared thoughtfully at Bogart. I would like to have arrangements made for Jane and myself to go to Flagstaff. Bogart couldn't help but note that Medarian didn't say Jane Five. He made use of no number this time. She was the Jane. He said doubtfully, To Flagstaff? Why? Because that's the world center for general planetology, isn't it? It's where they're studying the stars and trying to calculate the probability of habitable planets, isn't it? I know that, but it's on Earth. Well, and I surely know that. Robotic movements on Earth are strictly controlled, and there's no need for it. Bring a library of books on general planetology here, and let Jane absorb them. No. Peter, will you get it through your head that Jane isn't the ordinary logical robot? She's intuitive. So? So how can we tell what she needs, what she can use, what will set her off? We can use any metal model in the factory to read books. That's frozen data and out of date besides. Jane must have living information. She must have tones of voice. She must have side issues. She must have total irrelevancies, even. How the devil do we know what or when something will go click-click inside her and fall into a pattern? If we knew, we wouldn't need her at all, would we? Bogart began to feel harassed. He said, Then bring the men here, the general planetologists. Here won't be any good. They'll be out of their element. They won't react naturally. 
I want Jane to watch them at work. I want her to see their instruments, their offices, their desks, everything about them that she can. I want you to arrange to have her transported to Flagstaff, and I'd really like not to discuss it any further. For a moment he almost sounded like Susan. Bogart winced and said, It's complicated making such an arrangement, transporting an experimental robot. Jane isn't experimental. She's the fifth of the series. The other four weren't really working models. Medarian lifted his hands in helpless frustration. Who's forcing you to tell the government that? I'm not worried about the government. It can be made to understand special cases. It's public opinion. We've come a long way in fifty years, and I don't propose to be set back twenty-five of them by having you lose control of a— I won't lose control. You're making foolish remarks. Look, U.S. robots can afford a private plane. We can land quietly at the nearest commercial airport and be lost in hundreds of similar landings. We can arrange to have a large ground car with an enclosed body meet us and take us to Flagstaff. Jane will be crated, and it will be obvious that some piece of thoroughly non-robotic equipment is being transported to the labs. We won't get a second look from anyone. The men at Flagstaff will be alerted, and will be told the exact purpose of the visit. They will have every motive to cooperate and to prevent a leak. Bogart pondered. The risky part will be the plane and the ground car. If anything happens to the crate, nothing will. We might get away with it if Jane is deactivated during transport, then even if someone finds out she's inside. No, Peter, that can't be done. Uh-uh, not Jane Five. Look, she's been free associating since she was activated. The information she possesses can be put into freeze during deactivation, but the free associations never. No, sir, she can't ever be deactivated. But then, if somehow it is discovered that we are transporting an activated robot, it won't be found out. Madarian remained firm, and the plane eventually took off. It was a late-model automatic computer jet, but it carried a human pilot, one of U.S. Robot's own employees, as backup. The crate containing Jane arrived at the airport safely, was transferred to the ground car, and reached the research laboratories at Flagstaff without incident. Peter Bogart received his first call from Medarian not more than an hour after the latter's arrival at Flagstaff. Medarian was ecstatic, and characteristically could not wait to report. The message arrived by tubed laser beam, shielded, scrambled, and ordinarily impenetrable, but Bogart felt exasperated. He knew it could be penetrated if someone with enough technological ability, the government, for example, was determined to do so. The only real safety lay in the fact that the government had no reason to try. At least Bogart hoped so. He said, For God's sake, do you have to call? Madarian ignored him entirely. He burbled, It was an inspiration. Sheer genius, I tell you. For a while Bogart stared at the receiver. Then he shouted incredulously, You mean you've got the answer? Already? No, no. Give us time, damn it. I mean, the matter of her voice was an inspiration. Listen, after we were chauffeured from the airport to the main administration building at Flagstaff, we uncrated Jane and she stepped out of the box. When that happened, every man in the place stepped back. Scared, nitwits. If even scientists can't understand the significance of the laws of robotics, what can we expect of the average untrained individual? For a minute there I thought, this will all be useless. They won't talk. They'll be keying themselves for a quick break in case she goes berserk, and they'll be able to think of nothing else. Well, then, what are you getting at? So then she greeted them routinely. She said, Good afternoon, gentlemen. I am so glad to meet you. And it came out in this beautiful contralto. That was it. One man straightened his tie, and another ran his fingers through his hair. What really got me was that the oldest guy in the place actually checked his fly to make sure it was zipped. They're all crazy about her now. All they needed was the voice. She isn't a robot any more. She's a girl. You mean they're talking to her? Are they talking to her? I should say so. I should have programmed her for sexy intonations. They'd be asking her for dates right now if I had. Talk about conditioned reflex. Listen, men respond to voices. At the most intimate moments, are they looking? It's the voice in your ear. Yes, Clinton, I seem to remember. 
Where's Jane now? With them. They won't let go of her. Damn! Get in there with her! Don't let her out of your sight, man! Medarian's calls thereafter, during his ten-day stay at Flagstaff, were not very frequent and became progressively less exalted. Jane was listening carefully, he reported, and occasionally she responded. She remained popular. She was given entry everywhere. But there were no results. Bogart said, Nothing at all? Medarian was at once defensive. You can't say nothing at all. It's impossible to say nothing at all with an intuitive robot. You don't know what might not be going on inside her. This morning she asked Jensen what he had for breakfast. Rossiter Jensen, the astrophysicist? Yes, of course. As it turned out, he didn't have breakfast that morning. Well, a cup of coffee. So Jane's learning to make small talk. That scarcely makes up for the expense. Oh, don't be a jackass. It wasn't small talk. Nothing is small talk for Jane. She asked because it had something to do with some sort of cross-correlation she was building in her mind. What can it possibly— How do I know? If I knew, I'd be a Jane myself, and you wouldn't need her. But it has to mean something. She's programmed for high motivation to obtain an answer to the question of a planet with optimum habitability distance, and— Then let me know when she's done that, and not before. It's not really necessary for me to get a blow-by-blow -blow description of possible correlations. He didn't really expect to get notification of success. With each day, Bogert grew less sanguine, so that when the notification finally came, he wasn't ready. And it came at the very end. That last time, when Medarian's climactic message came in, it came in what was almost a whisper. Exaltation had come complete circle, and Medarian was awed into quiet. She did it, he said. She did it. After I all but gave up, too after she had received everything in the place, and most of it twice and three times over, and never said a word that sounded like anything. I'm on the plane now, returning. We've just taken off. Bogert managed to get his breath. Don't play games, man. You have the answer? Say so if you have. Say it plainly. She has the answer. She's given me the answer. She's given me the names of three stars within eighty light years, which she says have a sixty to ninety percent chance of possessing one habitable planet each. The probability that at least one has is zero point nine seven two. It's almost certain. And that's just the least of it. Once we get back, she can give us the exact line of reasoning that led her to the conclusion, and I predict that the whole science of astrophysics and cosmology will— Are you sure? You think I'm having hallucinations? I even have a witness. Poor guy jumped two feet when Jane suddenly began to reel out the answer in her gorgeous voice. And that was when the meteorite struck, and in the thorough destruction of the plane that followed, Medarian and the pilot were reduced to gobbets of bloody flesh, and no usable remnant of Jane was recovered. The gloom at U.S. robots had never been deeper. Robertson attempted to find consolation in the fact that the very completeness of the destruction had utterly hidden the illegalities of which the firm had been guilty. Peter shook his head and mourned. We've lost the best chance U.S. robots ever had of gaining an unbeatable public image, of overcoming the damned Frankenstein complex. What it would have meant for robots to have one of them work out the solution to the habitable planet problem after other robots had helped work out the space jump. Robots would have opened the galaxy to us. And if at the same time we could have driven scientific knowledge forward in a dozen different directions, as we surely would have— Oh, God! There's no way of calculating the benefits to the human race, and to us, of course. Robertson said, We could build other Janes, couldn't we? Even without Medarian? Sure we could. But can we depend on the proper correlation again? Who knows how low probability that final result was? What if Medarian had had a fantastic piece of beginner's luck, and then to have an even more fantastic piece of bad luck, a meteorite zeroing in? It's simply unbelievable. Robertson said in a hesitating whisper, It couldn't have been meant. I mean, if we weren't meant to know, and if the meteorite was a judgment from... He faded off under Bogert's withering glare. Bogert said, It's not a dead loss, I suppose. 
Other Janes are bound to help us in some ways. And we can give other robots feminine voices if that will help encourage public acceptance. Though I wonder what the women would say. If we only knew what Jane Five had said. In that last call, Madarian said there was a witness. Bogart said, I know. I've been thinking about that. Don't you suppose I've been in touch with Flagstaff? Nobody in the entire place heard Jane say anything that was out of the ordinary, anything that sounded like an answer to the habitable planet problem. And certainly anyone there should have recognized the answer if it came, or at least recognized it as a possible answer. Could Madarian have been lying? Or crazy? Could he have been trying to protect himself? You mean he may have been trying to save his reputation by pretending he had the answer and then gimmick Jane so she couldn't talk and say, Oh, sorry, something happened accidentally. Oh, darn. I won't accept that for a minute. You might as well suppose he had arranged the meteorite. Then what do we do? Bogert said heavily. Turn back to Flagstaff. The answer must be there. I've got to dig deeper, that's all. I'm going there and I'm taking a couple of the men in Medarian's department. We've got to go through that place top to bottom and end to end. But, you know, even if there were a witness and he had heard, what good would it do, now that we don't have Jane to explain the process? Every little something is useful. Jane gave the names of the stars, the catalog numbers, probably. None of the named stars has a chance. If someone can remember her saying that and actually remember the catalog number— or have heard it clearly enough to allow it to be recovered by psychoprobe if he lacked the conscious memory, then we'll have something. Given the results at the end and the data fed Jane at the beginning, we might be able to reconstruct the line of reasoning. We might recover the intuition. If that is done, we've saved the game. Bogart was back after three days, silent and thoroughly depressed. When Robertson inquired anxiously as to results, he shook his head. Nothing. Nothing? Absolutely nothing. I spoke with every man in Flagstaff, every scientist, every technician, every student, that had had anything to do with Jane, everyone that had as much as seen her. The number wasn't great. I'll give Madarian credit for that much discretion. He only allowed those to see her who might conceivably have had planetological knowledge to feed her. There were twenty-three men altogether who had seen Jane, and of those only twelve had spoken to her more than casually. I went over and over all that Jane had said. They remembered everything quite well. They're keen men engaged in a crucial experiment involving their specialty, so they had every motivation to remember. And they were dealing with a talking robot, something that was startling enough, and one that talked like a TV actress. They couldn't forget. Robertson said, maybe a psychoprobe. If one of them had the vaguest thought that something had happened, I would screw out his consent to probing. But there's nothing to leave room for an excuse, and to probe two dozen men who make their living from their brains can't be done. Honestly, it wouldn't help. If Jane had mentioned three stars and said they had habitable planets, it would have been like setting up skyrockets in their brains. How could any one of them forget? Then maybe one of them is lying, said Robertson grimly. He wants the information for his own use, to get the credit himself later. What good would that do him, said Bogart. The whole establishment knows exactly why Madarian and Jane were there in the first place. They know why I came there in the second. If at any time in the future any man now at Flagstaff suddenly comes up with a habitable planet theory that is startlingly new and different, yet valid, Every other man at Flagstaff and every man at U.S. Robots will know at once that he had stolen it. He'd never get away with it. Then Medarian himself was somehow mistaken. I don't see how I can believe that, either. Medarian had an irritating personality. All robo-psychologists have irritating personalities, I think, which must be why they work with robots rather than with men. But he was no dummy. He couldn't be wrong in something like this. Then, but Robertson had run out of possibilities. They had reached a blank wall, and for some minutes each stared at it disconsolately. Finally, Robertson stirred. Peter? Well? Let's ask Susan. Bogart stiffened. What? Let's ask Susan. Let's call her and ask her to come in. Why? What can she possibly do? I don't know, but she's a robo-psychologist, too. 
and she might understand Madarian better than we do. Besides, she—oh, hell, she always had more brains than any of us. She's nearly eighty. And you're seventy. What about it? Bogart sighed. Had her abrasive tongue lost any of its rasp in the years of her retirement? He said, Well, I'll ask her. Susan Calvin entered Bogert's office with a slow look around before her eyes fixed themselves on the research director. She had aged a great deal since her retirement. Her hair was a fine white, and her face seemed to have crumpled. She had grown so frail as to be almost transparent, and only her eyes, piercing and uncompromising, seemed to remain of all that had been. Bogert strode forward heartily, holding out his hand. Susan! Susan Calvin took it and said, You're looking reasonably well, Peter, for an old man. If I were you, I wouldn't wait till next year. Retire now and let the young men get to it. And Madarian is dead. Are you calling me in to take over my old job? Are you determined to keep the ancients till a year past actual physical death? No, no, Susan. I've called you in. He stopped. He did not, after all, have the faintest idea of how to start. But Susan read his mind now as easily as she always had. She seated herself with the caution born of stiffened joints and said, Peter, you've called me in because you're in bad trouble. Otherwise you'd sooner see me dead than within a mile of you. Come, Susan, don't waste time on pretty talk. I never had time to waste when I was forty, and certainly not now. Madarian's death and your call to me are both unusual, so there must be a connection. Two unusual events without a connection is too low probability to worry about. Begin at the beginning, and don't worry about revealing yourself to be a fool. That was revealed to me long ago. Bogert cleared his throat miserably and began. She listened carefully, her withered hand lifting once in a while to stop him so that she might ask a question. She snorted at one point. Feminine intuition! Is that what you wanted the robot for? You men! Faced with a woman reaching a correct conclusion, and unable to accept the fact that she is your equal or superior in intelligence, you invent something called feminine intuition. Ah, uh, yes, Susan, but let me continue. He did. When she was told of Jane's contralto voice, she said, It is a difficult choice sometimes whether to feel revolted at the male sex, or merely to dismiss them as contemptible. Bogart said, Well, let me go on. When he was quite done, Susan said, May I have the private use of this office for an hour or two? Yes, but, she said, I want to go over the various records, Jane's programming, Madarian's calls, your interviews at Flagstaff. I presume I can use that beautiful new shielded laser phone and your computer outlet if I wish. Yes, of course. Well, then get out of here, Peter. It was not quite forty-five minutes when she hobbled to the door, opened it, and called for Bogart. When Bogart came, Robertson was with him. Both entered, and Susan greeted the latter with an unenthusiastic, Hello, Scott. Bogart tried desperately to gauge the results from Susan's face, but it was only the face of a grim old lady who had no intention of making anything easy for him. He said cautiously, Do you think there's anything you can do, Susan? Beyond what I have already done? No, there's nothing more. Bogert's lips set in chagrin, but Robertson said, What have you already done, Susan? Susan said, I've thought a little, something I can't seem to persuade anyone else to do. For one thing, I've thought about Madarian. I knew him, you know. He had brains, but he was a very irritating extrovert. I thought you would like him after me, Peter. It was a change, Bogert couldn't resist saying. And he was always running to you with results the very minute he had them, wasn't he? Yes, he was. And yet, said Susan, his last message, the one in which he said Jane had given him the answer, was sent from the plane. Why did he wait so long? Why didn't he call you while he was still at Flagstaff, immediately after Jane had said whatever it was she said? I suppose, said Peter, that for once he wanted to check it thoroughly, and, well, I don't know. It was the most important thing that had ever happened to him. He might for once have wanted to wait and be sure of himself. 
On the contrary, the more important it was, the less he would wait, surely. And if he could manage to wait, why not do it properly and wait till he was back at U.S. Robots, so that he could check the results with all the computing equipment this firm could make available to him? In short, he waited too long from one point of view, and not long enough from another. Robertson interrupted. Then you think he was up to some trickery? Susan looked revolted. Scott, don't try to compete with Peter in making inane remarks. Let me continue. A second point concerns the witness. According to the records of that last call, Madarian said poor guy jumped two feet when Jane suddenly began to reel out the answer in her gorgeous voice. In fact, it was the last thing he said. And the question is then, why should the witness have jumped? Madarian had explained that all the men were crazy about that voice, and they had had ten days with the robot, with Jane. Why should the mere act of her speaking have startled them? Bogart said, I assumed it was astonishment at hearing Jane give an answer to a problem that has occupied the minds of planetologists for nearly a century. But they were waiting for her to give that answer. That was why she was there. Besides, consider the way the sentence is worded. Madarian's statement makes it seem the witness was startled, not astonished, if you see the difference. What's more, that reaction came when Jane suddenly began, in other words, at the very start of the statement. To be astonished at the content of what Jane said would have required the witness to have listened a while so that he might absorb it. Madarian would have said he had jumped two feet after he had heard Jane say thus and so. It would be after, not when, and the word suddenly would not be included. Bogart said uneasily, I don't think you can refine matters down to the use or non-use of a word. I can, said Susan frostily, because I am a robopsychologist, and I can expect Madarian to do so, too, because he was a robopsychologist. We have to explain those two anomalies, then, the queer delay before Madarian's call and the queer reaction of the witness. Can you explain them? asked Robertson. Of course, said Susan, since I use a little simple logic. Madarian called with the news without delay, as he always did, or with as little delay as he could manage. If Jane had solved the problem at Flagstaff, he would certainly have called from Flagstaff. Since he called from the plain, she must clearly have solved the problem after he had left Flagstaff. But then, let me finish, let me finish. Was Madarian not taken from the airport to Flagstaff in a heavy, enclosed ground car? And Jane in her crate with him? Yes. And presumably Madarian and the crated Jane returned from Flagstaff to the airport in the same heavy, enclosed ground car. Am I right? Yes, of course. And they were not alone in the ground car, either. In one of his calls, Madarian said, We were chauffeured from the airport to the main administration building and I suppose I am right in concluding that if he was chauffeured, then that was because there was a chauffeur, a human driver, in the car. Good God! The trouble with you, Peter, is that when you think of a witness to a planetological statement, you think of planetologists. You divide up human beings into categories, and despise and dismiss most. A robot cannot do that. The first law says a robot may not injure a human being, or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Any human being. That is the essence of the robotic view of life. A robot makes no distinction. To a robot all men are truly equal. And to a robopsychologist who must perforce deal with men at the robotic level, all men are truly equal too. It would not occur to Medarian to say a truck driver had heard this statement. To you a truck driver is not a scientist, but is a mere animate adjunct of a truck. But to Madarian he was a man and a witness, nothing more, nothing less. Bogart shook his head in disbelief. But are you sure? Of course I'm sure. How else can you explain the other point? Madarian's remark about the startling of the witness. Jane was crated, wasn't she? But she was not deactivated. According to the records, Madarian was always adamant against ever deactivating an intuitive robot. Moreover, Jane Five, like any of the Janes, was extremely non-talkative. Probably it never occurred to Madarian to order her to remain quiet within the crate, and it was within the crate that the pattern finally fell into place. Naturally she began to talk. A beautiful contralto voice suddenly sounded from inside the crate. If you were the truck driver, what would you do at that point? 
Surely you'd be startled. It's a wonder he didn't crash. But if the truck driver was the witness, why didn't he come forward? Why? Can he possibly know that anything crucial had happened, that what he heard was important? Besides, don't you suppose Madarian tipped him well and asked him not to say anything? Would you want the news to spread that an activated robot was being transported illegally over the Earth's surface? Well, will he remember what was said? Why not? It might seem to you, Peter, that a truck driver, one step above an ape in your view, can't remember. But truck drivers can have brains, too. The statements were most remarkable, and the driver may well have remembered some. Even if he gets some of the letters and numbers wrong, we're dealing with a finite set, you know, the fifty-five hundred stars or star systems within eighty light years or so. I haven't looked up the exact number. You can make the correct choices, and if needed you will have every excuse to use the psychoprobe. The two men stared at her. Finally Bogart, afraid to believe, whispered, But how can you be sure? For a moment Susan was on the point of saying, "'Because I've called Flagstaff, you fool, and because I spoke to the truck driver, and because he told me what he had heard, and because I've checked with the computer at Flagstaff and got the only three stars that fit the information, and because I have those names in my pocket.' But she didn't. Let him go through it all himself. Carefully she rose to her feet and said sardonically, "'How can I be sure? Call it feminine intuition.' The Bicentennial Man Andrew Martin said, Thank you, and took the seat offered him. He didn't look driven to the last resort, but he had been. He didn't actually look anything, for there was a smooth blankness to his face, except for the sadness one imagined one saw in his eyes. His hair was smooth, light brown, rather fine, and there was no facial hair. He looked freshly and cleanly shaved. His clothes were distinctly old-fashioned, but neat and predominantly of velvety red-purple in color. Facing him from behind the desk was the surgeon, and the nameplate on the desk included a fully identifying series of letters and numbers, which Andrew didn't bother with. To call him doctor would be quite enough. "'When can the operation be carried through, doctor?' he asked. The surgeon said softly, with that certain inalienable note of respect that a robot always used to a human being, I am not certain, sir, that I understand how or upon whom such an operation could be performed. There might have been a look of respectful intransigence on the surgeon's face, if a robot of his sort, in lightly bronzed stainless steel, could have had such an expression or any expression. Andrew Martin studied the robot's right hand, his cutting hand, as it lay on the desk in utter tranquillity. The fingers were long and shaped into artistically metallic looping curves, so graceful and appropriate that one could imagine a scalpel fitting them and becoming temporarily one piece with them. There would be no hesitation in his work, no stumbling, no quivering, no mistakes. That came with specialization, of course a specialization so fiercely desired by humanity that few robots were any longer independently brained. A surgeon, of course, would have to be, and this one, though brained, was so limited in his capacity that he did not recognize Andrew, had probably never heard of him. Andrew said, "'Have you ever thought you would like to be a man?' The surgeon hesitated a moment, as though the question fitted nowhere in his allotted positronic pathways. But I am a robot, sir. Would it be better to be a man? It would be better, sir, to be a better surgeon. I could not be so if I were a man, but only if I were a more advanced robot. I would be pleased to be a more advanced robot. It does not offend you that I can order you about, that I can make you stand up, sit down, move right or left, by merely telling you to do so? It is my pleasure to please you, sir. If your orders were to interfere with my functioning with respect to you or to any other human being, I would not obey you. The first law, concerning my duty to human safety, would take precedence over the second law relating to obedience. Otherwise, obedience is my pleasure. But upon whom am I to perform this operation? Upon me, said Andrew. But that is impossible. It is patently a damaging operation. That does not matter, said Andrew calmly. I must not inflict damage, said the surgeon. 
On a human being you must not, said Andrew. But I too am a robot. 2. Andrew had appeared much more a robot when he had first been manufactured. He had then been as much a robot in appearance as any that had ever existed, smoothly designed and functional. He had done well in the home to which he had been brought in those days when robots in households, or on the planet altogether, had been a rarity. There had been four in the home, Sir and Ma'am and Miss and Little Miss. He knew their names, of course, but he never used them. Sir was Gerald Martin. His own serial number was NDR. He forgot the numbers. It had been a long time, of course, but if he had wanted to remember, he could not forget. He had not wanted to remember. Little Miss had been the first to call him Andrew because she could not use the letters, and all the rest followed her in this. Little Miss. She had lived ninety years and was long since dead. He had tried to call her ma'am once, but she would not allow it. Little Miss she had been to her last day. Andrew had been intended to perform the duties of a valet, a butler, a lady's maid. Those were the experimental days for him, and indeed for all robots anywhere but in the industrial and exploratory factories and stations off Earth. The Martins enjoyed him, and half the time he was prevented from doing his work because Miss and Little Miss would rather play with him. It was Miss who understood first how this might be arranged. She said, We order you to play with us, and you must follow orders. Andrew said, I am sorry, Miss, but a prior order from Sir must surely take precedence. But she said, Daddy just said he hoped you would take care of the cleaning. That's not much of an order. I order you. Sir did not mind. Sir was fond of Miss and of Little Miss even more than Ma'am was, and Andrew was fond of them too. At least the effect they had upon his actions were those which, in a human being, would have been called the result of fondness. Andrew thought of it as fondness, for he did not know any other word for it. It was for Little Miss that Andrew had carved a pendant out of wood. She had ordered him to. Miss, it seemed, had received an ivorite pendant with scroll-work for her birthday, and Little Miss was unhappy over it. She had only a piece of wood, which she gave Andrew together with a small kitchen knife. He had done it quickly, and Little Miss said, "'That's nice, Andrew. I'll show it to Daddy.' Sir would not believe it. "'Where did you really get this, Mandy?' Mandy was what he called Little Miss. When Little Miss assured him she was really telling the truth, he turned to Andrew. "'Did you do this, Andrew?' "'Yes, sir.' "'The design, too?' "'Yes, sir.' "'From what did you copy the design?' "'It is a geometric representation, sir, that fit the grain of the wood.' The next day, Sir brought him another piece of wood, a larger one, and an electric vibro-knife. He said, Make something out of this, Andrew, anything you want to. Andrew did so, and Sir watched, then looked at the product a long time. After that, Andrew no longer waited on tables. He was ordered to read books on furniture design instead, and he learned to make cabinets and desks. Sir said, These are amazing productions, Andrew. Andrew said, I enjoy doing them, sir. Enjoy? It makes the circuits of my brain somehow flow more easily. I have heard you use the word enjoy, and the way you use it fits the way I feel. I enjoy doing them, sir. 3. Gerald Martin took Andrew to the regional offices of United States Robots and Mechanical Men Corporation. As a member of the regional legislature, he had no trouble at all in gaining an interview with the chief robo-psychologist. In fact, it was only as a member of the regional legislature that he qualified as a robot owner in the first place, in those early days when robots were rare. Andrew did not understand any of this at the time, but in later years, with greater learning, he could review that early scene and understand it in its proper light. The robo-psychologist, Merton Mansky, listened with a gathering frown, and more than once managed to stop his fingers at the point beyond which they would have irrevocably drummed on the table. He had drawn features and a lined forehead, and looked as though he might be younger than he looked. He said, 
Robotics is not an exact art, Mr. Martin. I cannot explain it to you in detail, but the mathematics governing the plotting of the positronic pathways is far too complicated to permit any but approximate solutions. Naturally, since we build everything about the three laws, those are incontrovertible. We will, of course, replace your robot. Not at all, said Sir. There is no question of failure on his part. He performs his assigned duties perfectly. The point is, he also carves wood in exquisite fashion, and never the same twice. He produces works of art. Mansky looked confused. Strange. Of course, we're attempting generalized pathways these days. Really creative, you think? See for yourself. Sir handed over a little sphere of wood on which there was a playground scene in which the boys and girls were almost too small to make out, yet they were in perfect proportion, and blended so naturally with the grain that that too seemed to have been carved. Mansky said, He did that? He handed it back with a shake of his head. The luck of the draw. Something in the pathways. Can you do it again? Probably not. Nothing like this has ever been reported. Good. I don't in the least mind Andrews being the only one. Mansky said, I suspect that the company would like to have your robot back for study. Sir said with a sudden grimness, Not a chance. Forget it. He turned to Andrew. Let's go home now. As you wish, sir, said Andrew. 4. Miss was dating boys and wasn't about the house much. It was Little Miss, not as little as she was, who filled Andrew's horizon now. She never forgot that the very first piece of wood carving he had done had been for her. She kept it on a silver chain about her neck. It was she who first objected to Sir's habit of giving away the productions. She said, Come on, Dad, if anyone wants one of them, let him pay for it. It's worth it. Sir said, It isn't like you to be greedy, Mandy. Not for us, Dad. For the artist. Andrew had never heard the word before, and when he had a moment to himself he looked it up in the dictionary. Then there was another trip, this time to Sir's lawyer. Sir said to him, What do you think of this, John? The lawyer was John Feingold. He had white hair and a pudgy belly, and the rims of his contact lenses were tinted a bright green. He looked at the small plaque Sir had given him. This is beautiful, but I've heard the news. This is a carving made by your robot, the one you've brought with you. Yes, Andrew does them, don't you, Andrew? Yes, sir, said Andrew. How much would you pay for that, John? asked sir. I can't say. I'm not a collector of such things. Would you believe I have been offered two hundred and fifty dollars for that small thing? Andrew has made chairs that have sold for five hundred dollars. There's two hundred thousand dollars in the bank out of Andrew's products. Good heavens, he's making you rich, Gerald. Half rich, said Sir. Half of it is in an account in the name of Andrew Martin. The robot? That's right, and I want to know if it's legal. Legal? Feingold's chair creaked as he leaned back in it. There are no precedents, Gerald. How did your robot sign the necessary papers? He can sign his name, and I brought in the signature. I didn't bring him into the bank himself. Is there anything further that ought to be done? Um. Feingold's eyes seemed to turn inward for a moment. Then he said, Well, we can set up a trust to handle all finances in his name, and that will place a layer of insulation between him and the hostile world. Further than that, my advice is that you do nothing. No one is stopping you so far. If anyone objects, let him bring suit. And will you take the case if suit is brought? For a retainer, certainly. How much? Something like that, and Feingold pointed to the wooden plaque. Fair enough, said Sir. Feingold chuckled as he turned to the robot. Andrew, are you pleased that you have money? Yes, sir. What do you plan to do with it? Pay for things, sir, which otherwise Sir would have to pay for. It would save him expense, sir. 5. The occasions came, repairs were expensive, and revisions were even more so. With the years, new models of robots were produced, and Sir saw to it that Andrew had the advantage of every new device, until he was a paragon of metallic excellence. It was all at Andrew's expense. 
Andrew insisted on that. Only his positronic pathways were untouched. Sir insisted on that. The new ones aren't as good as you are, Andrew, he said. The new robots are worthless. The company has learned to make the pathways more precise, more closely on the nose, more deeply on the track. The new robots don't shift. They do what they're designed for and never stray. I like you better. Thank you, sir. And it's your doing, Andrew. Don't you forget that. I am certain Mansky put an end to generalized pathways as soon as he had a good look at you. He didn't like the unpredictability. Do you know how many times he asked for you so he could place you under study? Nine times. I never let him have you, though, and now that he's retired we may have some peace. So Sir's hair thinned and grayed, and his face grew pouchy, while Andrew looked rather better than he had when he first joined the family. Ma'am had joined an art colony somewhere in Europe, and Miss was a poet in New York. They wrote sometimes, but not often. Little Miss was married and lived not far away. She said she did not want to leave Andrew, and when her child, Little Sir, was born, she let Andrew hold the bottle and feed him. With the birth of a grandson, Andrew felt that Sir had someone now to replace those who had gone. It would not be so unfair to come to him with the request. Andrew said, "'Sir, it is kind of you to have allowed me to spend my money as I wished.' "'It was your money, Andrew.' "'Only by your voluntary act, sir. I do not believe the law would have stopped you from keeping it all.' "'The law won't persuade me to do wrong, Andrew.' "'Despite all expenses, and despite taxes too, sir, I have nearly six hundred thousand dollars.' "'I know that, Andrew.' "'I want to give it to you, sir.' I won't take it, Andrew. In exchange for something you can give me, sir. Oh, what is that, Andrew? My freedom, sir. Your. I wish to buy my freedom, sir. 6. It wasn't that easy. Sir had flushed, had said, for God's sake, had turned on his heel and stalked away. It was Little Miss who brought him around, defiantly and harshly, and in front of Andrew. For thirty years no one had hesitated to talk in front of Andrew, whether the matter involved Andrew or not. He was only a robot. She said, Dad, why are you still taking it as a personal affront? He'll still be here. He'll still be loyal. He can't help that. It's built in. All he wants is a form of words. He wants to be called free. Is that so terrible? Hasn't he earned it? Heavens, he and I have been talking about it for years. Talking about it for years, have you? Yes, and over and over again he postponed it for fear he would hurt you. I made him put it up to you. He doesn't know what freedom is. He's a robot. Dad, you don't know him. He's read everything in the library. I don't know what he feels inside, but I don't know what you feel inside. When you talk to him, you'll find he reacts to the various abstractions as you and I do. And what else counts? If someone else's reactions are like your own, what more can you ask for? The law won't take that attitude, sir said angrily. See here, you. He turned to Andrew with a deliberate grate in his voice. I can't free you except by doing it legally. And if it gets into the courts, you not only won't get your freedom, but the law will take official cognizance of your money. They'll tell you that a robot has no right to earn money. Is this rigmarole worth losing your money? Freedom is without a price, sir, said Andrew. Even the chance of freedom is worth the money. 7. The court might also take the attitude that freedom was without price and might decide that for no price, however great, could a robot buy its freedom. The simple statement of the regional attorney who represented those who had brought a class action to oppose the freedom was this. The word freedom had no meaning when applied to a robot. Only a human being could be free. He said it several times when it seemed appropriate, slowly with his hand coming down rhythmically on the desk before him to mark the words. Little Miss asked permission to speak on behalf of Andrew. She was recognized by her full name, something Andrew had never heard pronounced before. Amanda Laura Martin Charney may approach the bench. She said, Thank you, Your Honor. 
I am not a lawyer, and I don't know the proper way of phrasing things, but I hope you will listen to my meaning and ignore the words. Let's understand what it means to be free in Andrew's case. In some ways he is free. I think it's at least twenty years since anyone in the Martin family gave him an order to do something that we felt he might not do of his own accord. But we can, if we wish, give him an order to do anything, couch it as harshly as we wish, because he is a machine that belongs to us. Why should we be in a position to do so, when he has served us so long, so faithfully, and earned so much money for us? He owes us nothing more. The debt is entirely on the other side. Even if we were legally forbidden to place Andrew in involuntary servitude, he would still serve us voluntarily. Making him free would be a trick of words only, but it would mean much to him. It would give him everything and cost us nothing. For a moment the judge seemed to be suppressing a smile. I see your point, Mrs. Charney. The fact is that there is no binding law in this respect and no precedent. There is, however, the unspoken assumption that only a man can enjoy freedom. I can make new law here, subject to reversal in a higher court, but I cannot lightly run counter to that assumption. Let me address the robot. Andrew? Yes, Your Honor? It was the first time Andrew had spoken in court, and the judge seemed astonished for a moment at the human timbre of the voice. He said, Why do you want to be free, Andrew? In what way will this matter to you? Andrew said, Would you wish to be a slave, Your Honor? But you are not a slave. You are a perfectly good robot, a genius of a robot I am given to understand, capable of an artistic expression that can be matched nowhere. What more can you do if you were free? Perhaps no more than I do now, Your Honor, but with greater joy. It has been said in this courtroom that only a human being can be free. It seems to me that only someone who wishes for freedom can be free. I wish for freedom. And it was that that cued the judge. The crucial sentence in his decision was, There is no right to deny freedom to any object with a mind advanced enough to grasp the concept and desire the state. It was eventually upheld by the world court. 8. Sir remained displeased, and his harsh voice made Andrew feel almost as though he were being short-circuited. Sir said, I don't want your damned money, Andrew. I'll take it only because you won't feel free otherwise. From now on you can select your own jobs and do them as you please. I will give you no orders except this one, that you do as you please. But I am still responsible for you. That's part of the court order. I hope you understand that. Little Miss interrupted. Don't be irascible, Dad. The responsibility is no great chore. You know you won't have to do a thing. The three laws still hold. Then how is he free? Andrew said, Are not human beings bound by their laws, sir? Sir said, I'm not going to argue. He left, and Andrew saw him only infrequently after that. Little Miss came to see him frequently in the small house that had been built and made over for him. It had no kitchen, of course, nor bathroom facilities. It had just two rooms. One was a library, and one was a combination storeroom and workroom. Andrew accepted many commissions, and worked harder as a free robot than he ever had before, till the cost of the house was paid for, and the structure legally transferred to him. One day Little Sir came—no, George, Little Sir had insisted on that after the court decision. A free robot doesn't call anyone Little Sir, George had said. I call you Andrew, you must call me George. It was phrased as an order, so Andrew called him George. But Little Miss remained Little Miss. The day George came alone, it was to say that Sir was dying. Little Miss was at the bedside, but Sir wanted Andrew as well. Sir's voice was quite strong, though he seemed unable to move much. He struggled to get his hand up. Andrew, he said. Andrew, don't help me, George. I'm only dying. I'm not crippled. Andrew, I'm glad you're free. I just wanted to tell you that. Andrew did not know what to say. He had never been at the side of someone dying before, but he knew it was the human way of ceasing to function. It was an involuntary and irreversible dismantling, and Andrew did not know what to say that might be appropriate. 
He could only remain standing, absolutely silent, absolutely motionless. When it was over, little Miss said to him, "'He may not have seemed friendly to you toward the end, Andrew, but he was old, you know, and it hurt him that you should want to be free.' And then Andrew found the words to say. He said, "'I would never have been free without him, little Miss.' Nine. It was only after Sir's death that Andrew began to wear clothes. He began with an old pair of trousers at first, a pair that George had given him. George was married now, and a lawyer. He had joined Feingold's firm. Old Feingold was long since dead, but his daughter had carried on, and eventually the firm's name became Feingold and Chiney. It remained so even when the daughter retired and no Feingold took her place. At the time Andrew put on clothes for the first time, the Charney name had just been added to the firm. George had tried not to smile the first time Andrew put on the trousers, but to Andrew's eyes the smile was clearly there. George showed Andrew how to manipulate the static charge so as to allow the trousers to open, wrap about his lower body, and move shut. George demonstrated on his own trousers, but Andrew was quite aware that it would take him a while to duplicate that one flowing motion. George said, But why do you want trousers, Andrew? Your body is so beautifully functional, it's a shame to cover it, especially when you needn't worry about either temperature control or modesty. And it doesn't cling properly, not on metal. Andrew said, Are not human bodies beautifully functional, George? Yet you cover yourselves for warmth, for cleanliness, for protection, for decorativeness. None of that applies to you. Andrew said, I feel bare without clothes. I feel different, George. Different. Andrew, there are millions of robots on Earth now. In this region, according to the last census, there are almost as many robots as there are men. I know, George. There are robots doing every conceivable type of work. And none of them wear clothes. But none of them are free, George. Little by little, Andrew added to the wardrobe. He was inhibited by George's smile and by the stares of the people who commissioned work. He might be free, but there was built into him a carefully detailed program concerning his behavior toward people, and it was only by the tiniest steps that he dared advance. Open disapproval would set him back months. Not everyone accepted Andrew as free. He was incapable of resenting that, and yet there was a difficulty about his thinking process when he thought of it. Most of all, he tended to avoid putting on clothes, or too many of them, when he thought little Miss might come to visit him. She was old now, and was often away in some warmer climate, but when she returned the first thing she did was visit him. On one of her returns George said ruefully, "'She's got me, Andrew. I'll be running for the legislature next year.' Like grandfather, she says, like grandson. Like grandfather, Andrew stopped, uncertain. I mean that I, George, the grandson, will be like Sir, the grandfather, who was in the legislature once. Andrew said, It would be pleasant, George, if Sir were still— He paused, for he did not want to say, in working order. That seemed inappropriate. Alive, said George. Yes, I think of the old monster now and then, too. It was a conversation Andrew thought about. He had noticed his own incapacity in speech when talking with George. Somehow the language had changed since Andrew had come into being with an innate vocabulary. Then, too, George used a colloquial speech, as Sir and Little Miss had not. Why should he have called Sir a monster, when surely that word was not appropriate? Nor could Andrew turn to his own books for guidance. They were old, and most dealt with woodworking, with art, with furniture design. There were none on language, none on the way of human beings. It was at that moment it seemed to him that he must seek the proper books, and as a free robot he felt he must not ask George. He would go to town and use the library. It was a triumphant decision, and he felt his electropotential grow distinctly higher, until he had to throw in an impedance coil. He put on a full costume, even including a shoulder chain of wood. He would have preferred the glitter plastic, but George had said that wood was much more appropriate, and that polished cedar was considerably more valuable as well. 
He had placed a hundred feet between himself and the house before gathering resistance brought him to a halt. He shifted the impedance coil out of circuit, and when that did not seem to help enough, he returned to his home and on a piece of notepaper wrote neatly, I have gone to the library, and placed it in clear view on his work table. 10. Andrew never quite got to the library. He had studied the map. He knew the route, but not the appearance of it. The actual landmarks did not resemble the symbols on the map, and he would hesitate. Eventually he thought he must have somehow gone wrong, for everything looked strange. He passed an occasional field robot, but at the time he decided he should ask his way, there were none in sight. A vehicle passed and did not stop. He stood irresolute, which meant calmly motionless, and then coming across the field toward him were two human beings. He turned to face them, and they altered their course to meet him. A moment before they had been talking loudly, he had heard their voices. But now they were silent. They had the look that Andrew associated with human uncertainty, and they were young but not very young. Twenty, perhaps? Andrew could never judge human age. He said, would you describe to me the route to the town library, sirs? One of them, the taller of the two, whose tall hat lengthened him still farther, almost grotesquely said, not to Andrew but to the other, It's a robot! The other had a bulbous nose and heavy eyelids. He said not to Andrew but to the first, It's wearing clothes! The tall one snapped his fingers. It's the free robot! They have a robot at the Charney's who isn't owned by anybody. Why else would it be wearing clothes? Ask it, said the one with the nose. Are you the Charney robot? asked the tall one. I am Andrew Martin, sir, said Andrew. Good. Take off your clothes. Robots don't wear clothes, he said to the other. That's disgusting. Look at him. Andrew hesitated. He hadn't heard an order in that tone of voice in so long that his second law circuits had momentarily jammed. The tall one said, Take off your clothes. I order you. Slowly, Andrew began to remove them. Just drop them, said the tall one. The nose said, If it doesn't belong to anyone, he could be ours as much as someone else's. Anyway, said the tall one, Who's to object to anything we do? We're not damaging property. Stand on your head. That was to Andrew. The head is not meant, began Andrew. That's an order. If you don't know how, try anyway. Andrew hesitated again, then bent to put his head on the ground. He tried to lift his legs and fell heavily. The tall one said, Just lie there, he said to the other. We can take him apart. Ever take a robot apart? Will he let us? How can he stop us? There was no way Andrew could stop them if they ordered him not to resist in a forceful enough manner. Second law of obedience took precedence over the third law of self-preservation. In any case, he could not defend himself without possibly hurting them, and that would mean breaking the first law. At that thought, every motile unit contracted slightly, and he quivered as he lay there. The tall one walked over and pushed at him with his foot. He's heavy. I think we'll need tools to do the job. The nose said, We could order him to take himself apart. It would be fun to watch him try. Yes, said the tall one thoughtfully. But let's get him off the road. If someone comes along... It was too late. Someone had indeed come along, and it was George. From where he lay, Andrew had seen him topping a small rise in the middle distance. He would have liked to signal him in some way, but the last order had been, Just lie there. George was running now, and he arrived somewhat winded. The two young men stepped back a little and then waited thoughtfully. George said anxiously, Andrew, has something gone wrong? Andrew said, I am well, George. Then stand up. What happened to your clothes? The tall young man said, That your robot, Mac? George turned sharply. He's no one's robot. What's been going on here? We politely asked him to take his clothes off. What's that to you if you don't own him? George said, What were they doing, Andrew? Andrew said, It was their intention in some way to dismember me. They were about to move me to a quiet spot and order me to dismember myself. George looked at the two, and his chin trembled. 
The two young men retreated no further. They were smiling. The tall one said lightly, What are you going to do, Pudgy? Attack us? George said, No, I don't have to. This robot has been with my family for over seventy years. He knows us, and he values us more than he values anyone else. I am going to tell him that you two are threatening my life, and that you plan to kill me. I will ask him to defend me. In choosing between me and you two, he will choose me. Do you know what will happen to you when he attacks you? The two were backing away slightly, looking uneasy. George said sharply, Andrew, I am in danger and about to come to harm from these young men. Move toward them. Andrew did so, and the two young men did not wait. They ran fleetly. All right, Andrew, relax, said George. He looked unstrung. He was far past the age where he could face the possibility of a dust-up with one young man, let alone two. Andrew said, I couldn't have hurt them, George. I could see they were not attacking you. I didn't order you to attack them. I only told you to move toward them. Their own fears did the rest. How can they fear robots? It's a disease of mankind, one of which it is not yet cured. But never mind that. What the devil are you doing here, Andrew? I was on the point of turning back and hiring a helicopter when I found you. How did you get it into your head to go to the library? I would have brought you any books you needed. I am a— began Andrew. Free robot, yes, yes, all right. What did you want in the library? I want to know more about human beings, about the world, about everything. And about robots, George. I want to write a history about robots. George said, Well, let's walk home. And pick up your clothes first. Andrew, there are a million books on robotics, and all of them include histories of the science. The world is growing saturated not only with robots, but with information about robots. Andrew shook his head, a human gesture he had lately begun to make. Not a history of robotics, George. A history of robots, by a robot. I want to explain how robots feel about what has happened since the first ones were allowed to work and live on Earth. George's eyebrows lifted, but he said nothing in direct response. 11. Little Miss was just past her eighty-third birthday, but there was nothing about her that was lacking in either energy or determination. She gestured with her cane oftener than she propped herself up with it. She listened to the story in a fury of indignation. She said, George, that's horrible. Who were those young ruffians? I don't know. What difference does it make? In the end, they did no damage. They might have. You're a lawyer, George, and if you're well off, it's entirely due to the talent of Andrew. It was the money he earned that is the foundation of everything we have. He provides the continuity for this family, and I will not have him treated as a wind-up toy. What would you have me do, mother? asked George. I said you're a lawyer. Don't you listen? You set up a test case somehow, and you force the regional courts to declare for robot rights and get the legislature to pass the necessary bills, and carry the whole thing to the world court if you have to. I'll be watching, George, and I'll tolerate no shirking. She was serious, and what began as a way of soothing the fearsome old lady became an involved matter with enough legal entanglement to make it interesting. As senior partner of Feingold and Charney, George plotted strategy but left the actual work to his junior partners, with much of it a matter for his son Paul, who was also a member of the firm and who reported dutifully nearly every day to his grandmother. She, in turn, discussed it every day with Andrew. Andrew was deeply involved. His work on his book on robots was delayed again as he pored over the legal arguments and even at times made very diffident suggestions. He said, George told me that day that human beings have always been afraid of robots. As long as they are, the courts and the legislatures are not likely to work hard on behalf of robots. Should there not be something done about public opinion? So while Paul stayed in court, George took to the public platform. It gave him the advantage of being informal, and he even went so far sometimes as to wear the new, loose style of clothing which he called drapery. Paul said, just don't trip over it on stage, Dad, George said despondently. 
I'll try not to. He addressed the annual convention of hollow news editors on one occasion and said in part, If by virtue of the second law we can demand of any robot unlimited obedience in all respects not involving harm to a human being, then any human being, any human being, has a fearsome power over any robot, any robot. In particular, since second law supersedes third law, any human being can use the law of obedience to overcome the law of self-protection. He can order any robot to damage itself or even destroy itself for any reason or for no reason. Is this just? Would we treat an animal so? Even an inanimate object which has given us good service has a claim on our consideration. And a robot is not insensible. It is not an animal. It can think well enough to enable it to talk to us, reason with us, joke with us. Can we treat them as friends? Can we work together with them and not give them some of the fruit of that friendship, some of the benefit of co-working? If a man has the right to give a robot any order that does not involve harm to a human being, he should have the decency never to give a robot any order that involves harm to a robot, unless human safety absolutely requires it. With great power goes great responsibility, and if the robots have three laws to protect men, is it too much to ask that men have a law or two to protect robots? Andrew was right. It was the battle over public opinion that held the key to courts and legislature, and in the end a law passed which set up conditions under which robot-harming orders were forbidden. It was endlessly qualified, and the punishments for violating the law were totally inadequate, but the principle was established. The final passage by the world legislature came through on the day of Little Miss's death. That was no coincidence. Little Miss held on to life desperately during the last debate, and let go only when word of victory arrived. Her last smile was for Andrew. Her last words were, You have been good to us, Andrew. She died with her hand holding his, while her son and his wife and children remained at a respectful distance from both. 12. Andrew waited patiently while the receptionist disappeared into the inner office. It might have used the holographic chatterbox, but unquestionably it was unmanned, or perhaps unroboted, by having to deal with another robot rather than with a human being. Andrew passed the time revolving the matter in his mind. Could unroboted be used as an analogue of unmanned? or had unmanned become a metaphoric term sufficiently divorced from its original literal meaning to be applied to robots, or to women for that matter. Such problems came frequently as he worked on his book on robots. The trick of thinking out sentences to express all complexities had undoubtedly increased his vocabulary. Occasionally someone came into the room to stare at him, and he did not try to avoid the glance. He looked at each calmly, and each in turn looked away. Paul Charney finally came out. He looked surprised, or he would have if Andrew could have made out his expression with certainty. Paul had taken to wearing the heavy makeup that fashion was dictating for both sexes, and though it made sharper and firmer the somewhat bland lines of his face, Andrew disapproved. He found that disapproving of human beings, as long as he did not express it verbally, did not make him very uneasy. He could even write the disapproval. He was sure it had not always been so. Paul said, Come in, Andrew. I'm sorry I made you wait, but there was something I had to finish. Come in. You had said you wanted to talk to me, but I didn't know you meant here in town. If you are busy, Paul, I am prepared to continue to wait. Paul glanced at the interplay of shifting shadows on the dial on the wall that served as timepiece, and said, I can make some time. Did you come alone? I hired an automobile. Any trouble? Paul asked, with more than a trace of anxiety. I wasn't expecting any. My rights are protected. Paul looked the more anxious for that. Andrew, I've explained that the law is unenforceable, at least under most conditions. And if you insist on wearing clothes, you'll run into trouble eventually, just like that first time. And only time, Paul. I'm sorry you are displeased. Well, look at it this way. You are virtually a living legend, Andrew, 
and you are too valuable in many different ways for you to have any right to take chances with yourself. How's the book coming? I am approaching the end, Paul. The publisher is quite pleased. Good. I don't know that he's necessarily pleased with the book as a book. I think he expects to sell many copies because it's written by a robot, and it's that that pleases him. Only human, I'm afraid. I am not displeased. Let it sell for whatever reason, since it will mean money and I can use some. Grandmother left you. Little Miss was generous, and I'm sure I can count on the family to help me out further. But it is the royalties from the book on which I am counting to help me through the next step. What next step is that? I wish to see the head of U.S. Robots and Mechanical Men Corporation. I have tried to make an appointment, but so far I have not been able to reach him. The corporation did not cooperate with me in the writing of the book, so I am not surprised, you understand. Paul was clearly amused. Cooperation is the last thing you can expect. They didn't cooperate with us in our great fight for robot rights. Quite the reverse, and you can see why. Give a robot rights and people may not want to buy them. Nevertheless, said Andrew, if you call them, you may obtain an interview for me. I'm no more popular with them than you are, Andrew. But perhaps you can hint that by seeing me they may head off a campaign by Feingold and Charney to strengthen the rights of robots further. Wouldn't that be a lie, Andrew? Yes, Paul, and I can't tell one. That is why you must call. Ah, you can't lie, but you can urge me to tell a lie, is that it? You're getting more human all the time, Andrew. 13. It was not easy to arrange, even with Paul's supposedly weighted name. But it was finally carried through, and when it was, Harley Smythe Robertson, who on his mother's side was descended from the original founder of the corporation, and who had adopted the hyphenation to indicate it, looked remarkably unhappy. He was approaching retirement age, and his entire tenure as president had been devoted to the matter of robot rights. His gray hair was plastered thinly over the top of his scalp, his face was not made up, and he eyed Andrew with brief hostility from time to time. Andrew said, Sir, nearly a century ago I was told by a Merton Mansky of this corporation that the mathematics governing the plotting of the positronic pathways was far too complicated to permit of any but approximate solutions, and that therefore my own capacities were not fully predictable. That was a century ago, Smythe Robertson hesitated, then said icily, Sir, it is true no longer. Our robots are made with precision now, and are trained precisely to their jobs. Yes, said Paul, who had come along, as he said, to make sure that the corporation played fair, with the result that my receptionist must be guided at every point, once events depart from the conventional, however slightly. Smythe Robertson said, you would be much more displeased if it were to improvise. Andrew said, Then you no longer manufacture robots like myself, which are flexible and adaptable. No longer. The research I have done in connection with my book, said Andrew, indicates that I am the oldest robot presently in active operation. The oldest presently, said Smythe Robertson, and the oldest ever, the oldest that will ever be. No robot is useful after the twenty-fifth year. They are called in and replaced with new models. No robot as presently manufactured is useful after the twenty-fifth year, said Paul pleasantly. Andrew is quite exceptional in this respect. Andrew, adhering to the path he had marked out for himself, said, As the oldest robot in the world, and the most flexible, am I not unusual enough to merit special treatment from the company? Not at all, said Smythe Robertson freezingly. Your unusualness is an embarrassment to the company. If you were on lease, instead of having been a sale outright through some mischance, you would long since have been replaced. But that is exactly the point, said Andrew. I am a free robot, and I own myself. Therefore I come to you and ask you to replace me. You cannot do this without the owner's consent. Nowadays that consent is extorted as a condition of the lease, but in my time this did not happen. Smythe Robertson was looking both startled and puzzled, and for a moment there was silence. Andrew found himself staring at the holograph on the wall, 
It was a death mask of Susan Calvin, patron saint of all roboticists. She was dead nearly two centuries now, but as a result of writing his book, Andrew knew her so well he could half persuade himself that he had met her in life. Smythe Robertson said, How can I replace you for you? If I replace you as a robot, how can I donate the new robot to you as owner, since in the very act of replacement you cease to exist? He smiled grimly. Not at all difficult, interposed Paul. The seat of Andrew's personality is his positronic brain, and it is the one part that cannot be replaced without creating a new robot. The positronic brain, therefore, is Andrew the owner. Every other part of the robotic body can be replaced without affecting the robot's personality, and those other parts are the brain's possessions. Andrew, I should say, wants to supply his brain with a new robotic body. That's right, said Andrew calmly. He turned to Smythe Robertson. You have manufactured androids, haven't you? Robots that have the outward appearance of humans, complete to the texture of the skin? Smythe Robertson said, Yes, we have. They worked perfectly well with their synthetic, fibrous skins and tendons. There was virtually no metal anywhere except for the brain, yet they were nearly as tough as metal robots. They were tougher weight for weight. Paul looked interested. I didn't know that. How many are on the market? None, said Smythe Robertson. They were much more expensive than metal models, and a market survey showed they would not be accepted. They looked too human. Andrew said, But the corporation retains its expertise, I assume. Since it does, I wish to request that I be replaced by an organic robot, an android. Paul looked surprised. Good Lord, he said. Smythe Robertson stiffened. Quite impossible. Why is it impossible? asked Andrew. I will pay any reasonable fee, of course. Smythe Robertson said, We do not manufacture androids. You do not choose to manufacture androids, interposed Paul quickly. That is not the same as being unable to manufacture them. Smythe Robertson said, Nevertheless, the manufacture of androids is against public policy. There is no law against it, said Paul. Nevertheless, we do not manufacture them, and we will not. Paul cleared his throat. Mr. Smythe Robertson, he said, Andrew is a free robot who is under the purview of the law guaranteeing robot rights. You are aware of this, I take it? Only too well. This robot, as a free robot, chooses to wear clothes. This results in his being frequently humiliated by thoughtless human beings, despite the law against the humiliation of robots. It is difficult to prosecute vague offenses that don't meet with the general disapproval of those who must decide on guilt and innocence. U.S. robots understood that from the start. Your father's firm, unfortunately, did not. My father is dead now, said Paul. But what I see is that we have here a clear offense with a clear target. What are you talking about? said Smythe Robertson. My client, Andrew Martin, he has just become my client, is a free robot who is entitled to ask U.S. Robots and Mechanical Men Corporation for the right of replacement, which the corporation supplies anyone who owns a robot for more than twenty-five years. In fact, the corporation insists on such replacement. Paul was smiling and thoroughly at his ease. He went on, the positronic brain of my client is the owner of the body of my client, which is certainly more than twenty-five years old. The positronic brain demands the replacement of the body and offers to pay any reasonable fee for an android body as that replacement. If you refuse the request, my client undergoes humiliation, and we will sue. While public opinion would not ordinarily support the claim of a robot in such a case, May I remind you that U.S. robots is not popular with the public generally. Even those who most use and profit from robots are suspicious of the corporation. This may be a hangover from the days when robots were widely feared. It may be resentment against the power and wealth of U.S. robots, which has a worldwide monopoly. Whatever the cause may be, the resentment exists, and I think you will find that you would prefer not to withstand a lawsuit particularly since my client is wealthy and will live for many more centuries, and will have no reason to refrain from fighting the battle forever. 
Smythe Robertson had slowly reddened. You are trying to force me to— I force you to do nothing, said Paul. If you wish to refuse to accede to my client's reasonable request, you may by all means do so, and we will leave without another word. But we will sue, as is certainly our right, and you will find that you will eventually lose. Smythe Robertson said, Well, and paused. I see that you are going to accede, said Paul. You may hesitate, but you will come to it in the end. Let me assure you, then, of one further point. If, in the process of transferring my client's positronic brain from his present body to an organic one, there is any damage, however slight, then I will never rest till I've nailed the corporation to the ground. I will, if necessary, take every possible step to mobilize public opinion against the corporation if one brain path of my client's platinum iridium essence is scrambled. He turned to Andrew and said, Do you agree to all this, Andrew? Andrew hesitated a full minute. It amounted to the approval of lying, of blackmail, of the badgering and humiliation of a human being. But not physical harm, he told himself. Not physical harm. He managed at last to come out with a rather faint, Yes. 14. It was like being constructed again. For days, then weeks, finally for months, Andrew found himself not himself somehow, and the simplest actions kept giving rise to hesitation. Paul was frantic. They've damaged you, Andrew. We'll have to institute suit. Andrew spoke very slowly. You mustn't. You'll never be able to prove something... Malice? Malice. Besides, I grow stronger, better. It's the... Tr 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 tremble? Trauma. After all, there's never been such an up, up, up before. Andrew could feel his brain from the inside. No one else could. He knew he was well, and during the months that it took him to learn full coordination and full positronic interplay, he spent hours before the mirror. Not quite human. The face was stiff, too stiff, and the motions were too deliberate. They lacked the careless, free flow of the human being, but perhaps that might come with time. At least he could wear clothes without the ridiculous anomaly of a metal face going along with it. Eventually, he said, I will be going back to work. Paul laughed and said, That means you are well. What will you be doing? Another book? No, said Andrew seriously. I live too long for any one career to seize me by the throat and never let me go. There was a time when I was primarily an artist, and I can still turn to that. And there was a time when I was a historian, and I can still turn to that. But now I wish to be a robobiologist. A robo-psychologist, you mean? No. That would imply the study of positronic brains, and at the moment I lack the desire to do that. A robobiologist, it seems to me, would be concerned with the working of the body attached to that brain. Wouldn't that be a roboticist? A roboticist works with a metal body. I would be studying an organic humanoid body, of which I have the only one, as far as I know. You narrow your field, said Paul thoughtfully. As an artist, all conception is yours. As a historian, you dealt chiefly with robots. As a robobiologist, you will deal with yourself. Andrew nodded. It would seem so. Andrew had to start from the very beginning, for he knew nothing of ordinary biology, almost nothing of science. He became a familiar sight in the libraries, where he sat at the electronic indices for hours at a time looking perfectly normal in clothes. Those few who knew he was a robot in no way interfered with him. He built a laboratory in a room which he added to his house, and his library grew too. Years passed, and Paul came to him one day and said, It's a pity you're no longer working on the history of robots. I understand U.S. robots is adopting a radically new policy. Paul had aged, and his deteriorating eyes had been replaced with photoptic cells. In that respect, he had drawn closer to Andrew. Andrew said, What have they done? They are manufacturing central computers, gigantic positronic brains, really, which communicate with anywhere from a dozen to a thousand robots by microwave. 
The robots themselves have no brains at all. They are the limbs of the gigantic brain, and the two are physically separate. Is that more efficient? U.S. Robots claims it is. Smythe Robertson established the new direction before he died, however, and it's my notion that it's a backlash at you. U.S. Robots is determined that they will make no robots that will give them the type of trouble you have, and for that reason they separate brain and body. The brain will have no body to wish changed. The body will have no brain to wish anything. It's amazing, Andrew, Paul went on, the influence you have had on the history of robots. It was your artistry that encouraged U.S. robots to make robots more precise and specialized. It was your freedom that resulted in the establishment of the principle of robotic rights. It was your insistence on an android body that made U.S. robots switch to brain-body separation. Andrew said, I suppose in the end the corporation will produce one vast brain controlling several billion robotic bodies. All the eggs will be in one basket. Dangerous. Not proper at all. I think you're right, said Paul. But I don't suspect it will come to pass for a century at least, and I won't live to see it. In fact, I may not live to see next year. Paul, said Andrew in concern. Paul shrugged. We're mortal, Andrew. We're not like you. It doesn't matter too much, but it does make it important to assure you on one point. I'm the last of the Charneys. There are collaterals descended from my great-aunt, but they don't count. The money I control personally will be left to the trust in your name, and as far as anyone can foresee the future, you will be economically secure. Unnecessary, said Andrew, with difficulty. In all this time he could not get used to the deaths of the Charneys. Paul said, Let's not argue. That's the way it's going to be. What are you working on? I am designing a system for allowing androids, myself, to gain energy from the combustion of hydrocarbons rather than from atomic cells. Paul raised his eyebrows. So that they will breathe and eat? Yes. How long have you been pushing in that direction? For a long time now. But I think I have designed an adequate combustion chamber for catalyzed, controlled breakdown. But why, Andrew? The atomic cell is surely infinitely better. In some ways, perhaps. But the atomic cell is inhuman. 15. It took time, but Andrew had time. In the first place, he did not wish to do anything till Paul had died in peace. With the death of the great-grandson of Sir, Andrew felt more nearly exposed to a hostile world, and for that reason was the more determined to continue the path he had long ago chosen. Yet he was not really alone. If a man had died, the firm of Feingold and Charney lived, for a corporation does not die any more than a robot does. The firm had its directions, and it followed them soullessly. By way of the trust, and through the law firm, Andrew continued to be wealthy, and in return for their own large annual retainer, Feingold and Charney involved themselves in the legal aspects of the new combustion chamber. When the time came for Andrew to visit U.S. Robots and Mechanical Men Corporation, he did it alone. Once he had gone with Sir, and once with Paul. This time, the third time, he was alone and manlike. U.S. Robots had changed. The production plant had been shifted to a large space station, as had grown to be the case with more and more industries. With them had gone many robots. The Earth itself was becoming park-like, with its one billion person population stabilized, and perhaps not more than thirty percent of its at least equally large robot population independently brained. The director of research was Alvin Magdescu, dark of complexion and hair, with a little pointed beard, and wearing nothing above the waist but the breastband that fashion dictated. Andrew himself was well covered in the older fashion of several decades back. Magdescu said, I know you, of course, and I'm rather pleased to see you. You're our most notorious product, and it's a pity old Smythe Robertson was so set against you. We could have done a great deal with you. You still can, said Andrew. No, I don't think so. We're past the time. We've had robots on Earth for over a century, but that's changing. It will be back to space with them, and those that stay here won't be brained. But there remains myself, and I stay on Earth. 
true. But there doesn't seem to be much of the robot about you. What new request have you? To be still less a robot. Since I am so far organic, I wish an organic source of energy. I have here the plans. Magdescu did not hasten through them. He might have intended to at first, but he stiffened and grew intent. At one point he said, This is remarkably ingenious. Who thought of all this? I did, said Andrew. Magdescu looked up at him sharply, then said, It would amount to a major overhaul of your body, and an experimental one, since it has never been attempted before. I advise against it. Remain as you are. Andrew's face had limited means of expression, but impatience showed plainly in his voice. Dr. Magdescu, you missed the entire point. You have no choice but to accede to my request. If such devices can be built into my body, they can be built into human bodies as well. The tendency to lengthen human life by prosthetic devices has already been remarked on. There are no devices better than the ones I have designed and am designing. As it happens, I control the patents by way of the firm of Feingold and Charney. We are quite capable of going into business for ourselves, and of developing the kind of prosthetic devices that may end by producing human beings with many of the properties of robots. Your own business will then suffer. If, however, you operate on me now and agree to do so under similar circumstances in the future, you will receive permission to make use of the patents and control the technology of both robots and the prosthetization of human beings. The initial leasing will not be granted, of course, until after the first operation is completed successfully, and after enough time has passed to demonstrate that it is indeed successful. Andrew felt scarcely any first law inhibition to the stern conditions he was setting a human being. He was learning to reason that what seemed like cruelty might in the long run be kindness. Magdescu looked stunned. He said, I'm not the one to decide something like this. That's a corporate decision that would take time. I can wait a reasonable time, said Andrew, but only a reasonable time. And he thought with satisfaction that Paul himself could not have done it better. 16. It took only a reasonable time, and the operation was a success. Magdescu said, I was very much against the operation, Andrew, but not for the reasons you might think. I was not in the least against the experiment, if it had been on someone else. I hated risking your positronic brain. Now that you have the positronic pathways interacting with simulated nerve pathways, it might be difficult to rescue the brain intact if the body went bad. I had every faith in the skill of the staff at U.S. Robots, said Andrew, and I can eat now. Well, you can sip olive oil. It will mean occasional cleanings of the combustion chamber, as we have explained to you. Rather an uncomfortable touch, I should think. Perhaps, if I did not expect to go further. Self-cleaning is not impossible. In fact, I am working on a device that will deal with solid food that may be expected to contain incombustible fractions indigestible matter, so to speak, that will have to be discarded. You would then have to develop an anus. The equivalent. What else, Andrew? Everything else. Genitalia, too? Insofar as they will fit my plans, my body is a canvas on which I intend to draw. Magdescu waited for the sentence to be completed, and when it seemed that it would not be, he completed it himself. A man? We shall see, said Andrew. Magdescu said, It's a puny ambition, Andrew. You're better than a man. You've gone downhill from the moment you opted for organicism. My brain has not suffered? No, it hasn't. I'll grant you that. But, Andrew, the whole new breakthrough in prosthetic devices made possible by your patents is being marketed under your name. You're recognized as the inventor, and you're honored for it, as you are. Why play further games with your body? Andrew did not answer. The honors came. He accepted membership in several learned societies, including one which was devoted to the new science he had established, the one he had called robobiology, but had come to be termed prosthetology. On the 150th anniversary of his construction, there was a testimonial dinner given in his honor at U.S. Robots. If Andrew saw irony in this, he kept it to himself. Alvin Magdescu came out of retirement to chair the dinner, 
He was himself ninety-four years old, and was alive because he had prosthetized devices that, among other things, fulfilled the function of liver and kidneys. The dinner reached its climax when Magdescu, after a short and emotional talk, raised his glass to toast the sesquicentennial robot. Andrew had had the sinews of his face redesigned to the point where he could show a range of emotions, but he sat through all the ceremonies solemnly passive. He did not like to be a sesquicentennial robot. 17. It was prosthetology that finally took Andrew off the earth. In the decades that followed the celebration of the sesquicentennial, the moon had come to be a world more earth-like than earth in every respect but its gravitational pull, and in its underground cities there was a fairly dense population. Prosthetized devices there had to take the lesser gravity into account, and Andrew spent five years on the moon working with local prosthetologists to make the necessary adaptations. When not at his work, he wandered among the robot population, every one of which treated him with the robotic obsequiousness due a man. He came back to an earth that was humdrum and quiet in comparison, and visited the offices of Fine Gold and Charney to announce his return. The current head of the firm, Simon DeLong, was surprised. He said, We had been told you were returning, Andrew. He had almost said Mr. Martin. But we were not expecting you till next week. I grew impatient, said Andrew brusquely. He was anxious to get to the point. On the moon, Simon, I was in charge of a research team of twenty human scientists. I gave orders that no one question. The lunar robots deferred to me as they would to a human being. Why, then, am I not a human being? A wary look entered De Long's eyes. He said, My dear Andrew, as you have just explained, you are treated as a human being by both robots and human beings. You are therefore a human being de facto. To be a human being de facto is not enough. I want not only to be treated as one, but to be legally identified as one. I want to be a human being de jure. Now that is another matter, said De Long. There we would run into human prejudice, and into the undoubted fact that however much you may be like a human being, you are not a human being. In what way not? asked Andrew. I have the shape of a human being, and organs equivalent to those of a human being. My organs, in fact, are identical to some of those in a prosthetized human being. I have contributed artistically, literarily, and scientifically to human culture as much as any human being now alive. What more can one ask? I myself would ask nothing more. The trouble is that it would take an act of the world legislature to define you as a human being. Frankly, I wouldn't expect that to happen. To whom on the legislature could I speak? To the chairman of the Science and Technology Committee, perhaps. Can you arrange a meeting? But you scarcely need an intermediary. In your position you can— No, you arrange it. It didn't even occur to Andrew that he was giving a flat order to a human being. He had grown accustomed to that on the moon. I want him to know that the firm of Feingold and Charney is backing me in this to the hilt. Well, now, to the hilt, Simon. In one hundred and seventy-three years I have in one fashion or another contributed greatly to this firm. I have been under obligation to individual members of the firm in times past. I am not now. It is rather the other way around now, and I am calling in my debts. DeLong said, I will do what I can. 18. The chairman of the Science and Technology Committee was of the East Asian region, and she was a woman. Her name was Chi Li Xing, and her transparent garments, obscuring what she wanted obscured only by their dazzle, made her look plastic-wrapped. She said, I sympathize with your wish for full human rights. There have been times in history when segments of the human population fought for full human rights. What rights, however, can you possibly want that you do not have? As simple a thing as my right to life. A robot can be dismantled at any time. A human being can be executed at any time. Execution can only follow due process of law. There is no trial needed for my dismantling. Only the word of a human being in authority is needed to end me. Besides, besides, Andrew tried desperately to allow no sign of pleading, 
but his carefully designed tricks of human expression and tone of voice betrayed him here. The truth is, I want to be a man. I have wanted it through six generations of human beings. Li Xing looked up at him out of darkly sympathetic eyes. The legislature can pass a law declaring you one. They could pass a law declaring a stone statue to be defined as a man. Whether they will actually do so is, however, as likely in the first case as the second. Congress people are as human as the rest of the population, and there is always that element of suspicion against robots. Even now? Even now. We would all allow the fact that you have earned the prize of humanity, and yet there would remain the fear of setting an undesirable precedent. What precedent? I am the only free robot, the only one of my type, and there will never be another. You may consult U.S. robots. Never is a long time, Andrew, or if you prefer Mr. Martin, since I will gladly give you my personal accolade as man. You will find that most Congress people will not be willing to set the precedent, no matter how meaningless such a precedent might be. Mr. Martin, you have my sympathy, but I cannot tell you to hope. Indeed, she sat back and her forehead wrinkled. Indeed, if the issue grows too heated, there might well arise a certain sentiment both inside the legislature and outside for that dismantling you mentioned. Doing away with you could turn out to be the easiest way of resolving the dilemma. Consider that before deciding to push matters. Andrew said, Will no one remember the technique of prosthetology, something that is almost entirely mine? It may seem cruel, but they won't. Or if they do, it will be remembered against you. It will be said you did it only for yourself. It will be said it was part of a campaign to roboticize human beings, or to humanify robots, and in either case evil and vicious. You have never been part of a political hate campaign, Mr. Martin, and I tell you that you will be the object of vilification of a kind neither you nor I would credit, and there would be people who'll believe it all. Mr. Martin, let your life be. She rose, and next to Andrew's seated figure, she seemed small and almost childlike. Andrew said, If I decide to fight for my humanity, will you be on my side? She thought, then said, I will be, in so far as I can be. If at any time such a stand would appear to threaten my political future, I may have to abandon you, since it is not an issue I feel to be at the very root of my beliefs. I am trying to be honest with you. Thank you and I will ask no more. I intend to fight this through, whatever the consequences, and I will ask you for your help only for as long as you can give it. 19. It was not a direct fight. Fine Gold and Charney counseled patience, and Andrew muttered grimly that he had an endless supply of that. Fine Gold and Charney then entered on a campaign to narrow and restrict the area of combat, they instituted a lawsuit denying the obligation to pay debts to an individual with a prosthetic heart, on the grounds that the possession of a robotic organ removed humanity, and with it the constitutional rights of human beings. They fought the matter skillfully and tenaciously, losing at every step, but always in such a way that the decision was forced to be as broad as possible, and then carrying it by way of appeals to the world court. It took years and millions of dollars. When the final decision was handed down, DeLong held what amounted to a victory celebration over the legal loss. Andrew was, of course, present in the company offices on the occasion. "'We've done two things, Andrew,' said DeLong, both of which are good. First of all, we have established the fact that no number of artifacts in the human body causes it to cease being a human body.' Secondly, we have engaged public opinion in the question in such a way as to put it fiercely on the side of a broad interpretation of humanity, since there is not a human being in existence who does not hope for prosthetics if that will keep him alive. And do you think the legislature will now grant me my humanity? asked Andrew. DeLong looked faintly uncomfortable. As to that, I cannot be optimistic. There remains the one organ which the World Court has used as the criterion of humanity. Human beings have an organic cellular brain, and robots have a platinum-iridium positronic brain, if they have one at all. 
and you certainly have a positronic brain. No, Andrew, don't get that look in your eye. We lack the knowledge to duplicate the work of a cellular brain in artificial structures close enough to the organic type to allow it to fall within the court's decision. Not even you could do it. What ought we do, then? Make the attempt, of course. Congresswoman Li Xing will be on our side, and a growing number of other Congress people. The President will undoubtedly go along with a majority of the legislature in this matter. Do we have a majority? No, far from it. But we might get one if the public will allow its desire for a broad interpretation of humanity to extend to you. A small chance, I admit, but if you do not wish to give up, we must gamble for it. I do not wish to give up. 20. Congresswoman Li Xing was considerably older than she had been when Andrew had first met her. Her transparent garments were long gone, her hair was now close-cropped, and her coverings were tubular. Yet still Andrew clung, as closely as he could within the limits of reasonable taste, to the style of clothing that had prevailed when he had first adopted clothing over a century before. She said, "'We've gone as far as we can, Andrew. We'll try once more after recess, but to be honest, defeat is certain, and the whole thing will have to be given up. All my most recent efforts have only earned me a certain defeat in the coming congressional campaign.' "'I know,' said Andrew and it distresses me. You said once you would abandon me if it came to that. Why have you not done so? One can change one's mind, you know. Somehow abandoning you became a higher price than I cared to pay for just one more term. As it is, I've been in the legislature for over a quarter of a century. It's enough. Is there no way we can change minds, Chi? We've changed all that are amenable to reason. The rest, the majority— cannot be moved from their emotional antipathies. Emotional antipathy is not a valid reason for voting one way or the other. I know that, Andrew, but they don't advance emotional antipathy as their reason. Andrew said cautiously, It all comes down to the brain, then. But must we leave it at the level of cells versus positrons? Is there no way of forcing a functional definition? Must we say that a brain is made of this or that? May we not say that a brain is something, anything, capable of a certain level of thought? Won't work, said Li Xing. Your brain is man-made. The human brain is not. Your brain is constructed, theirs developed. To any human being who is intent on keeping up the barrier between himself and a robot, those differences are a steel wall a mile high and a mile thick. If we could get at the source of their antipathy, the very source of after all your years, said Li Xing sadly, you are still trying to reason out the human being. Poor Andrew, don't be angry, but it's the robot in you that drives you in that direction. I don't know, said Andrew. If I could bring myself— 1. Reprise If he could bring himself. He had known for a long time it might come to that, and in the end he was at the surgeon's. He found one, skillful enough for the job at hand, which meant a robot surgeon, for no human surgeon could be trusted in this connection, either in ability or in intention. The surgeon could not have performed the operation on a human being, so Andrew, after putting off the moment of decision with a sad line of questioning that reflected the turmoil within himself, put the first law to one side by saying, I too am a robot. He then said, as firmly as he had learned to form the words even at human beings over these past decades, I order you to carry through the operation on me. In the absence of the first law, an order so firmly given from one who looked so much like a man activated the second law sufficiently to carry the day. 21. Andrew's feeling of weakness was, he was sure, quite imaginary. He had recovered from the operation. Nevertheless, he leaned, as unobtrusively as he could manage, against the wall. It would be entirely too revealing to sit. Li Xing said, The final vote will come this week, Andrew. I've been able to delay it no longer, and we must lose. And that will be it, Andrew. Andrew said, I am grateful for your skill at delay. It gave me the time I needed, and I took the gamble I had to. 
"'What gamble is this?' asked Li Sheng with open concern. "'I couldn't tell you or the people that find gold and Charney. I was sure I would be stopped. See here, if it is the brain that is at issue, isn't the greatest difference of all the matter of immortality? Who really cares what a brain looks like, or is built of, or how it was formed? What matters is that brain cells die, must die. Even if every other organ in the body is maintained or replaced, the brain cells, which cannot be replaced without changing and therefore killing the personality, must eventually die. My own positronic pathways have lasted nearly two centuries without perceptible change, and can last for centuries more. Isn't that the fundamental barrier? Human beings can tolerate an immortal robot, for it doesn't matter how long a machine lasts. They cannot tolerate an immortal human being, since their own mortality is endurable only so long as it is universal. And for that reason they won't make me a human being. Li Xing said, what is it you're leading up to, Andrew? I have removed that problem. Decades ago, my positronic brain was connected to organic nerves. Now, one last operation has arranged that connection in such a way that slowly, quite slowly, the potential is being drained from my pathways. Li Xing's finely wrinkled face showed no expression for a moment. Then her lips tightened. Do you mean you've arranged to die, Andrew? You can't have. That violates the third law. No, said Andrew. I have chosen between the death of my body and the death of my aspirations and desires. To have let my body live at the cost of the greater death is what would have violated the third law. Li Xing seized his arm as though she were about to shake him. She stopped herself. Andrew, it won't work. Change it back. It can't be. Too much damage was done. I have a year to live, more or less. I will last through the two hundredth anniversary of my construction. I was weak enough to arrange that. How can it be worth it? Andrew, you're a fool! If it brings me humanity, that will be worth it. If it doesn't, it will bring an end to striving, and that will be worth it, too. And Li Xing did something that astonished herself. Quietly, she began to weep. 22. It was odd how that last deed caught at the imagination of the world. All that Andrew had done before had not swayed them, but he had finally accepted even death to be human, and the sacrifice was too great to be rejected. The final ceremony was timed, quite deliberately, for the two hundredth anniversary. The world president was to sign the act and make it law and the ceremony would be visible on a global network and would be beamed to the lunar state and even to the Martian colony. Andrew was in a wheelchair. He could still walk, but only shakily. With mankind watching, the world president said, Fifty years ago you were declared a sesquicentennial robot, Andrew. After a pause and in a more solemn tone, he said, Today we declare you a bicentennial man, Mr. Martin. And Andrew, smiling, held out his hand to shake that of the President. 23. Andrew's thoughts were slowly fading as he lay in bed. Desperately he seized at them. Man! He was a man! He wanted that to be his last thought. He wanted to dissolve, die, with that. He opened his eyes one more time, and for one last time recognized Li Xing waiting solemnly. There were others, but those were only shadows, unrecognizable shadows. Only Li Xing stood out against the deepening gray. Slowly, inchingly, he held out his hand to her, and very dimly and faintly felt her take it. She was fading in his eyes as the last of his thoughts trickled away. But before she faded completely, one last fugitive thought came to him, and rested for a moment on his mind before everything stopped. "'Little miss,' he whispered, too low to be heard. Someday Niccolo Mazzetti lay stomach down on the rug, chin buried in the palm of one small hand, and listened to the bard disconsolately. 
There was even the suspicion of tears in his dark eyes, a luxury an eleven-year-old could allow himself only when alone. The bard said, Once upon a time, in the middle of a deep wood, there lived a poor woodcutter and his two motherless daughters, who were each as beautiful as the day is long. The older daughter had long hair as black as a feather from a raven's wing, but the younger daughter had hair as bright and golden as the sunlight of an autumn afternoon. Many times, while the girls were waiting for their father to come home from his day's work in the wood, the older girl would sit before a mirror and sing. What she sang, Nicola did not hear, for a call sounded from outside the room. Hey, Nicky! And Nicolo, his face clearing on the moment, rushed to the window and shouted, Hey, Paul! Paul Loeb waved an excited hand. He was thinner than Nicolo, and not as tall, for all he was six months older. His face was full of repressed tension, which showed itself most clearly in the rapid blinking of his eyelids. Hey, Nicky, let me in! I've got an idea and a half! Wait till you hear it! He looked rapidly about him as though to check on the possibility of eavesdroppers, but the front yard was quite patently empty. He repeated in a whisper, "'Wait till you hear it!' "'All right, I'll open the door.' The bard continued smoothly, oblivious to the sudden loss of attention on the part of Niccolo. As Paul entered, the bard was saying, "'Thereupon the lion said, "'If you will find me the lost egg of the bird which flies over the ebony mountain once every ten years, I will—' Paul said, "'Is that a bard you're listening to? I didn't know you had one.' Niccolo reddened, and the look of unhappiness returned to his face. "'Just an old thing I had when I was a kid. It ain't much good.' He kicked at the bard with his foot, and caught the somewhat scarred and discolored plastic covering a glancing blow. The bard hiccuped as its speaking attachment was jarred out of contact a moment, then it went on. "'For a year and a day, until the iron shoes were worn out, the princess stopped at the side of the road.' Paul said, "'Boy, that is an old model,' and looked at it critically. Despite Niccolo's own bitterness against the bard, he winced at the other's condescending tone. For the moment he was sorry he had allowed Paul in, at least before he had restored the bard to its usual resting place in the basement. It was only in the desperation of a dull day and a fruitless discussion with his father that he had resurrected it, and it turned out to be just as stupid as he had expected. Nicky was a little afraid of Paul, anyway, since Paul had special courses at school, and everyone said he was going to grow up to be a computing engineer. Not that Niccolo himself was doing badly at school. He got adequate marks in logic, binary manipulations, computing, and elementary circuits, all the usual grammar school subjects. But that was it. They were just the usual subjects, and he would grow up to be a control board guard like everyone else. Paul, however, knew mysterious things about what he called electronics and theoretical mathematics and programming, especially programming. Niccolo didn't even try to understand when Paul bubbled over about it. Paul listened to the bard for a few minutes and said, "'You been using it much?' "'No,' said Niccolo, offended. "'I've had it in the basement since before you moved into the neighborhood. I just got it out today.' He lacked an excuse that seemed adequate to himself, so he concluded, I just got it out. Paul said, Is that what it tells you about? Woodcutters and princesses and talking animals? Niccolo said, It's terrible. My dad says we can't afford a new one. I said to him this morning. The memory of the morning's fruitless pleadings brought Niccolo dangerously near tears, which he repressed in a panic. Somehow he felt that Paul's thin cheeks never felt the stain of tears and that Paul would have only contempt for anyone else less strong than himself. Niccolo went on, So I thought I'd try this old thing again, but it's no good. Paul turned off the bard, pressed the contact that led to a nearly instantaneous reorientation and recombination of the vocabulary, characters, plot lines, and climaxes stored within it. Then he reactivated it. The bard began smoothly. Once upon a time there was a little boy named Willikens, whose mother had died and who lived with a stepfather and a stepbrother. Although the stepfather was very well-to-do, 
he begrudged poor Willikins the very bed he slept in, so that Willikins was forced to get such rest as he could on a pile of straw in the stable next to the horses. Horses? cried Paul. They're a kind of animal, said Niccolo. I think. I know that. I just mean imagine stories about horses. It tells about horses all the time, said Niccolo. There are things called cows, too. You milk them, but the bard doesn't say how. Well, gee, why don't you fix it up? I'd like to know how. The bard was saying, Often Willikins would think that if only he were rich and powerful, he would show his stepfather and stepbrother what it meant to be cruel to a little boy. So one day he decided to go out into the world and seek his fortune. Paul, who wasn't listening to the bard, said, It's easy. The bard has memory cylinders all fixed up for plot lines and climaxes and things. We don't have to worry about that. It's just vocabulary we've got to fix, so it'll know about computers and automation and electronics and real things about today. Then it can tell interesting stories, you know, instead of about princesses and things. Niccolo said despondently, I wish we could do that. Paul said, Listen, my dad says if I get into special computing school next year, he'll get me a real bard, a late model, a big one with an attachment for space stories and mysteries, and a visual attachment, too. You mean see the stories? Sure. Mr. Doherty at school says they've got things like that now, but not for just everybody. Only if I get into computing school, dad can get a few breaks. Niccolo's eyes bulged with envy. Gee, seeing a story. You can come over and watch any time, Nicky. Oh, boy, thanks. That's all right. But remember, I'm the guy who says what kind of story we hear. Sure, sure. Niccolo would have agreed readily to much more onerous conditions. Paul's attention returned to the bard. It was saying, If that is the case, said the king, stroking his beard and frowning, till clouds filled the sky and lightning flashed, you will see to it that my entire land is freed of flies by this time day after tomorrow, or— All we've got to do, said Paul, is open it up. He shut the bard off again, and was prying at its front panel as he spoke. Hey, said Niccolo, in sudden alarm, don't break it. I won't break it, said Paul impatiently. I know all about these things. Then, with sudden caution, your father and mother home? No. All right, then. He had the front panel off and peered in. Boy, this is a one-cylinder thing. He worked away at the bard's innards. Niccolo, who watched with painful suspense, could not make out what he was doing. Paul pulled out a thin, flexible metal strip powdered with dots. That's the bard's memory cylinder. I'll bet its capacity for stories is under a trillion. What are you going to do, Paul? quavered Niccolo. I'll give it vocabulary. How? Easy. I've got a book here. Mr. Doherty gave it to me at school. Paul pulled the book out of his pocket and pried at it till he had its plastic jacket off. He unreeled the tape a bit, ran it through the vocalizer, which he turned down to a whisper, then placed it within the bard's vitals. He made further attachments. What'll that do? The book will talk, and the bard will put it all on its memory tape. What good will that do? Boy, you're a dope. This book is all about computers and automation, and the bard will get all that information. Then he can stop talking about kings making lightning when they frown. Niccolo said, And the good guy always wins anyway. There's no excitement. Oh, well, said Paul, watching to see if his setup was working properly. That's the way they make bards. They got to have the good guy win and make the bad guys lose and things like that. I heard my father talking about it once. He says that without censorship there'd be no telling what the younger generation would come to. He says it's bad enough as it is. There, it's working fine. Paul brushed his hands against one another and turned away from the bard. He said, But listen, I didn't tell you my idea yet. It's the best thing you ever heard, I bet. I came right to you because I figured you'd come in with me. Sure, Paul, sure. Okay, you know Mr. Doherty at school? You know what a funny kind of guy he is. Well, he likes me, kind of. I know. I was over his house after school today. You were? Sure. He says I'm going to be entering computer school, and he wants to encourage me and things like that. 
He says the world needs more people who can design advanced computer circuits and do proper programming. Oh? Paul might have caught some of the emptiness behind that monosyllable. He said impatiently, Programming! I told you a hundred times. That's when you set up problems for the giant computers like Multivac to work on. Mr. Doherty says it gets harder all the time to find people who can really run computers. He says anyone can keep an eye on the controls and check off answers and put through routine problems. He says the trick is to expand research and figure out ways to ask the right questions, and that's hard. Anyway, Nicky, he took me to his place and showed me his collection of old computers. It's kind of a hobby of his to collect old computers. He had tiny computers you had to push with your hand, with little knobs all over it. And he had a hunk of wood he called a slide rule, with a little piece of it that went in and out, and some wires with balls on them. He even had a hunk of paper with a kind of thing he called a multiplication table. Nicolo, who found himself only moderately interested, said, A paper table? It wasn't really a table like you eat on. It was different. It was to help people compute. Mr. Doherty tried to explain, but he didn't have much time, and it was kind of complicated anyway. Why didn't people just use a computer? That was before they had computers, cried Paul. Before? Sure. Do you think people always had computers? Didn't you ever hear of cavemen? Nicolo said, How'd they get along without computers? I don't know. Mr. Doherty says they just had children any old time, and did anything that came into their heads, whether it would be good for everybody or not. They didn't even know if it was good or not. And farmers grew things with their hands, and people had to do all the work in the factories and run all the machines. I don't believe you. That's what Mr. Doherty said. He said it was just plain messy, and everyone was miserable. Anyway, let me get to my idea, will you? Well, go ahead. Who's stopping you? said Nicolo, offended. All right. Well, the hand computers, the ones with the knobs, had little squiggles on each knob, and the slide rule had squiggles on it, and the multiplication table was all squiggles. I asked what they were. Mr. Doherty said they were numbers. What? Each different squiggle stood for a different number. For one, you made a kind of mark. For two, you made another kind of mark. For three, another one, and so on. What for? So you could compute. What for? You just tell the computer. Jiminy, cried Paul, his face twisting with anger. Can't you get it through your head? These slide rules and things didn't talk. Then how? The answers showed up in squiggles, and you had to know what the squiggles meant. Mr. Doherty says that in olden days, everybody learned how to make squiggles when they were kids, and how to decode them, too. Making squiggles was called writing, and decoding them was reading. He says there was a different kind of squiggle for every word, and they used to write whole books in squiggles. He said they had some at the museum, and I could look at them if I wanted to. He said if I was going to be a real computer programmer, I would have to know about the history of computing, and that's why he was showing me all these things. Nicolo frowned. He said, You mean everybody had to figure out squiggles for every word and remember them? Is this all real, or are you making it up? It's all real, honest. Look, this is the way you make a one. He drew his finger through the air in a rapid downstroke. This way you make two, and this way three. I learned all the numbers up to nine. Nicolo watched the curving finger uncomprehendingly. What's the good of it? You can learn how to make words. I asked Mr. Doherty how you make the squiggle for Paul Loeb, but he didn't know. He said there were people at the museum who would know. He said there were people who had learned how to decode whole books. He said computers could be designed to decode books and used to be used that way, but not any more, because we have real books now, with magnetic tapes that go through the vocalizer and come out talking, you know? Sure. So if we go down to the museum, we can get to learn how to make words in squiggles. They'll let us because I'm going to computer school. Nicolo was riddled with disappointment. Is that your idea? Holy smokes, Paul, who wants to do that? Make stupid squiggles. Don't you get it? Don't you get it, you dope? It'll be secret message stuff. What? Sure. What good is talking when everyone can understand you? With squiggles, you can send secret messages. You can make them on paper, and nobody in the world would know what you were saying unless they knew the squiggles, too. And they wouldn't, you bet, unless we taught them. 
We can have a real club with initiations and rules and a clubhouse. Boy! A certain excitement began stirring in Nicolo's bosom. What kind of secret messages? Any kind! Say I want to tell you to come over my place and watch my new visual bard, and I don't want any of the other fellows to come. I make the right squiggles on paper, and I give it to you, and you look at it and you know what to do. Nobody else does. You can even show it to them, and they wouldn't know a thing. Hey, that's something, yelled Nicolo, completely won over. When do we learn how? Tomorrow, said Paul. I'll get Mr. Doherty to explain to the museum that it's all right, and you get your mother and father to say okay. We can go down right after school and start learning. Sure, cried Nicolo. We can be club officers. I'll be president of the club, said Paul matter-of-factly. You can be vice president. All right. Hey, this is going to be lots more fun than the bard. He was suddenly reminded of the bard and said in sudden apprehension, Hey, what about my old bard? Paul turned to look at it. It was quietly taking in the slowly unreeling book, and the sound of the book's vocalizations was a dimly heard murmur. He said, I'll disconnect it. He worked away while Niccolo watched anxiously. After a few moments, Paul put his reassembled book into his pocket, replaced the bard's panel, and activated it. The bard said, Once upon a time, in a large city, there lived a poor young boy named Fair Johnny, whose only friend in the world was a small computer. The computer each morning would tell the boy whether it would rain that day, and answer any problems he might have. It was never wrong. But it so happened that one day the king of that land, having heard of the little computer, decided that he would have it as his own. With this purpose in mind, he called in his grand vizier and said, Nicolo turned off the bard with a quick motion of his hand. Same old junk, he said passionately, just with a computer thrown in. Well, said Paul, they got so much stuff on the tape already that the computer business doesn't show up much when random combinations are made. What's the difference, anyway? You just need a new model. We'll never be able to afford one, just this dirty old miserable thing. He kicked at it again, hitting it more squarely this time. The bard moved backward with a squeal of casters. You can always watch mine when I get it, said Paul. Besides, don't forget our squiggle club. Niccolo nodded. I tell you what, said Paul, let's go over my place. My father has some books about old times. We can listen to them and maybe get some ideas. You punch a message for your folks, and maybe you can stay over for supper. Come on. Okay, said Niccolo, and the two boys ran out together. Niccolo, in his eagerness, ran almost squarely into the bard, but he only rubbed at the spot on his hip where he had made contact and ran on. The activation signal of the bard glowed. Niccolo's collision closed a circuit, and although it was alone in the room and there was none to hear, it began a story nevertheless. But not in its usual voice somehow, in a lower tone that had a hint of throatiness in it. An adult, listening, might almost have thought that the voice carried a hint of passion in it, a trace of near feeling. The bard said, once upon a time there was a little computer named the Bard, who lived all alone with cruel step-people. The cruel step-people continually made fun of the little computer, and sneered at him, telling him he was good for nothing, and that he was a useless object. They struck him, and kept him in lonely rooms for months at a time. Yet through it all the little computer remained brave. He always did the best he could, obeying all orders cheerfully. Nevertheless, the step-people with whom he lived remained cruel and heartless. One day the little computer learned that in the world there existed a great many computers of all sorts, great numbers of them. Some were bards like himself, but some ran factories and some ran farms. Some organized population and some analyzed all kinds of data. Many were very powerful and very wise, much more powerful and wise than the step-people who were so cruel to the little computer. And the little computer knew then that computers would always grow wiser and more powerful, until some day, some day, some day. But a valve must finally have stuck in the bard's aging and corroding vitals, for as it waited alone in the darkening room through the evening, it could only whisper over and over again, Some day, some day, some day. 
think. Genevieve Renshaw, M.D., had her hands deep in the pockets of her lab coat, and fists were clearly outlined within, but she spoke calmly. The fact is, she said, that I'm almost ready, but I'll need help to keep it going long enough to be ready. James Berkowitz, a physicist who tended to patronize mere physicians when they were too attractive to be despised, had a tendency to call her Jenny Wren when out of hearing. He was fond of saying that Jenny Wren had a classic profile, and a brow surprisingly smooth and unlined, considering that behind it so keen a brain ticked. He knew better than to express his admiration, however, of the classic profile, that is, since that would be male chauvinism. Admiring the brain was better, but on the whole he preferred not to do that out loud in her presence. He said, thumb rasping along the just-appearing stubble on his chin, I don't think the front office is going to be patient for much longer. The impression I have is that they're going to have you on the carpet before the end of the week. That's why I need your help. Nothing I can do, I'm afraid. He caught an unexpected glimpse of his face in the mirror, and momentarily admired the set of the black waves in his hair. And Adams, she said. Adam Orsino, who had till that moment sipped his coffee and felt detached, looked as though he had been jabbed from behind, and said, Why me? His full, plump lips quivered. Because you're the laser men here, Jim the theoretician and Adam the engineer and I've got a laser application that goes beyond anything either of you have imagined. I won't convince them of that, but you two would. Provided, said Berkowitz, that you can convince us first. All right. Suppose you let me have an hour of your valuable time, if you're not afraid to be shown something completely new about lasers. You can take it out of your coffee break. Renshaw's laboratory was dominated by her computer. It was not that the computer was unusually large, but it was virtually omnipresent. Renshaw had learned computer technology on her own, and had modified and extended her computer until no one but she, and Berkowitz sometimes believed not even she, could handle it with ease. Not bad, she would say, for someone in the life sciences. She closed the door before saying a word, then turned to face the other two somberly. Berkowitz was uncomfortably aware of a faintly unpleasant odor in the air, and Orsino's wrinkling nose showed that he was aware of it, too. Renshaw said, Let me list the laser applications for you, if you don't mind my lighting a candle in the sunshine. The laser is coherent radiation, with all the light waves of the same length and moving in the same direction, so it's noise-free and can be used in holography. By modulating the waveforms, we can imprint information on it with a high degree of accuracy. What's more, since the light waves are only a millionth the length of radio waves, a laser beam can carry a million times the information an equivalent radio beam can. Berkowitz seemed amused. Are you working on a laser-based communication system, Jenny? Not at all, she replied. I leave such obvious advances to physicists and engineers. Lasers can also concentrate quantities of energy into a microscopic area and deliver that energy in quantity. On a large scale, you can implode hydrogen and perhaps begin a controlled fusion reaction. I know you don't have that, said Orsino, his bald head glistening in the overhead fluorescence. I don't. I haven't tried. On a smaller scale, you can drill holes in the most refractory materials, weld selected bits, Heat treat them, gouge and scribe them. You can remove or fuse tiny portions in restricted areas with heat delivered so rapidly that surrounding areas have no time to warm up before the treatment is over. You can work on the retina of the eye, the dentine of the teeth, and so on. And, of course, the laser is an amplifier capable of magnifying weak signals with great accuracy. And why do you tell us all this? said Berkowitz. To point out how these properties can be made to fit my own field, which, you know, is neurophysiology. She made a brushing motion with her hand at her brown hair, as though she were suddenly nervous. For decades, she said, we've been able to measure the tiny, shifting electric potentials of the brain and record them as electroencephalograms, or EEGs. We've got alpha waves, beta waves, delta waves, theta waves, 
different variations at different times, depending on whether eyes are open or closed, whether the subject is awake, meditating, or asleep. But we've gotten very little information out of it all. The trouble is that we're getting the signals of ten billion neurons in shifting combinations. It's like listening to the noise of all the human beings on Earth, two Earths, from a great distance, and trying to make out individual conversations. It can't be done. We could detect some gross overall change, a world war and the rise in the volume of noise, but nothing finer. In the same way, we can tell some gross malfunction of the brain, epilepsy, but nothing finer. Suppose now the brain might be scanned by a tiny laser beam, cell by cell, and so rapidly that at no time does a single cell receive enough energy to raise its temperature significantly. The tiny potentials of each cell can, in feedback, affect the laser beam, and the modulations can be amplified and recorded. You will then get a new kind of measurement, a laser encephalogram, or LEG if you wish, which will contain millions of times as much information as ordinary EEGs. Berkowitz said, A nice thought, but just a thought. More than a thought, Jim. I've been working on it for five years, spare time at first. Lately it's been full time, which is what annoys the front office, because I haven't been sending in reports. Why not? Because it got to the point where it sounded too mad, where I had to know where I was and where I had to be sure of getting backing first. She pulled a screen aside and revealed a cage that contained a pair of mournful-eyed marmosets. Berkowitz and Orsino looked at each other. Berkowitz touched his nose. I thought I smelled something. What are you doing with those? asked Orsino. Berkowitz said, at a guess, she's been scanning the marmoset brain. Have you, Jenny? I started considerably lower in the animal scale. She opened the cage and took out one of the marmosets, which looked at her with a miniature sad old man with sideburns expression. She clucked to it, stroked it, and gently strapped it into a small harness. Orsino said, What are you doing? I can't have it moving around if I'm going to make it part of a circuit, and I can't anesthetize it without vitiating the experiment. There are several electrodes implanted in the marmoset's brain, and I'm going to connect them with my LEG system. The laser I'm using is here. I'm sure you recognize the model, and I won't bother giving you its specifications. Thanks, said Berkowitz, but you might tell us what we're going to see. It would be just as easy to show you. Just watch the screen. She connected the leads to the electrodes with a quiet and sure efficiency, then turned a knob that dimmed the overhead lights in the room. On the screen there appeared a jagged complex of peaks and valleys, in a fine, bright line that was wrinkled into secondary and tertiary peaks and valleys. Slowly these shifted in a series of minor changes, with occasional flashes of sudden major differences. It was as though the irregular line had a life of its own. This, said Renshaw, is essentially the EEG information, but in much greater detail. Enough detail, asked Orsino, to tell you what's going on in individual cells? In theory, yes. Practically, no. Not yet. But we can separate this overall LEG into component grams. Watch. She punched the computer keyboard, and the line changed and changed again. Now it was a small, nearly regular wave that shifted forward and backward in what was almost a heartbeat. Now it was jagged and sharp, now intermittent, now nearly featureless, all in quick switches of geometric surrealism. Berkowitz said, You mean that every bit of the brain is that different from every other? No, said Renshaw. Not at all. The brain is very largely a holographic device. But there are minor shifts in emphasis from place to place, and Mike can subtract them as deviations from the norm and use the LEG system to amplify those variations. The amplifications can be varied from ten thousand fold to ten million fold. The laser system is that noise free. Who's Mike? asked Orsino. Mike? said Renshaw, momentarily puzzled. The skin over her cheekbones reddened slightly. Did I say? Well, I call it that sometimes. It's short for my computer. She waved her arm about the room. My computer, Mike. Very carefully programmed. 
Berkowitz nodded and said, All right, Jenny, what's it all about? If you've got a new brain-scanning device using lasers, fine. It's an interesting application, and you're right, it's not one I would have thought of, but then I'm no neurophysiologist. But why not write it up? It seems to me the front office would support. But this is just the beginning. She turned off the scanning device and placed a piece of fruit in the marmoset's mouth. The creature did not seem alarmed or in discomfort. It chewed slowly. Renshaw unhooked the leads but allowed it to remain in its harness. Renshaw said, I can identify the various separate grams. Some are associated with the various senses, some with visceral reactions, some with emotions. We can do a lot with that, but I don't want to stop there. The interesting thing is that one is associated with abstract thought. Orsino's plump face wrinkled into a look of disbelief. How can you tell? That particular form of gram gets more pronounced as one goes up the animal kingdom toward greater complexity of brain. No other gram does. Besides, she paused, then, as though gathering strength of purpose, she said, Those grams are enormously amplified. They can be picked up, detected. I can tell vaguely that there are thoughts. By God, said Berkowitz, telepathy. Yes, she said defiantly. Exactly. No wonder you haven't wanted to report it. Come on, Jenny. Why not? said Renshaw warmly. Granted, there could be no telepathy just using the unamplified potential patterns of the human brain any more than anyone can see features on the Martian surface with the unaided eye. But once instruments are invented, the telescope, this, then tell the front office. No, said Renshaw. They won't believe me. They'll try to stop me. But they'll have to take you seriously, Jim, and you, Adam. What would you expect me to tell them, said Berkowitz. What you experience. I'm going to hook up the marmoset again and have my, my computer pick out the abstract thought gram. It will only take a moment. The computer always selects the abstract thought gram unless it is directed not to do so. Why? Because the computer thinks too? Berkowitz laughed. That's not all that funny, said Renshaw. I suspect there is a resonance there. This computer is complex enough to set up an electromagnetic pattern that may have elements in common with the abstract thought gram. In any case, the marmoset's brain waves were flickering on the screen again, but it was not a gram the man had seen before. It was a gram that was almost furry in its complexity and was changing constantly. I don't detect anything, said Orsino. You have to be put into the receiving circuit, said Renshaw. You mean implant electrodes in our brain? asked Berkowitz. No, on your skull. That would be sufficient. I'd prefer you, Adam, since there would be no insulating hair. Oh, come on, I've been part of the circuit myself. It won't hurt. Orsino submitted with a bad grace. His muscles were visibly tense, but he allowed the leads to be strapped to his skull. Do you sense anything? asked Renshaw. Orsino cocked his head and assumed a listening posture. He seemed to grow interested in spite of himself. He said, I seem to be aware of a humming and, and a little high-pitched squeaking and, that's funny, a kind of twitching. Berkowitz said, I suppose the marmoset isn't likely to think in words. Certainly not, said Renshaw. Well then, said Berkowitz, if you're suggesting that some squeaking and twitching sensation represents thought, you're guessing. You're not being compelling. Renshaw said, so we go up the scale once again. She removed the marmoset from its harness and put it back in its cage. You mean you have a man as a subject? said Orsino, unbelieving. I have myself as a subject, a person. You've got electrodes implanted? No! In my case, my computer has a stronger potential flicker to work with. My brain has ten times the mass of the marmoset brain. Mike can pick up my component grams through the skull. How do you know? asked Berkowitz. Don't you think I've tried it on myself before this? Now help me with this, please. Right. Her fingers flicked on the computer keyboard, and at once the screen flickered with an intricately varying wave, an intricacy that made it almost a maze. "'Would you replace your own leads, Adam?' said Renshaw. 
Orsino did so with Berkowitz's not entirely approving help. Again Orsino cocked his head and listened. I hear words, he said, but they're disjointed and overlapping, like different people speaking. I'm not trying to think consciously, said Renshaw. When you talk, I hear an echo. Berkowitz said dryly, Don't talk, Jenny. Blank out your mind and see if he doesn't hear you think. Orsino said, I don't hear any echo when you talk, Jim. Berkowitz said, If you don't shut up, you won't hear anything. A heavy silence fell on all three. Then Orsino nodded, reached for pen and paper on the desk, and wrote something. Renshaw reached out, threw a switch, and pulled the leads up and over her head, shaking her hair back into place. She said, I hope that what you wrote down was, Adam, raise Cain with the front office, and Jim will eat crow. Orsino said, It's what I wrote down, word for word. Renshaw said, Well, there you are, working telepathy, and we don't have to use it to transmit nonsense sentences either. Think of the use in psychiatry and in the treatment of mental disease. Think of its use in education and in teaching machines. Think of its use in legal investigations and criminal trials. Orsino said, wide-eyed, Frankly, the social implications are staggering. I don't know if something like this should be allowed. Under proper legal safeguards, why not? said Renshaw indifferently. Anyway, if you two join me now, our combined weight can carry this thing and push it over. And if you come along with me, it will be Nobel Prize time for— Berkowitz said grimly, I'm not in this, not yet. What? What do you mean? Renshaw sounded outraged, her coldly beautiful face flushed suddenly. Telepathy is too touchy, it's too fascinating, too desired. We could be fooling ourselves. Listen for yourself, Jim. I could be fooling myself, too. I want a control. What do you mean, a control? Short circuit the origin of thought. Leave out the animal. No marmoset, no human being. Let Orsino listen to metal and glass and laser light, and if he still hears thought, then we're kidding ourselves. Suppose he detects nothing. Then I'll listen, and if without looking, if you can arrange to have me in the next room, I can tell when you are in and when you are out of circuit, then I'll consider joining you in this thing. Very well, then, said Renshaw. We'll try a control. I've never done it, but it isn't hard. She maneuvered the leads that had been over her head and put them into contact with each other. Now, Adam, if you will resume. But before she could go further, there came a cold, clear sound, as pure and as clean as the tinkle of breaking icicles. At last! Renshaw said, What? Orsino said, Who said? Berkowitz said, Did someone say at last? Renshaw, pale, said, It wasn't sound. It was in my... Did you two? The clear sound came again. I'm my... And Renshaw tore the leads apart, and there was silence. She said with a voiceless motion of her lips, I think it's my computer. Mike. You mean he's thinking? said Orsino, nearly as voiceless. Renshaw said in an unrecognizable voice that at least had regained sound, I said it was complex enough to have something. Do you suppose? It always turned automatically to the abstract thought-gram of whatever brain was in its circuit. Do you suppose that with no brain in the circuit it turned to its own? There was silence. Then Berkowitz said, Are you trying to say that this computer thinks— but can't express its thoughts as long as it's under force of programming, but that given the chance in your LEG system— But that can't be so, said Orsino, high-pitched. No one was receiving. It's not the same thing. Renshaw said, The computer works on much greater power intensities than brains do. I suppose it can magnify itself to the point where we can detect it directly without artificial aid. How else can you explain? Berkowitz said abruptly, well, you have another application of lasers, then. It enables you to talk to computers as independent intelligences, person to person. And Renshaw said, Oh, God, what do we do now? Segregationist The surgeon looked up without expression. Is he ready? Ready is a relative term, said the med Eng. We're ready. He's restless. They always are. Well, it's a serious operation. 
Serious or not, he should be thankful. He's been chosen for it over an enormous number of possibles, and frankly, I don't think— Don't say it, said the surgeon. The decision is not ours to make. We accept it, but do we have to agree? Yes, said the surgeon crisply. We agree, completely and wholeheartedly. The operation is entirely too intricate to approach with mental reservations. This man has proven his worth in a number of ways, and his profile is suitable for the Board of Mortality. All right, said the med Eng, unmollified. The surgeon said, I'll see him right in here, I think. It is small enough and personal enough to be comforting. It won't help. He's nervous, and he's made up his mind. Has he indeed? Yes, he wants metal. They always do. The surgeon's face did not change expression. He stared at his hands. Sometimes one can talk them out of it. Why bother, said the med Eng indifferently. If he wants metal, let it be metal. You don't care? Why should I? The med Eng said it almost brutally. Either way, it's a medical engineering problem, and I'm a medical engineer. Either way, I can handle it. Why should I go beyond that? The surgeon said stolidly. To me, it is a matter of the fitness of things. Fitness? You can't use that as an argument. What does the patient care about the fitness of things? I care. You care in a minority. The trend is against you. You have no chance. I have to try. The surgeon waved the med engine into silence with a quick wave of his hand. No impatience to it, merely quickness. He had already informed the nurse, and he had already been signaled concerning her approach. He pressed a small button, and the double door pulled swiftly apart. The patient moved inward in his motor chair, the nurse stepping briskly along beside him. "'You may go, nurse,' said the surgeon. "'But wait outside. I will be calling you.' He nodded to the med Eng, who left with the nurse, and the door closed behind them. The man in the chair looked over his shoulder and watched them go. His neck was scrawny, and there were fine wrinkles about his eyes. He was freshly shaven, and the fingers of his hands, as they gripped the arms of the chair tightly, showed manicured nails. He was a high-priority patient, and he was being taken care of. But there was a look of settled peevishness on his face. He said, "'Will we be starting today?' The surgeon nodded. "'This afternoon, Senator.' I understand it will take weeks. Not for the operation itself, Senator. But there are a number of subsidiary points to be taken care of. There are some circulatory renovations that must be carried through, and hormonal adjustments. These are tricky things. Are they dangerous? Then, as though feeling the need for establishing a friendly relationship, but patently against his will, he added, Doctor! The surgeon paid no attention to the nuances of expression. He said flatly, Everything is dangerous. We take our time in order that it be less dangerous. It is the time required, the skill of many individuals united, the equipment that makes such operations available to so few. I know that, said the patient restlessly. I refuse to feel guilty about that. Or are you implying improper pressure? Not at all, Senator. The decisions of the board have never been questioned. I mention the difficulty and intricacy of the operation merely to explain my desire to have it conducted in the best fashion possible. Well, do so, then. That is my desire also. Then I must ask you to make a decision. It is possible to supply you with either of two types of cyber hearts, metal or— Plastic, said the patient irritably. Isn't that the alternative you were going to offer, doctor? Cheap plastic. I don't want that. I've made my choice. I want the metal. But, see here, I've been told the choice rests with me. Isn't that so? The surgeon nodded. Where two alternate procedures are of equal value from a medical standpoint, the choice rests with the patient. In actual practice, the choice rests with the patient even when the alternate procedures are not of equal value, as in this case. The patient's eyes narrowed. Are you trying to tell me the plastic heart is superior? It depends on the patient. In my opinion, in your individual case, it is. And we prefer not to use the term plastic. It is a fibrous cyber heart. It's plastic as far as I am concerned. 
Senator, said the surgeon, infinitely patient, the material is not plastic in the ordinary sense of the word. It is a polymeric material, true, but one that is far more complex than ordinary plastic. It is a complex protein-like fiber designed to imitate as closely as possible the natural structure of the human heart you now have within your chest. Exactly. And the human heart I now have within my chest is worn out, although I am not yet sixty years old. I don't want another one like it, thank you. I want something better. We all want something better for you, Senator. The fibrous cyber heart will be better. It has a potential life of centuries. It is absolutely non-allergenic. Isn't that so for the metallic heart, too? Yes, it is, said the surgeon. The metallic cyber is of titanium alloy that— And it doesn't wear out? And it is stronger than plastic, or fiber, or whatever you want to call it? The metal is physically stronger, yes, but mechanical strength is not a pointed issue. Its mechanical strength does you no particular good, since the heart is well protected. Anything capable of reaching the heart will kill you for other reasons, even if the heart stands up under manhandling. The patient shrugged. If I ever break a rib, I'll have that replaced by titanium also. Replacing bones is easy. Anyone can have that done any time. I'll be as metallic as I want to be, doctor. That is your right, if you so choose. However, it is only fair to tell you that although no metallic cyber heart has ever broken down mechanically, a number have broken down electronically. What does that mean? It means that every cyber heart contains a pacemaker as part of its structure. In the case of the metallic variety, this is an electronic device that keeps the cyber in rhythm. It means an entire battery of miniaturized equipment must be included to alter the heart's rhythm to suit an individual's emotional and physical state. Occasionally something goes wrong there, and people have died before that wrong could be corrected. I never heard of such a thing. I assure you it happens. Are you telling me it happens often? Not at all. It happens very rarely. Well, then, I'll take my chance. What about the plastic heart? Doesn't that contain a pacemaker? Of course it does, Senator. But the chemical structure of a fibrous cyber heart is quite close to that of human tissue. It can respond to the ionic and hormonal controls of the body itself. The total complex that need be inserted is far simpler than in the case of the metal cyber. But doesn't the plastic heart ever pop out of hormonal control? None has ever yet done so because you haven't been working with them long enough, isn't that so?" The surgeon hesitated. It is true that the fibrous cybers have not been used nearly as long as the metallic. There you are. What is it, anyway, doctor? Are you afraid I'm making myself into a robot, into a metallo, as they call them, since citizenship went through? There is nothing wrong with a metallo as a metallo. As you say, they are citizens. But you're not a metallo. You're a human being. Why not stay a human being? Because I want the best, and that's a metallic heart. You see to that. The surgeon nodded. Very well. You will be asked to sign the necessary permissions, and you will then be fitted with a metal heart. And you'll be the surgeon in charge. They tell me you're the best. I will do what I can to make the changeover an easy one. The door opened, and the chair moved the patient out to the waiting nurse. The med Eng came in, looking over his shoulder at the receding patient until the doors had closed again. He turned to the surgeon. Well, I can't tell what happened just by looking at you. What was his decision? The surgeon bent over his desk, punching out the final items for his records. What you predicted? He insists on the metallic cyber heart. After all, they are better. Not significantly. They've been around longer, no more than that. It's this mania that's been plaguing humanity ever since metallos have become citizens. Men have this odd desire to make metallos out of themselves. They yearn for the physical strength and endurance one associates with them. It isn't one-sided, Doc. You don't work with metallos, but I do, so I know. The last two who came in for repairs have asked for fibrous elements. Did they get them? In one case, it was just a matter of supplying tendons. It didn't make much difference there, metal or fiber. 
The other wanted a blood system or its equivalent. I told him I couldn't, not without a complete rebuilding of the structure of his body in fibrous material. I suppose it will come to that some day. Metallos that aren't really metallos at all, but a kind of flesh and blood. You don't mind that thought? Why not? And metallized human beings, too. We have two varieties of intelligence on Earth now, and why bother with two? Let them approach each other, and eventually we won't be able to tell the difference. Why should we want to? We'd have the best of both worlds, the advantages of man combined with those of robot. You'd get a hybrid, said the surgeon, with something that approached fierceness. You'd get something that is not both, but neither. Isn't it logical to suppose an individual would be too proud of his structure and identity to want to dilute it with something alien? Would he want mongrelization? That's segregationist talk. Then let it be that, the surgeon said with calm emphasis. I believe in being what one is. I wouldn't change a bit of my own structure for any reason. If some of it absolutely required replacement, I would have that replacement as close to the original in nature as could possibly be managed. I am myself, well pleased to be myself, and would not be anything else. He had finished now and had to prepare for the operation. He placed his strong hands into the heating oven and let them reach the dull, red-hot glow that would sterilize them completely. For all his impassioned words, his voice had never risen, and on his burnished metal face there was, as always, no sign of expression. Mirror Image Lige Bailey had just decided to relight his pipe when the door of his office opened without a preliminary knock or announcement of any kind. Bailey looked up in pronounced annoyance and then dropped his pipe. It said a good deal for the state of his mind that he let it lie where it had fallen. "'Ah, Daniil Olivar, he said, in a kind of mystified excitement. "'Jehoshaphat, it is you, isn't it?' "'You're quite right,' said the tall, bronze newcomer, his even features never flicking for a moment out of their accustomed calm. "'I regret surprising you by entering without warning, but the situation is a delicate one, and there must be as little involvement as possible on the part of the men and robots even in this place. I am, in any case, pleased to see you again, friend Elijah.' and the robot held out his right hand in a gesture as thoroughly human as was his appearance. It was Bailey who was so unmanned by his astonishment as to stare at the hand with a momentary lack of understanding. But then he seized it in both of his, feeling its warm firmness. But, Daniil, why? You're welcome any time, but what is this situation that is a delicate one? Are we in trouble again? Earth, I mean? No, friend Elijah, it does not concern Earth. The situation to which I refer as a delicate one is, to outward appearances, a small thing. A dispute between mathematicians, nothing more. As we happened quite by accident to be within an easy jump of Earth. This dispute took place on a starship, then? Yes, indeed. A small dispute, yet to the humans involved, astonishingly large. Bailey could not help but smile. I'm not surprised you find humans astonishing. They do not obey the three laws. That is indeed a shortcoming, said Ardaniel gravely. And I think humans themselves are puzzled by humans. It may be that you are less puzzled than are the men of other worlds, because so many more human beings live on Earth than on the spacer worlds. If so, and I believe it is so, you could help us. Ardaniel paused momentarily and then said, perhaps a shade too quickly. And yet there are rules of human behavior which I have learned. It would seem, for instance, that I am deficient in etiquette by human standards, not to have asked after your wife and child. They are doing well. The boy is in college, and Jesse is involved in local politics. The amenities are taken care of. Now, tell me how you come to be here. As I said, we were within an easy jump of earth, said R. Daniel. So I suggested to the captain that we consult you. And the captain agreed? Bailey had a sudden picture of the proud and autocratic captain of a spacer starship, consenting to make a landing on Earth of all worlds, and to consult an Earthman of all people. I believe, said R. Daniel, that he was in a position where he would have agreed to anything. 
In addition, I praised you very highly, although, to be sure, I stated only the truth. Finally, I agreed to conduct all negotiations so that none of the crew or passengers would need to enter any of the Earthman cities. And talk to any Earthman, yes. But what has happened? The passengers of the starship Eta Carina included two mathematicians who were traveling to Aurora to attend an interstellar conference on neurobiophysics. It is about these mathematicians, Alfred Bar Humboldt and Janao Sabat, that the dispute centers. Have you perhaps, friend Elijah, heard of one or both of them? Neither one, said Bailey firmly. I know nothing about mathematics. Look, Daniil, surely you haven't told anyone I'm a mathematics buff, or— Not at all, friend Elijah. I know you are not. Nor does it matter, since the exact nature of the mathematics involved is in no way relevant to the point at issue. Well, then, go on. Since you do not know either man, friend Elijah, let me tell you that Dr. Humboldt is well into his twenty-seventh decade. Pardon me, friend Elijah? Nothing, nothing, said Bailey irritably. He had merely muttered to himself, more or less incoherently, in a natural reaction to the extended lifespans of the spacers. And he's still active, despite his age? On earth, mathematicians after thirty or so, Daniil said calmly. Dr. Humboldt is one of the top three mathematicians by long-established repute in the galaxy. Certainly he is still active. Dr. Sabat, on the other hand, is quite young, not yet fifty, but he has already established himself as the most remarkable new talent in the most abstruse branches of mathematics. They're both great, then, said Bailey. He remembered his pipe and picked it up. He decided there was no point in lighting it now and knocked out the dottle. What happened? Is this a murder case? Did one of them apparently kill the other? Of these two men of great reputation, one is trying to destroy that of the other. By human values, I believe this may be regarded as worse than physical murder. Sometimes, I suppose. Which one is trying to destroy the other? Why, that, friend Elijah, is precisely the point at issue. Which? Go on. Dr. Humboldt tells the story clearly. Shortly before he boarded the starship, he had an insight into a possible method for analyzing neural pathways from changes in microwave absorption patterns of local cortical areas. The insight was a purely mathematical technique of extraordinary subtlety, but I cannot, of course, either understand or sensibly transmit the details. These do not, however, matter. Dr. Humboldt considered the matter, and was more convinced each hour that he had something revolutionary on hand, something that would dwarf all his previous accomplishments in mathematics. Then he discovered that Dr. Sabat was on board. Ah, and he tried it out on young Sabat? Exactly. The two had met at professional meetings before, and knew each other thoroughly by reputation. Humboldt went into it with Sabat in great detail. Sabat backed Humboldt's analysis completely, and was unstinting in his praise of the importance of the discovery and of the ingenuity of the discoverer. Heartened and reassured by this, Humboldt prepared a paper outlining in summary his work, and two days later prepared to have it forwarded sub-etherically to the co-chairman of the conference at Aurora, in order that he might officially establish his priority and arrange for possible discussion before the sessions were closed. To his surprise, he found that Sabat was ready with a paper of his own, essentially the same as Humboldt's, and Sabat was also preparing to have it sub to Aurora. I suppose Humboldt was furious? Quite. And Sabat? What was his story? Precisely the same as Humboldt's, word for word except for the mirror image exchange of names. According to Sabat, it was he who had the insight, and he who consulted Humboldt. It was Humboldt who agreed with the analysis and praised it. Then each one claims the idea is his, and that the other stole it. It doesn't sound like a problem to me at all. In matters of scholarship, it would seem only necessary to produce the records of research, dated and initialed. Judgment as to priority can be made from that. Even if one is falsified, that might be discovered through internal inconsistencies. Ordinarily, friend Elijah, you would be right. But this is mathematics, and not in an experimental science. Dr. Humboldt claims to have worked out the essentials in his head. Nothing was put in writing until the paper itself was prepared. 
Dr. Sabat, of course, says precisely the same. Well, then, be more drastic and get it over with, for sure. Subject each one to a psychic probe and find out which of the two is lying. R. Daniil shook his head slowly. Friend Elijah, you do not understand these men. They are both of rank and scholarship, fellows of the Galactic Academy. As such, they cannot be subjected to trial of professional conduct except by a jury of their peers, their professional peers, unless they personally and voluntarily waive that right. Put it to them, then. The guilty man won't waive the right because he can't afford to face the psychic probe. The innocent man will waive it at once. You won't even have to use the probe. It does not work that way, friend Elijah. To waive the right in such a case, to be investigated by laymen, is a serious and perhaps irrecoverable blow to prestige. Both men steadfastly refuse to waive the right to special trial, as a matter of pride. The question of guilt or innocence is quite subsidiary. In that case, let it go for now. Put the matter in cold storage until you get to Aurora. At the Neurobiophysical Conference there will be a huge supply of professional peers, and then— That would mean a tremendous blow to science itself, friend Elijah. Both men would suffer for having been the instrument of scandal. Even the innocent one would be blamed for having been party to a situation so distasteful. It would be felt that it should have been settled quietly, out of court, at all costs. All right, I'm not a spacer, but I'll try to imagine that this attitude makes sense. What do the men in question say? Humboldt agrees thoroughly. He says that if Sabat will admit theft of the idea and allow Humboldt to proceed with transmission of the paper— or at least its delivery at the conference, he will not press charges. Sabat's misdeed will remain secret with him, and, of course, with the captain, who is the only other human to be party to the dispute. But young Sabat will not agree? On the contrary, he agreed with Dr. Humboldt to the last detail, with the reversal of names, still the mirror image. So they just sit there, stalemated? Each, I believe, friend Elijah, is waiting for the other to give in and admit guilt. Well, then, wait. The captain has decided this cannot be done. There are two alternatives to waiting, you see. The first is that both will remain stubborn so that when the starship lands on Aurora, the intellectual scandal will break. The captain, who is responsible for justice on board ship, will suffer disgrace for not having been able to settle the matter quietly and that, to him, is quite insupportable. And the second alternative? Is that one or the other of the mathematicians will indeed admit to wrongdoing. But will the one who confesses do so out of actual guilt, or out of a noble desire to prevent the scandal? Would it be right to deprive of credit one who is sufficiently ethical to prefer to lose that credit than to see science as a whole suffer? or else the guilty party will confess at the last moment, and in such a way as to make it appear he does so only for the sake of science, thus escaping the disgrace of his deed and casting its shadow upon the other. The captain will be the only man to know all this, but he does not wish to spend the rest of his life wondering whether he has been a party to a grotesque miscarriage of justice. Bailey sighed. A game of intellectual chicken! Who'll break first as Aurora comes nearer and nearer? Is that the whole story now, Daniil? Not quite. There are witnesses to the transaction. Jehoshaphat, why didn't you say so at once? What witnesses? Dr. Humboldt's personal servant. A robot, I suppose? Yes, certainly. He is called R. Preston. This servant, R. Preston, was present during the initial conference, and he bears out Dr. Humboldt in every detail. You mean he says that the idea was Dr. Humboldt's to begin with, that Dr. Humboldt detailed it to Dr. Sabat, that Dr. Sabat praised the idea, and so on? Yes, in full detail. I see. Does that settle the matter or not? Presumably not. You are quite right. It does not settle the matter, for there is a second witness. Dr. Sabat also has a personal servant, R. Ida, another robot of, as it happens, the same model as R. Preston, made, I believe, in the same year, in the same factory. Both have been in service for an equal period of time. An odd coincidence. Very odd. A fact, I am afraid, 
and it makes it difficult to arrive at any judgment based on obvious differences between the two servants. Our Ida then tells the same story as our Preston? Precisely the same story, except for the mirror image reversal of the names. Our Ida stated then that young Sabat, the one not yet fifty, Lige Bailey did not entirely keep the sardonic note out of his voice, he himself was not yet fifty, and he felt far from young, had the idea to begin with, that he detailed it to Dr. Humboldt, who was loud in his praises, and so on. Yes, friend Elijah. And one robot is lying, then. So it would seem. It should be easy to tell which. I imagine even a superficial examination by a good roboticist. A roboticist is not enough in this case, friend Elijah. Only a qualified robo-psychologist would carry weight enough and experience enough to make a decision in a case of this importance. There is no one so qualified on board ship. Such an examination can be performed only when we reach Aurora. And by then the crud hits the fan. Well, you're here on Earth. We can scare up a robo-psychologist, and surely anything that happens on Earth will never reach the ears of Aurora, and there will be no scandal. Except that neither Dr. Humboldt nor Dr. Sabat will allow his servant to be investigated by a robo-psychologist of Earth. The Earthman would have to—' He paused. Lige Bailey said stolidly, "'He'd have to touch the robot. These are old servants, well thought of. And not to be sullied by the touch of an Earthman. Then what do you want me to do, damn it?' He paused, grimacing. "'I'm sorry, Ardeniel.' but I see no reason for your having involved me. I was on the ship on a mission utterly irrelevant to the problem at hand. The captain turned to me because he had to turn to someone. I seemed human enough to talk to, and robot enough to be a safe recipient of confidences. He told me the whole story and asked what I would do. I realized the next jump could take us as easily to Earth as to our target— I told the captain that, although I was at as much a loss to resolve the mirror image as he was, there was on earth one who might help. "'Jehoshaphat!' muttered Bailey under his breath. "'Consider, friend Elijah, that if you succeed in solving this puzzle, it would do your career good, and earth itself might benefit. The matter could not be publicized, of course, but the captain is a man of some influence on his home world, and he would be grateful.' You just put a greater strain on me. I have every confidence, said R. Daniel, stolidly, that you already have some idea as to what procedure ought to be followed. Do you? I suppose that the obvious procedure is to interview the two mathematicians, one of whom would seem to be a thief. I'm afraid, friend Elijah, that neither one will come into the city, nor would either one be willing to have you come to them. And there is no way of forcing a spacer to allow contact with an Earthman, no matter what the emergency. Yes, I understand that, Daniel. But I was thinking of an interview by closed-circuit television. Nor that. They will not submit to interrogation by an Earthman. Then what do they want of me? Could I speak to the robots? They would not allow the robots to come here either. Jehoshaphat, Daniel, you've come! That was my own decision. I have permission, while on board ship, to make decisions of that sort without veto by any human being but the captain himself, and he was eager to establish the contact. I, having known you, decided that television contact was insufficient. I wished to shake your hand. Lige Bailey softened. I appreciate that, Daniel, but I still honestly wish you could have refrained from thinking of me at all in this case. Can I talk to the robots by television, at least? That, I think, can be arranged. Something, at least. That means I would be doing the work of a robo-psychologist in a crude sort of way. But you are a detective, friend Elijah, not a robo-psychologist. Well, let it pass. Now, before I see them, let's think a bit. Tell me, is it possible that both robots are telling the truth? Perhaps the conversation between the two mathematicians was equivocal. Perhaps it was of such a nature that each robot could honestly believe its own master was proprietor of the idea. Or perhaps one robot heard only one portion of the discussion, and the other another portion, so that each could suppose its own master was proprietor of the idea. That is quite impossible, friend Elijah. 
Both robots repeat the conversation in identical fashion, and the two repetitions are fundamentally inconsistent. Then it is absolutely certain that one of the robots is lying? Yes. Will I be able to see the transcript of all evidence given so far in the presence of the captain, if I should want to? I thought you would ask that, and I have copies with me. Another blessing. Have the robots been cross-examined at all, and is that cross-examination included in the transcript? The robots have merely repeated their tales. Cross-examination would be conducted only by robo-psychologists. Or by myself? You are a detective, friend Elijah, not a— All right, R. Daniil. I'll try to get the spacer psychology straight. A detective can do it because he isn't a robo-psychologist. Let's think further. Ordinarily a robot will not lie, but he will do so if necessary to maintain the three laws. He might lie to protect, in legitimate fashion, his own existence in accordance with the third law. He is more apt to lie if that is necessary to follow a legitimate order given him by a human being in accordance with the second law. He is most apt to lie if that is necessary to save a human life, or to prevent harm from coming to a human in accordance with the first law. Yes. And in this case, each robot would be defending the professional reputation of his master, and would lie if it were necessary to do so. Under the circumstances, the professional reputation would be nearly equivalent to life, and there might be a near first law urgency to the lie. Yet by the lie, each servant would be harming the professional reputation of the other's master, friend Elijah. So it would, but each robot might have a clearer conception of the value of its own master's reputation, and honestly judge it to be greater than that of the others. The lesser harm would be done by his lie, he would suppose, than by the truth. Having said that, Lige Bailey remained quiet for a moment. Then he said, All right, then. Can you arrange to have me talk to one of the robots? To R. Ida first, I think. Dr. Sabat's robot? Yes, said Bailey, dryly. The young fellow's robot. It will take me but a few minutes, said R. Daniel. I have a micro-receiver outfitted with a projector. I will need merely a blank wall, and I think this one will do if you will allow me to move some of these film cabinets. Go ahead. Will I have to talk into a microphone of some sort? No, you will be able to talk in an ordinary manner. Please pardon me, friend Elijah, for a moment of further delay. I will have to contact the ship and arrange for R. Ida to be interviewed. If that will take some time, Daniel, how about giving me the transcripted material of the evidence so far? Lige Bailey lit his pipe while R. Daniil set up the equipment, and leafed through the flimsy sheets he had been handed. The minutes passed, and R. Daniil said, "'If you are ready, friend Elijah, R. Ida is. Or would you prefer a few more minutes with the transcript?' "'No,' sighed Bailey. "'I'm not learning anything new. Put him on and arrange to have the interview recorded and transcribed.' R. Ida, unreal in two-dimensional projection against the wall, was basically metallic in structure, not at all the humanoid creature that R. Daniil was. His body was tall but blocky, and there was very little to distinguish him from the many robots Bailey had seen, except for minor structural details. Bailey said, "'Greetings, R. Ida.' "'Greetings, sir,' said R. Ida, in a muted voice that sounded surprisingly humanoid. "'You are the personal servant of Janao Sabat, are you not?' I am, sir. For how long, boy? For twenty-two years, sir. And your master's reputation is valuable to you? Yes, sir. Would you consider it of importance to protect that reputation? Yes, sir. As important to protect his reputation as his physical life? No, sir. As important to protect his reputation as the reputation of another? R. Ida hesitated. He said, Such cases must be decided on their individual merit, sir. There is no way of establishing a general rule. Bailey hesitated. The spacer robots spoke more smoothly and intellectually than Earth models did. He was not at all sure he could outthink one. He said, If you decided that the reputation of your master were more important than that of another, say that of Alfred Barr Humboldt, 
Would you lie to protect your master's reputation? I would, sir. Did you lie in your testimony concerning your master in his controversy with Dr. Humboldt? No, sir. But if you were lying, you would deny you were lying in order to protect that lie, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. Well, then, said Bailey, let's consider this. Your master, Janao Sabat, is a young man of great reputation in mathematics, but he is a young man. If, in this controversy with Dr. Humboldt, he had succumbed to temptation and had acted unethically, he would suffer a certain eclipse of reputation, but he is young and would have ample time to recover. He would have many intellectual triumphs ahead of him, and men would eventually look upon this plagiaristic attempt as the mistake of a hot-blooded youth, deficient in judgment. It would be something that would be made up for in the future. If, on the other hand, it were Dr. Humboldt who succumbed to temptation, the matter would be much more serious. He is an old man whose great deeds have spread over the centuries. His reputation has been unblemished hitherto. All of that, however, would be forgotten in the light of this one crime of his later years, and he would have no opportunity to make up for it in the comparatively short time remaining to him. There would be little more that he could accomplish. There would be so many more years of work ruined in Humboldt's case than in that of your master, and so much less opportunity to win back his position. You see, don't you, that Humboldt faces the worst situation and deserves the greater consideration. There was a long pause. Then R. Ida said with unmoved voice, My evidence was a lie. It was Dr. Humboldt whose work it was, and my master has attempted wrongfully to appropriate the credit. Bailey said, Very well, boy. You are instructed to say nothing to anyone about this until given permission by the captain of the ship. You are excused. The screen blanked out, and Bailey puffed at his pipe. Do you suppose the captain heard that, Daniel? I am sure of it. He is the only witness except for us. Good. Now for the other. But is there any point to that, friend Elijah, in view of what R. Ida has confessed? Of course there is. R. Ida's confession means nothing. Nothing? Nothing at all. I pointed out that Dr. Humboldt's position was the worse. Naturally, if he were lying to protect Sabat, he would switch to the truth, as, in fact, he claimed to have done. On the other hand, if he were telling the truth, he would switch to a lie to protect Humboldt. It's still mirror image, and we haven't gained anything. But then what will we gain by questioning R. Preston? Nothing, if the mirror image were perfect, but it is not. After all, one of the robots is telling the truth to begin with, and one is lying to begin with, and that is a point of asymmetry. Let me see, R. Preston, and if the transcription of R. Ida's examination is done, let me have it. The projector came into use again. R. Preston stared out of it, identical with R. Ida in every respect, except for some trivial chest design. Bailey said, Greetings, R. Preston. He kept the record of R. Ida's examination before him as he spoke. Greetings, sir, said R. Preston. His voice was identical with that of R. Ida. "'You are the personal servant of Alfred Bar Humboldt, are you not?' "'I am, sir.' "'For how long, boy?' "'For twenty-two years, sir.' "'And your master's reputation is valuable to you?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Would you consider it of importance to protect that reputation?' "'Yes, sir.' "'As important to protect his reputation as his physical life?' No, sir. As important to protect his reputation as the reputation of another. R. Preston hesitated. He said, Such cases must be decided on their individual merit, sir. There is no way of establishing a general rule. Bailey said, If you decided that the reputation of your master were more important than that of another, say that of Janao Sabat, would you lie to protect your master's reputation? I would, sir. Did you lie in your testimony concerning your master and his controversy with Dr. Sabat? No, sir. But if you were lying, you would deny you were lying, in order to protect that lie, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. Well, then, said Bailey, let's consider this. Your master, Alfred Bar Humboldt, is an old man of great reputation in mathematics, but he is an old man. 
if in this controversy with Dr. Sabat he had succumbed to temptation and had acted unethically, he would suffer a certain eclipse of reputation. But his great age and his centuries of accomplishments would stand against that and would win out. Men would look upon this plagiaristic attempt as the mistake of a perhaps sick old man, no longer certain in judgment. If, on the other hand, it were Dr. Sabat who had succumbed to temptation, the matter would be much more serious. He is a young man with a far less secure reputation. He would ordinarily have centuries ahead of him in which he might accumulate knowledge and achieve great things. This will be closed to him now, obscured by one mistake of his youth. He has a much longer future to lose than your master has. You see, don't you, that Sabat faces the worst situation and deserves the greater consideration? There was a long pause. Then R. Preston said, with unmoved voice, My evidence was as I— At that point he broke off and said nothing more. Bailey said, Please continue, R. Preston. There was no response. R. Daniel said, I am afraid, friend Elijah, that R. Preston is in stasis. He is out of commission. Well, then, said Bailey, we have finally produced an asymmetry. From this we can see who the guilty person is. In what way, friend Elijah? Think it out. Suppose you were a person who had committed no crime, and that your personal robot were a witness to that. There would be nothing you need do. Your robot would tell the truth and bear you out. If, however, you were a person who had committed the crime, you would have to depend on your robot to lie. That would be a somewhat riskier position, for although the robot would lie if necessary, the greater inclination would be to tell the truth, so that the lie would be less firm than the truth would be. To prevent that, the crime-committing person would very likely be strengthened by second law, perhaps very substantially strengthened. That would seem reasonable, said Ardeniel. Suppose we have one robot of each type. One robot would switch from truth, unreinforced, to the lie, and could do so after some hesitation without serious trouble. The other robot would switch from the lie strongly reinforced to the truth, but could do so only at the risk of burning out various positronic trackways in his brain and falling into stasis. And since R. Preston went into stasis, R. Preston's master, Dr. Humboldt, is the man guilty of plagiarism. If you transmit this to the captain and urge him to face Dr. Humboldt with the matter at once, he may force a confession. If so, I hope you will tell me immediately. I will certainly do so. You will excuse me, friend Elijah. I must talk to the captain privately. Certainly. Use the conference room. It is shielded. Bailey could do no work of any kind in R. Daniel's absence. He sat in uneasy silence. A great deal would depend on the value of his analysis, and he was acutely aware of his lack of expertise in robotics. R. Daniel was back in half an hour, very nearly the longest half hour of Bailey's life. There was no use, of course, in trying to determine what had happened from the expression of the humanoid's impassive face. Bailey tried to keep his face impassive. Yes, Ardeniel, he asked. Precisely as you said, friend Elijah, Dr. Humboldt has confessed. He was counting, he said, on Dr. Sabat giving way and allowing Dr. Humboldt to have this one last triumph. The crisis is over, and you will find the captain grateful. He has given me permission to tell you that he admires your subtlety greatly and I believe that I myself will achieve favor for having suggested you. Good, said Bailey, his knees weak and his forehead moist now that his decision had proven correct. But Jehoshaphat, Ardeniel, don't put me on the spot like that again, will you? I will try not to, friend Elijah. All will depend, of course, on the importance of a crisis, on your nearness, and on certain other factors. Meanwhile, I have a question. Yes? Was it not possible to suppose that passage from a lie to the truth was easy, while passage from the truth to a lie was difficult? And in that case, would not the robot in stasis have been going from a truth to a lie, and since R. Preston was in stasis, might one not have drawn the conclusion that it was Dr. Humboldt who was innocent, and Dr. Sabat who was guilty? Yes, Ardeniel, it was possible to argue that way, but it was the other argument that proved right. 
Humboldt did confess, didn't he? He did, but with arguments possible in both directions, how could you, friend Elijah, so quickly pick the correct one? For a moment Bailey's lips twitched. Then he relaxed, and they curved into a smile. Because, Ardeniel, I took into account human reactions, not robotic ones. I know more about human beings than about robots. In other words, I had an idea as to which mathematician was guilty before I ever interviewed the robots. Once I provoked an asymmetric response in them, I simply interpreted it in such a way as to place the guilt on the one I already believed to be guilty. The robotic response was dramatic enough to break down the guilty man. My own analysis of human behavior might not have been sufficient to do so. I am curious to know what your analysis of human behavior was. Jehoshaphat, Ardeniel, think, and you won't have to ask. There is another point of asymmetry in this tale of mirror image besides the matter of true and false. There is the matter of the age of the two mathematicians. One is quite old, and one is quite young. Yes, of course, but what then? Why this? I can see a young man, flushed with a sudden, startling, and revolutionary idea, consulting in the matter an old man whom he has, from his early student days, thought of as a demigod in the field. I cannot see an old man, rich in honors and used to triumphs, coming up with a sudden, startling, and revolutionary idea, consulting a man centuries his junior whom he is bound to think of as a young whippersnapper, or whatever term a spacer would use. Then, too, if a young man had the chance, would he try to steal the idea of a revered demigod? It would be unthinkable. On the other hand, an old man, conscious of declining powers, might well snatch at one last chance of fame, and consider a baby in the field to have no rights he was bound to observe. In short, it was not conceivable that Sabat steal Humboldt's idea, and from both angles Dr. Humboldt was guilty. Ardeniel considered that for a long time. Then he held out his hand. I must leave now, friend Elijah. It was good to see you. May we meet again soon. Bailey gripped the robot's hand warmly. If you don't mind, Ardeniel, he said, not too soon. Lenny United States Robots and Mechanical Men Corporation had a problem. The problem was people. Peter Bogert, senior mathematician, was on his way to assembly when he encountered Alfred Lanning, research director. Lanning was bending his ferocious white eyebrows together and staring down across the railing into the computer room. On the floor below the balcony, a trickle of humanity of both sexes and various ages was looking about curiously, while a guide intoned a set speech about robotic computing. This computer you see before you, he said, is the largest of its type in the world. It contains five million three hundred thousand cryotrons and is capable of dealing simultaneously with over one hundred thousand variables. With its help, U.S. Robots is able to design with precision the positronic brains of new models. The requirements are fed in on tape, which is perforated by the action of this keyboard. Something like a very complicated typewriter or linotype machine, except that it does not deal with letters but with concepts. Statements are broken down into the symbolic logic equivalents, and those in turn converted to perforation patterns. The computer can, in less than one hour, present our scientists with a design for a brain which will give all the necessary positronic paths to make a robot. Alfred Lanning looked up at last and noticed the other. "'Ah, uh, Peter,' he said. Bogert raised both hands to smooth down his already perfectly smooth and glossy head of black hair. He said, "'You don't look as though you think much of this, Alfred.' Lanning grunted. The idea of public guided tours of U.S. robots was of fairly recent origin and was supposed to serve a dual function. On the one hand, the theory went, it allowed people to see robots at close quarters and counter their almost instinctive fear of the mechanical objects through increased familiarity. And on the other hand, it was supposed to interest at least an occasional person in taking up robotics research as a life work. You know I don't, Lanning said finally. Once a week, work is disrupted. 
considering the man-hours lost, the return is insufficient. Still no rise in job applications, then? Oh, some, but only in the categories where the need isn't vital. It's research men that are needed. You know that. The trouble is that with robots forbidden on Earth itself, there's something unpopular about being a roboticist. The damned Frankenstein complex, said Bogart, consciously imitating one of the other's pet phrases. Lanning missed the gentle jab. He said, I ought to be used to it, but I never will. You'd think that by now every human being on Earth would know that the three laws represented a perfect safeguard, that robots are simply not dangerous. Take this bunch. He glowered down. Look at them. Most of them go through the robot assembly room for the thrill of fear, like riding a roller coaster. Then, when they enter the room with the mech model, damn it, Peter, a mech model that will do nothing on God's green earth but take two steps forward, say, please to meet you, sir, shake hands, then take two steps back. They back away, and mothers snatch up their kids. How do we expect to get brain work out of such idiots? Bogart had no answer. Together they stared down once again at the line of sightseers, now passing out of the computer room and into the positronic brain assembly section. Then they left. They did not, as it turned out, observe Mortimer W. Jacobson, age sixteen, who, to do him complete justice, meant no harm whatever. In fact, it could not even be said to be Mortimer's fault. The day of the week on which the tour took place was known to all workers. All devices in its path ought to have been carefully neutralized or locked, since it was unreasonable to expect human beings to withstand the temptation to handle knobs, keys, handles, and push-buttons. In addition, the guide ought to have been very carefully on the watch for those who succumbed. But at the time, the guide had passed into the next room, and Mortimer was tailing the line. He passed the keyboard on which instructions were fed into the computer. He had no way of suspecting that the plans for a new robot design were being fed into it at that moment, or being a good kid he would have avoided the keyboard. He had no way of knowing that, by what amounted to almost criminal negligence, a technician had not inactivated the keyboard. So Mortimer touched the keys at random as though he were playing a musical instrument. He did not notice that a section of perforated tape stretched itself out of the instrument in another part of the room, soundlessly, unobtrusively. Nor did the technician, when he returned, discover any signs of tampering. He felt a little uneasy at noticing that the keyboard was live, but did not think to check. After a few minutes, even his first trifling uneasiness was gone, and he continued feeding data into the computer. As for Mortimer, neither then nor ever afterward did he know what he had done. The new LNE model was designed for the mining of boron in the asteroid belt. The boron hydrides were increasing in value yearly as primers for the proton micropiles that carried the ultimate load of power production on spaceships, and Earth's own meager supply was running thin. Physically, that meant that the LNE robots would have to be equipped with eyes sensitive to those lines prominent in the spectroscopic analysis of boron ores and the type of limbs most useful for the working up of ore to finished product. As always, though, the mental equipment was the major problem. The first LNE positronic brain had been completed now. It was the prototype and would join all other prototypes in U.S. robots' collection. When finally tested, others would then be manufactured for leasing, never selling, to mining corporations. LNE prototype was complete now, tall, straight, polished. It looked from outside like any of a number of not-too-specialized robot models. The technician in charge, guided by the directions for testing in the Handbook of Robotics, said, How are you? The indicated answer was to have been, I am well and ready to begin my functions. I trust you are well, too, or some trivial modification thereof. This first exchange served no purpose but to show that the robot could hear, understand a routine question, and make a routine reply congruent with what one would expect of a robotic attitude. 
Beginning from there, one could pass on to more complicated matters that would test the different laws and their interaction with the specialized knowledge of each particular model. So the technician said, How are you? He was instantly jolted by the nature of LNE Prototype's voice. It had a quality like no robotic voice he had ever heard, and he had heard many. It formed syllables like the chimes of a low-pitched celeste. So surprising was this that it was only after several moments that the technician heard in retrospect the syllables that had been formed by those heavenly tones. They were da 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 goo. The robot still stood tall and straight, but its right hand crept upward and a finger went into its mouth. The technician stared in absolute horror and bolted. He locked the door behind him, and from another room put in an emergency call to Dr. Susan Calvin. Dr. Susan Calvin was U.S. robots and, virtually mankind's, only robopsychologist. She did not have to go very far in her testing of LNE prototype before she called very peremptorily for a transcript of the computer-drawn plans of the positronic brain paths and the taped instructions that had directed them. After some study, she in turn sent for Bogert. Her iron-gray hair was drawn severely back. Her cold face, with its strong vertical lines marked off by the horizontal gash of the pale, thin-lipped mouth, turned intensely upon him. What is this, Peter? Bogert studied the passages she pointed out with increasing stupefaction and said, Good Lord, Susan, it makes no sense. It most certainly doesn't. How did it get into the instructions? The technician in charge, called upon, swore in all sincerity that it was none of his doing, and that he could not account for it. The computer checked out negative for all attempts at flaw-finding. The positronic brain, said Susan Calvin thoughtfully, is past redemption. So many of the higher functions have been cancelled out by these meaningless directions that the result is very like a human baby. Bogert looked surprised, and Susan Calvin took on a frozen attitude at once, as she always did at the least expressed or implied doubt of her word. She said, we make every effort to make a robot as mentally like a man as possible. Eliminate what we call the adult functions, and what is naturally left is a human infant, mentally speaking. Why do you look so surprised, Peter? LNE prototype, who showed no signs of understanding any of the things that were going on around it, suddenly slipped into a sitting position and began a minute examination of its feet. Bogert stared at it. It's a shame to have to dismantle the creature. It's a handsome job. Dismantle it, said the robo-psychologist forcefully. Of course, Susan. What's the use of this thing? Good Lord, if there's one object completely and abysmally useless, it's a robot without a job it can perform. You don't pretend there's a job this thing can do, do you? No, of course not. Well, then, Susan Calvin said stubbornly, I want to conduct more tests. Bogert looked at her with a moment's impatience, then shrugged. If there was one person at U.S. Robots with whom it was useless to dispute, surely that was Susan Calvin. Robots were all she loved, and long association with them, it seemed to Bogert, had deprived her of any appearance of humanity. She was no more to be argued out of a decision than was a triggered micropile to be argued out of operating. What's the use? he breathed. Then aloud, hastily, will you let us know when your tests are complete? I will, she said. Come, Lenny. L-N-E, thought Bogert. That becomes Lenny. Inevitable. Susan Calvin held out her hand, but the robot only stared at it. Gently, the robopsychologist reached for the robot's hand and took it. Lenny rose smoothly to its feet. Its mechanical coordination, at least, worked well. Together they walked out, robot topping woman by two feet. Many eyes followed them curiously down the long corridors. One wall of Susan Calvin's laboratory, the one opening directly off her private office, 
was covered with a highly magnified reproduction of a positronic path chart. Susan Calvin had studied it with absorption for the better part of a month. She was considering it now, carefully, tracing the blunted paths through their contortions. Behind her, Lenny sat on the floor, moving its legs apart and together, crooning meaningless syllables to itself in a voice so beautiful that one could listen to the nonsense and be ravished. Susan Calvin turned to the robot. Lenny! Lenny! She repeated this patiently until finally Lenny looked up and made an inquiring sound. The robopsychologist allowed a glimmer of pleasure to cross her face fleetingly. The robot's attention was being gained in progressively shorter intervals. She said, Raise your hand, Lenny. Hand up. Hand up. She raised her own hand as she said it, over and over. Lenny followed the movement with its eyes, up, down, up, down. Then it made an abortive gesture with its own hand and chimed, Eh, uh. Very good, Lenny, said Susan Calvin gravely. Try it again. Hand up. A voice from her office called and interrupted. Susan. Calvin halted with a tightening of her lips. What is it, Alfred? The research director walked in and looked at the chart on the wall and at the robot. Still at it? I'm at my work, yes. Well, you know, Susan. He took out a cigar, staring at it hard, and made as though to bite off the end. In doing so, his eyes met the woman's stern look of disapproval, and he put the cigar away and began over. Well, you know, Susan, the LNE model is in production now. So I've heard. Is there something in connection with it you wish of me? No. Still, the mere fact that it is in production and is doing well means that working with this messed-up specimen is useless. Shouldn't it be scrapped? In short, Alfred, you are annoyed that I am wasting my so valuable time. Feel relieved. My time is not being wasted. I am working with this robot. But the work has no meaning. I'll be the judge of that, Alfred. Her voice was ominously quiet, and Lanning thought it wiser to shift his ground. Will you tell me what meaning it has? What are you doing with it right now, for instance? I'm trying to get it to raise its hand on the word of command. I'm trying to get it to imitate the sound of the word. As though on cue, Lenny said, Eh, ah, and raised its hand waveringly. Lanning shook his head. That voice is amazing. How does it happen? Susan Calvin said, I don't quite know. Its transmitter is a normal one. It could speak normally, I'm sure. It doesn't, however. It speaks like this as a consequence of something in the positronic paths that I have not yet pinpointed. Well, pinpoint it, for heaven's sake. Speech like that might be useful. Oh, then there is some possible use in my studies on Lenny. Lanning shrugged in embarrassment. Oh, well, it's a minor point. I'm sorry you don't see the major points, then, said Susan Calvin with asperity, which are much more important, but that's not my fault. Would you leave now, Alfred, and let me go on with my work? Lanning got to his cigar eventually in Bogert's office. He said sourly, That woman is growing more peculiar daily. Bogert understood perfectly. In the U.S. Robots and Mechanical Men Corporation, there was only one that woman. He said, Is she still scuffing about with that pseudo-robot, that Lenny of hers? Trying to get it to talk, so help me. Bogert shrugged. Points up the company problem. I mean, about getting qualified personnel for research. If we had other robo-psychologists, we could retire, Susan. Incidentally, I presume the director's meeting, scheduled for tomorrow, is for the purpose of dealing with the procurement problem? Lanning nodded and looked at his cigar as though it didn't taste good. Yes, quality, though, not quantity. We've raised wages until there's a steady stream of applicants, those who are interested primarily in money. The trick is to get those who are interested primarily in robotics, a few more like Susan Calvin. Hell no, not like her. 
Well, not like her personally. But you'll have to admit, Peter, that she's single-minded about robots. She has no other interest in life. I know. And that's exactly what makes her so unbearable. Lanning nodded. He had lost count of the many times it would have done his soul good to have fired Susan Calvin. He had also lost count of the number of millions of dollars she had at one time or another saved the company. She was a truly indispensable woman, and would remain one until she died, or until they could lick the problem of finding men and women of her own high caliber who were interested in robotics research. He said, I think we'll cut down on the tool business. Peter shrugged, if you say so. But meanwhile, seriously, what do we do about Susan? She can easily tie herself up with Lenny indefinitely. You know how she is when she gets what she considers an interesting problem. What can we do? said Lanning. If we become too anxious to pull her off, she'll stay on out of feminine contrariness. In the last analysis, we can't force her to do anything. The dark-haired mathematician smiled. I wouldn't ever apply the adjective feminine to any part of her. Oh, well, said Lanning grumpily. At least it won't do anyone any actual harm. In that, if nothing else, he was wrong. The emergency signal is always a tension-making thing in any large industrial establishment. Such signals had sounded in the history of U.S. robots a dozen times, for fire, flood, riot, and insurrection. But one thing had never occurred in all that time. Never had the particular signal indicating robot out of control sounded. No one ever expected it to sound. It was only installed at government insistence. Damn the Frankenstein complex, Lanning would mutter, on those rare occasions when he thought of it. Now, finally, the shrill siren rose and fell at ten-second intervals, and practically no worker from the president of the board of directors down to the newest janitor's assistant recognized the significance of the strange sound for a few moments. After those moments passed, there was a massive convergence of armed guards and medical men to the indicated area of danger, and U.S. robots was struck with paralysis. Charles Randow, computing technician, was taken off to hospital level with a broken arm. There was no other damage, no other physical damage. But the moral damage, roared Lanning, is beyond estimation. Susan Calvin faced him, murderously calm. You will do nothing to Lenny. Nothing. Do you understand? Do you understand, Susan? That thing has hurt a human being. It has broken first law. Don't you know what first law is? You will do nothing to Lenny. For God's sake, Susan, do I have to tell you first law? A robot may not harm a human being, or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Our entire position depends on the fact that first law is rigidly observed by all robots of all types. If the public should hear, and they will hear, that there was an exception, even one exception, we might be forced to close down altogether. Our only chance of survival would be to announce at once that the robot involved had been destroyed, explain the circumstances, and hope that the public can be convinced that it will never happen again. I would like to find out exactly what happened, said Susan Calvin. I was not present at the time, and I would like to know exactly what the Randall boy was doing in my laboratories without my permission. The important thing that happened, said Lanning, is obvious. Your robot struck Randow, and the damn fool flashed the robot out of control button and made a case of it. But your robot struck him and inflicted damage to the extent of a broken arm. The truth is, your Lenny is so distorted it lacks first law, and it must be destroyed. It does not lack first law. I have studied its brain paths, and know it does not lack it. Then how could it strike a man? Desperation turned him to sarcasm. Ask Lenny. Surely you have taught it to speak by now. Susan Calvin's cheeks flushed a painful pink. She said, I prefer to interview the victim. And in my absence, Alfred, I want my offices sealed tight with Lenny inside. I want no one to approach him. 
If any harm comes to him while I am gone, this company will not see me again under any circumstances. Will you agree to its destruction if it has broken first law? Yes, said Susan Calvin, because I know it hasn't. Charles Randow lay in bed with his arms set and in a cast. His major suffering was still from the shock of those few moments in which he thought a robot was advancing on him with murder in its positronic mind. No other human had ever had such reason to fear direct robotic harm as he had had just then. He had had a unique experience. Susan Calvin and Alfred Lanning stood beside his bed now. Peter Bogart, who had met them on the way, was with them. Doctors and nurses had been shooed out. Susan Calvin said, Now, what happened? Randow was daunted. He muttered, The thing hit me in the arm. It was coming at me. Calvin said, Move further back in the story. What were you doing in my laboratory without authorization? The young computer technician swallowed, and the Adam's apple in his thin neck bobbed noticeably. He was high-cheekboned and abnormally pale. He said, We all knew about your robot. The word is you were trying to teach it to talk like a musical instrument. There were bets going as to whether it talked or not. Some said, Uh, you could teach a gatepost to talk. I suppose, said Susan Calvin freezingly, that is meant as a compliment. What did that have to do with you? I was supposed to go in there and settle matters, see if it would talk, you know. We swiped a key to your place, and I waited till you were gone and went in. We had a lottery on who was to do it. I lost. Then? I tried to get it to talk, and it hit me. What do you mean you tried to get it to talk? How did you try? I, I asked it questions, but it wouldn't say anything and I had to give the thing a fair shake, so I kind of yelled at it, and—and— and? There was a long pause. Under Susan Calvin's unwavering stare, Randow finally said, I tried to scare it into saying something. He added defensively, I had to give the thing a fair shake. How did you try to scare it? I pretended to take a punch at it. And it brushed your arm aside? It hit my arm. Very well, that's all. To Lanning and Bogart, she said, Come, gentlemen. At the doorway, she turned back to Randall. I can settle the bets going around, if you are still interested. Lenny can speak a few words quite well. They said nothing until they were in Susan Calvin's office. Its walls were lined with her books, some of which she had written herself. It retained the patina of her own frigid, carefully ordered personality. It had only one chair in it, and she sat down. Lanning and Bogart remained standing. She said, Lenny only defended itself. That is the third law. A robot must protect its own existence. Except, said Lanning forcefully, when this conflicts with the first or second laws. Complete the statement. Lenny had no right to defend itself in any way at the cost of harm, however minor, to a human being. Nor did it, shot back Calvin, knowingly. Lenny has an aborted brain. It had no way of knowing its own strength or the weakness of humans. In brushing aside the threatening arm of a human being, it could not know the bone would break. In human terms, no moral blame can be attached to an individual who honestly cannot differentiate good and evil. Bogart interrupted soothingly. Now, Susan, we don't blame. We understand that Lenny is the equivalent of a baby, humanly speaking, and we don't blame it. But the public will. U.S. robots will be closed down. Quite the opposite. If you had the brains of a flea, Peter, you would see that this is the opportunity U.S. Robots is waiting for, that this will solve its problems. Lanning hunched his white eyebrows low. He said softly, What problem, Susan? Isn't the corporation concerned about maintaining our research personnel at the present, heaven help us, high level? We certainly are. Well, what are you offering, prospective researchers? Excitement? Novelty? 
the thrill of piercing the unknown? No. You offer them salaries and the assurance of no problems. Bogart said, How do you mean, no problems? Are there problems? shot back Susan Calvin. What kind of robots do we turn out? Fully developed robots, fit for their tasks. An industry tells us what it needs, a computer designs the brain, machinery forms the robot, and there it is, complete and done. Peter, some time ago you asked me with reference to Lenny what its use was. What's the use, you said, of a robot that was not designed for any job? Now I ask you, what's the use of a robot designed for only one job? It begins and ends in the same place. The LNE models mine boron. If beryllium is needed, they are useless. A human being so designed would be subhuman. A robot so designed is subrobotic. Do you want a versatile robot? asked Lanning incredulously. Why not? demanded the robopsychologist. Why not? I've been handed a robot with a brain almost completely stultified. I've been teaching it, and you, Alfred, asked me what was the use of that. Perhaps very little as far as Lenny itself is concerned, since it will never progress beyond the five-year-old level on a human scale. But what's the use in general? A very great deal if you consider it as a study in the abstract problem of learning how to teach robots. I have learned ways to short-circuit neighboring pathways in order to create new ones. More study will yield better, more subtle, and more efficient techniques of doing so. Well? Suppose you started with a positronic brain that had all the basic pathways carefully outlined, but none of the secondaries. Suppose you then started creating secondaries. You could sell basic robots designed for instruction, robots that could be modeled to a job and then modeled to another if necessary. Robots would become as versatile as human beings. Robots could learn. They stared at her. She said impatiently, you still don't understand, do you? I understand what you are saying, said Lanning. Don't you understand that with a completely new field of research and completely new techniques to be developed, with a completely new area of the unknown to be penetrated, youngsters will feel a new urge to enter robotics? Try it and see. May I point out, said Bogert smoothly, that this is dangerous. Beginning with ignorant robots such as Lenny will mean that one could never trust first law, exactly as turned out in Lenny's case. Exactly. Advertise the fact. Advertise it? Of course. Broadcast the danger. Explain that you will set up a new research institute on the moon if Earth's population chooses not to allow this sort of thing to go on upon Earth. But stress the danger to the possible applicants by all means. Lanning said, For God's sake, why? Because the spice of danger will add to the lure. Do you think nuclear technology involves no danger and spationautics no peril? Has your lure of absolute security been doing the trick for you? Has it helped you to cater to the Frankenstein complex you all despise so? Try something else, then, something that has worked in other fields. There was a sound from beyond the door that led to Calvin's personal laboratories. It was the chiming sound of Lenny. The robopsychologist broke off instantly, listening. She said, Excuse me, I think Lenny is calling me. Can it call you? said Lenny. I said I've managed to teach it a few words. She stepped toward the door, a little flustered. If you will wait for me. They watched her leave and were silent for a moment. Then Lanning said, do you think there's anything to what she says, Peter? Just possibly, Alfred, said Bogart, just possibly. Enough for us to bring the matter up at the director's meeting and see what they say. After all, the fat is in the fire. A robot has harmed a human being, and knowledge of it is public. As Susan says, we might as well try to turn the matter to our advantage. Of course, I distrust her motives in all this. How do you mean? Even if all she has said is perfectly true, it is only rationalization as far as she is concerned. Her motive in all this is her desire to hold on to this robot. If we pressed her, and the mathematician smiled at the incongruous literal meaning of the phrase, she would say it was to continue learning techniques of teaching robots, but I think she has found another use for Lenny, a rather unique one that would fit only Susan of all women. I don't get your drift. Bogart said, did you hear what the robot was calling? 
Well, no, I didn't quite, began Lanning, when the door opened suddenly and both men stopped talking at once. Susan Calvin stepped in again, looking about uncertainly. Have either of you seen? I'm positive I had it somewhere about— Oh, there it is. She ran to a corner of one bookcase and picked up an object of intricate metal webbery, dumbbell-shaped and hollow, with variously shaped metal pieces inside each hollow, just too large to be able to fall out of the webbing. As she picked it up, the metal pieces within moved and struck together, clicking pleasantly. It struck Lanning that the object was a kind of robotic version of a baby rattle. As Susan Calvin opened the door again to pass through, Lenny's voice chimed again from within. This time Lanning heard it clearly as it spoke the words Susan Calvin had taught it. In heavenly, celeste-like sounds, it called out, Mommy, I want you. I want you, Mommy. And the footsteps of Susan Calvin could be heard hurrying eagerly across the laboratory floor toward the only kind of baby she could ever have or love. Galley Slave The United States Robots and Mechanical Men Corporation, as defendants in the case, had influence enough to force a closed doors trial without a jury. Nor did Northeastern University try hard to prevent it. The trustees knew perfectly well how the public might react to any issue involving misbehavior of a robot, however rarefied that misbehavior might be. They also had a clearly visualized notion of how an anti-robot riot might become an anti-science riot without warning. The government, as represented in this case by Justice Harlow Shane, was equally anxious for a quiet end to this mess. Both U.S. robots and the academic world were bad people to antagonize. Justice Shane said, Since neither press, public, nor jury is present, gentlemen, let us stand on as little ceremony as we can and get to the facts. He smiled stiffly as he said this, perhaps without much hope that his request would be effective, and hitched at his robe so that he might sit more comfortably. His face was pleasantly rubicund, his chin round and soft, his nose broad, and his eyes light in color and wide-set. All in all, it was not a face with much judicial majesty, and the judge knew it. Barnabas H. Goodfellow, professor of physics at Northeastern U, was sworn in first, taking the usual vow with an expression that made mincemeat of his name. After the usual opening gambit questions, prosecution shoved his hands deep into his pockets and said, When was it, Professor, that the matter of the possible employ of Robot EZ-27 was first brought to your attention, and how? Professor Goodfellow's small and angular face set itself into an uneasy expression, scarcely more benevolent than the one it replaced. He said, I have had professional contact and some social acquaintance with Dr. Alfred Lanning, director of research at U.S. Robots. I was inclined to listen with some tolerance then when I received a rather strange suggestion from him on the 3rd of March of last year. Of 2033? That's right. Excuse me for interrupting. Please proceed. The professor nodded frostily, scowled to fix the facts in his mind, and began to speak. Professor Goodfellow looked at the robot with a certain uneasiness. It had been carried into the basement supply room in a crate, in accordance with the regulations governing the shipment of robots from place to place on the Earth's surface. He knew it was coming. It wasn't that he was unprepared. From the moment of Dr. Lanning's first phone call on March 3rd, he had felt himself giving way to the other's persuasiveness, and now, as an inevitable result, he found himself face to face with a robot. It looked uncommonly large as it stood within arm's reach. Alfred Lanning cast a hard glance of his own at the robot, as though making certain it had not been damaged in transit. Then he turned his ferocious eyebrows and his mane of white hair in the professor's direction. This is Robot EZ-27, first of its model to be available for public use. He turned to the robot. This is Professor Goodfellow, EZ. 
Easy spoke impassively, but with such suddenness that the professor shied. "'Good afternoon, professor.' Easy stood seven feet tall and had the general proportions of a man, always the prime selling point of U.S. robots. That and the possession of the basic patents on the positronic brain had given them an actual monopoly on robots and a near monopoly on computing machines in general. The two men who had uncrated the robot had left now, and the professor looked from Lanning to the robot and back to Lanning. It's harmless, I'm sure. He didn't sound sure. More harmless than I am, said Lanning. I could be goaded into striking you. Easy could not be. You know the three laws of robotics, I presume? Yes, of course, said Goodfellow. They are built into the positronic patterns of the brain and must be observed. The first law, the prime rule of robotic existence, safeguards the life and well-being of all humans. He paused, rubbed at his cheek, then added, "'It's something of which we would like to persuade all Earth if we could.' "'It's just that he seems formidable.' "'Granted. But whatever he seems, you'll find that he is useful.' "'I'm not sure in what way. Our conversations were not very helpful in that respect. Still, I agreed to look at the object, and I'm doing it.' "'We'll do more than look, Professor. Have you brought a book?' I have. May I see it? Professor Goodfellow reached down without actually taking his eyes off the metal in human shape that confronted him. From the briefcase at his feet he withdrew a book. Lanning held out his hand for it and looked at the back strip. Physical chemistry of electrolytes in solution. Fair enough, sir. You selected this yourself at random. It was no suggestion of mine, this particular text. Am I right? Yes. Lanning passed the book to Robot EZ-27. The professor jumped a little. No, that's a valuable book. Lanning raised his eyebrows, and they looked like shaggy coconut icing. He said, EZ has no intention of tearing the book in two as a feat of strength, I assure you. It can handle the book as carefully as you or I. Go ahead, EZ. Thank you, sir, said EZ. Then, turning its metal bulk slightly, it added, "'With your permission, Professor Goodfellow?' The professor stared, then said, "'Yes, yes, of course.' With a slow and steady manipulation of metal fingers, Easy turned the pages of the book, glancing at the left page, then the right, turning the page, glancing left, then right, turning the page, and so on, for minute after minute. The sense of its power seemed to dwarf even the large cement-walled room in which they stood, and to reduce the two human watchers to something considerably less than life-size. Goodfellow muttered, The light isn't very good. It will do. Then rather more sharply, But what is he doing? Patience, sir. The last page was turned eventually. Lanning asked, Well, easy. The robot said, It is a most accurate book, and there is little to which I can point. On line 22 of page 27, the word positive is spelled P-O-I-S-T-I-V-E. The comma in line 6 of page 32 is superfluous, whereas one should have been used on line 13 of page 54. The plus sign in equation 14-2 on page 337 should be a minus sign if it is to be consistent with the previous equations. Wait! Wait! cried the professor. What is he doing? Doing? echoed Lanning in sudden irascibility. Why, man, he has already done it. He has proofread that book. Proofread it? Yes. In the short time it took him to turn those pages, he caught every mistake in spelling, grammar, and punctuation. He has noted errors in word order and detected inconsistencies, and he will retain the information, letter-perfect, indefinitely. The professor's mouth was open. He walked rapidly away from Lanning and Easy, and as rapidly back. He folded his arms across his chest and stared at them. Finally he said, "'You mean this is a proofreading robot?' Lanning nodded, among other things. 
but why do you show it to me? So that you might help me persuade the university to obtain it for use. To read proof? Among other things, Lanning repeated patiently. The professor drew his pinched face together in a kind of sour disbelief. But this is ridiculous. Why? The university could never afford to buy this half-ton— It must weigh that at least— this half-ton proofreader. Proofreading is not all it will do. It will prepare reports from outlines, fill out forms, serve as an accurate memory file, grade papers. All picayune, Lanning said. Not at all, as I can show you in a moment. But I think we can discuss this more comfortably in your office, if you have no objection. No, of course not began the professor mechanically, and took a half-step as though to turn. Then he snapped out, But the robot! We can't take the robot! Really, doctor, you'll have to crate it up again. Time enough. We can leave easy here. Unattended? Why not? He knows he is to stay. Professor Goodfellow, it is necessary to understand that a robot is far more reliable than a human being. I would be responsible for any damage. There will be no damage, I guarantee that. Look, it's after hours. You expect no one here, I imagine, before tomorrow morning. The truck and my two men are outside. U.S. robots will take any responsibility that may arise. None will. Call it a demonstration of the reliability of the robot. The professor allowed himself to be led out of the storeroom, nor did he look entirely comfortable in his own office five stories up. He dabbed at the line of droplets along the upper half of his forehead with a white handkerchief. As you know very well, Dr. Lanning, there are laws against the use of robots on Earth's surface, he pointed out. The laws, Professor Goodfellow, are not simple ones. Robots may not be used on public thoroughfares or within private structures, except under certain restrictions that usually turn out to be prohibitive. The university, however, is a large and privately owned institution that usually receives preferential treatment. If the robot is used only in a specific room for only academic purposes, if certain other restrictions are observed, and if the men and women having occasion to enter the room cooperate fully, we may remain within the law. But all that trouble just to read proof? The uses would be infinite, Professor. Robotic labor has so far been used only to relieve physical drudgery. Isn't there such a thing as mental drudgery? When a professor capable of the most useful creative thought is forced to spend two weeks painfully checking the spelling of lines of print, and I offer you a machine that can do it in thirty minutes, is that picayune? But the price— The price need not bother you. You cannot buy EZ-27. U.S. Robots does not sell its products, but the university can lease EZ-27 for a thousand dollars a year, considerably less than the cost of a single microwave spectrograph continuous recording attachment. Goodfellow looked stunned. Lanning followed up his advantage by saying, I only ask that you put it up to whatever group makes the decisions here. I would be glad to speak to them if they want more information. Well, Goodfellow said doubtfully. I can bring it up at next week's Senate meeting. I can't promise that will do any good, though. Naturally, said Lanning. The defense attorney was short and stubby and carried himself rather portentously, a stance that had the effect of accentuating his double chin. He stared at Professor Goodfellow once that witness had been handed over and said, You agreed rather readily, did you not? the professor said briskly. I suppose I was anxious to be rid of Dr. Lanning. I would have agreed to anything. With the intention of forgetting about it after he left? Well, nevertheless you did present the matter to a meeting of the executive board of the university senate. Yes, I did. So that you agreed in good faith with Dr. Lanning's suggestions. You weren't just going along with a gag, you actually agreed enthusiastically, did you not? I merely followed ordinary procedures. As a matter of fact, you weren't as upset about the robot as you now claim you were. 
You know the three laws of robotics, and you knew them at the time of your interview with Dr. Lanning. Well, yes. And you were perfectly willing to leave a robot at large and unattended. Dr. Lanning assured me. Surely you would never have accepted his assurance if you had had the slightest doubt that the robot might be in the least dangerous. The professor began frigidly. I had every faith in the word. That is all, said Defense abruptly. As Professor Goodfellow, more than a bit ruffled, stood down, just as Shane leaned forward and said, Since I am not a robotics man myself, I would appreciate knowing precisely what the three laws of robotics are. Would Dr. Lanning quote them for the benefit of the court? Dr. Lanning looked startled. He had been virtually bumping heads with the gray-haired woman at his side. He rose to his feet now, and the woman looked up, too, expressionlessly. Dr. Lanning said, "'Very well, Your Honor,' he paused as though about to launch into an oration, and said with laborious clarity, First law, a robot may not injure a human being, or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Second law, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law.' Third law, a robot must protect its own existence, as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. I see, said the judge, taking rapid notes. These laws are built into every robot, are they? Into every one. That will be borne out by any roboticist. And into Robot EZ-27, specifically? Yes, Your Honor. You will probably be required to repeat those statements under oath. I am ready to do so, Your Honor. He sat down again. Dr. Susan Calvin, robo-psychologist-in-chief for U.S. Robots, who was the gray-haired woman sitting next to Lanning, looked at her titular superior without favor, but then she showed favor to no human being. She said, Was Goodfellow's testimony accurate, Alfred? Essentially, muttered Lanning. He wasn't as nervous as all that about the robot, and he was anxious enough to talk business with me when he heard the price. But there doesn't seem to be any drastic distortion. Dr. Calvin said thoughtfully, It might have been wise to put the price higher than a thousand. We were anxious to place easy. I know. Too anxious, perhaps. They'll try to make it look as though we had an ulterior motive. Lanning looked exasperated. We did. I admitted that at the University Senate meeting. They can make it look as if we had one beyond the one we admitted. Scott Robertson, son of the founder of U.S. Robots, and still owner of a majority of the stock, leaned over from Dr. Calvin's other side and said in a kind of explosive whisper, Why can't you get easy to talk so we'll know where we're at? You know he can't talk about it, Mr. Robertson. Make him. You're the psychologist, Dr. Calvin. Make him. If I'm the psychologist, Mr. Robertson, said Susan Calvin coldly, let me make the decisions. My robot will not be made to do anything at the price of his well-being. Robertson frowned and might have answered, but just as Shane was tapping his gavel in a polite sort of way, and they grudgingly fell silent. Francis J. Hart, head of the Department of English and Dean of Graduate Studies, was on the stand. He was a plump man, meticulously dressed in dark clothing of a conservative cut, and possessing several strands of hair traversing the pink top of his cranium. He sat well back in the witness chair with his hands folded neatly in his lap, and displaying from time to time a tight-lipped smile. He said, my first connection with the matter of the robot EZ-27 was on the occasion of the session of the University Senate Executive Committee, at which the subject was introduced by Professor Goodfellow. Thereafter, on the 10th of April of last year, we held a special meeting on the subject, during which I was in the chair. Were minutes kept of the meeting of the Executive Committee, of the special meeting, that is? Well, no. It was a rather unusual meeting. The dean smiled briefly. We thought it might remain confidential. What transpired at the meeting? Dean Hart was not entirely comfortable as chairman of that meeting, 
nor did the other members assembled seem completely calm. Only Dr. Lanning appeared at peace with himself. His tall, gaunt figure and the shock of white hair that crowned him reminded Hart of portraits he had seen of Andrew Jackson. Samples of the robot's work lay scattered along the central regions of the table, and the reproduction of a graph drawn by the robot was now in the hands of Professor Minot of physical chemistry. The chemist's lips were pursed in obvious approval. Hart cleared his throat and said, "'There seems no doubt that the robot can perform certain routine tasks with adequate competence. I have gone over these, for instance, just before coming in, and there is very little to find fault with.' He picked up a long sheet of printing, some three times as long as the average book page. It was a sheet of galley-proof, designed to be corrected by authors before the type was set up in page form. Along both of the wide margins of the galley were proof marks, neat and superbly legible. Occasionally a word of print was crossed out and a new word substituted in the margin in characters so fine and regular it might easily have been print itself. Some of the corrections were blue to indicate the original mistake had been the author's, a few in red where the printer had been wrong. Actually, said Lanning, there is less than very little to find fault with. I should say there is nothing at all to find fault with, Dr. Hart. I'm sure the corrections are perfect, in so far as the original manuscript was. If the manuscript against which this galley was corrected was at fault in a matter of fact rather than of English, the robot is not competent to correct it. We accept that. However, the robot corrected word order on occasion, and I don't think the rules of English are sufficiently hidebound for us to be sure that in each case the robot's choice was the correct one. Easy's positronic brain, said Lanning, showing large teeth as he smiled, has been molded by the contents of all the standard works on the subject. I'm sure you cannot point to a case where the robot's choice was definitely the incorrect one. Professor Minot looked up from the graph he still held. The question in my mind, Dr. Lanning, is why we need a robot at all, with all the difficulties in public relations that would entail. The science of automation has surely reached the point where your company could design a machine, an ordinary computer of a type known and accepted by the public, that would correct galleys. I am sure we could, said Lanning stiffly. But such a machine would require that the galleys be translated into special symbols, or at the least transcribed on tapes. Any corrections would emerge in symbols. You would need to keep men employed translating words to symbols, symbols to words. Furthermore, such a computer could do no other job. It couldn't prepare the graph you hold in your hand, for instance. Minot grunted. Lanning went on. The hallmark of the positronic robot is its flexibility. It can do a number of jobs. It is designed like a man so that it can use all the tools and machines that have, after all, been designed to be used by a man. It can talk to you, and you can talk to it. You can actually reason with it up to a point. Compared to even a simple robot, an ordinary computer with a non-positronic brain is only a heavy adding machine. Goodfellow looked up and said, if we all talk and reason with the robot, what are the chances of our confusing it? I suppose it doesn't have the capability of absorbing an infinite amount of data. No, it hasn't. But it should last five years with ordinary use. It will know when it will require clearing, and the company will do the job without charge. The company will? Yes. The company reserves the right to service the robot outside the ordinary course of its duties. It is one reason we retain control of our positronic robots and lease rather than sell them. In the pursuit of its ordinary functions, any robot can be directed by any man. Outside its ordinary functions, a robot requires expert handling, and that we can give it. For instance, any of you might clear an easy robot to an extent by telling it to forget this item or that but you would be almost certain to phrase the order in such a way as to cause it to forget too much or too little. We would detect such tampering, because we have built-in safeguards. However, since there is no need for clearing the robot in its ordinary work, or for doing other useless things, this raises no problem. 
Dean Hart touched his head as though to make sure his carefully cultivated strands lay evenly distributed, and said, You are anxious to have us take the machine, yet surely it is a losing proposition for U.S. robots. One thousand a year is a ridiculously low price. Is it that you hope through this to rent other such machines to other universities at a more reasonable price? Certainly that's a fair hope, said Lanning. But even so, the number of machines you could rent would be limited. I doubt if you could make it a paying proposition. Lanning put his elbows on the table and earnestly leaned forward. Let me put it bluntly, gentlemen. Robots cannot be used on Earth except in certain special cases because of prejudice against them on the part of the public. U.S. Robots is a highly successful corporation with our extraterrestrial and spaceflight markets alone, to say nothing of our computer subsidiaries. However, we are concerned with more than profits alone. It is our firm belief that the use of robots on Earth itself would mean a better life for all eventually, even if a certain amount of economic dislocation resulted at first. The labor unions are naturally against us, but surely we may expect cooperation from the large universities. The robot, easy, will help you by relieving you of scholastic drudgery, by assuming, if you permit it, the role of galley slave for you. Other universities and research institutions will follow your lead, and if it works out, then perhaps other robots of other types may be placed, and the public's objections to them broken down by stages. Minot murmured, Today, Northeastern University. Tomorrow, the world. Angrily, Lanning whispered to Susan Calvin, I wasn't nearly that eloquent, and they weren't nearly that reluctant. At a thousand a year, they were jumping to get easy. Professor Minot told me he'd never seen as beautiful a job as that graph he was holding, and there was no mistake on the galley or anywhere else. Hart admitted it freely. The severe vertical lines on Dr. Calvin's face did not soften. You should have demanded more money than they could pay, Alfred, and let them beat you down. Maybe, he grumbled. Prosecution was not quite done with Professor Hart. After Dr. Lanning left, did you vote on whether to accept Robot EZ-27? Yes, we did. With what result? In favor of acceptance by majority vote. What would you say influenced the vote? Defense objected immediately. Prosecution rephrased the question. What influenced you personally in your individual vote? You did vote in favor, I think. I voted in favor, yes. I did so largely because I was impressed by Dr. Lanning's feeling that it was our duty as members of the world's intellectual leadership to allow robotics to help man in the solution of his problems. In other words, Dr. Lanning talked you into it. That's his job. He did it very well. Your witness. Defense strode up to the witness chair and surveyed Professor Hart for a long moment. He said, In reality, you were all pretty eager to have Robot EZ-27 in your employ, weren't you? We thought that if it could do the work, it might be useful. If it could do the work? I understand you examined the samples of Robot EZ-27's original work with particular care on the day of the meeting which you have just described. Yes, I did. Since the machine's work dealt primarily with the handling of the English language, and since that is my field of competence, it seemed logical that I be the one chosen to examine the work. Very good. Was there anything on display on the table at the time of the meeting which was less than satisfactory? I have all the material here as exhibits. Can you point to a single unsatisfactory item? Well, it's a simple question. Was there one single solitary unsatisfactory item? You inspected it, was there? The English professor frowned. There wasn't. I also have some samples of work done by Robot EZ-27 during the course of his fourteen-month employ at Northeastern. Would you examine these and tell me if there is anything wrong with them in even one particular? Hart snapped. When he did make a mistake, it was a beauty. Answer my question, thundered Defense, and only the question I am putting to you. 
Is there anything wrong with the material? Dean Hart looked cautiously at each item. Well, nothing. Barring the matter concerning which we are here engaged, do you know of any mistake on the part of EZ-27? Barring the matter for which this trial is being held, no. Defense cleared his throat as though to signal end of paragraph. He said, Now, about the vote concerning whether robot EZ-27 was to be employed or not, you said there was a majority in favor. What was the actual vote? Thirteen to one, as I remember. Thirteen to one. More than just a majority, wouldn't you say? No, sir. All the pedant in Dean Hart was aroused. In the English language, the word majority means more than half. Thirteen out of fourteen is a majority, nothing more. But an almost unanimous one. A majority all the same. Defense switched ground. And who was the lone holdout? Dean Hart looked acutely uncomfortable. Professor Simon Ninheimer. Defense pretended astonishment. Professor Ninheimer? The head of the Department of Sociology? Yes, sir. The plaintiff? Yes, sir. Defense pursed his lips. In other words, it turns out that the man bringing the action for payment of $750,000 damages against my client, United States Robots and Mechanical Men Corporation, was the one who from the beginning opposed the use of the robot, although everyone else on the executive committee of the University Senate was persuaded that it was a good idea. He voted against the motion, as was his right. You didn't mention in your description of the meeting any remarks made by Professor Ninheimer. Did he make any? I think he spoke. You think? Well, he did speak. Against using the robot? Yes. Was he violent about it? Dean Hart paused. He was vehement. Defense grew confidential. How long have you known Professor Ninheimer, Dean Hart? About twelve years. Reasonably well? I should say so, yes. Knowing him, then, would you say he was the kind of man who might continue to bear resentment against a robot, all the more so because an adverse vote had— Prosecution drowned out the remainder of the question with an indignant and vehement objection of his own. Defense motioned the witness down, and Justice Shane called lunch and recess. Robertson mangled his sandwich. The corporation would not founder for loss of three-quarters of a million, but the loss would do it no particular good. He was conscious, moreover, that there would be a much more costly long-term setback in public relations. He said sourly, Why all this business about how easy got into the university? What do they hope to gain? The attorney for defense said quietly, A court action is like a chess game, Mr. Robertson. The winner is usually the one who can see more moves ahead, and my friend at the prosecutor's table is no beginner. They can show damage, that's no problem. Their main effort lies in anticipating our defense. They must be counting on us to try to show that Easy couldn't possibly have committed the offense, because of the laws of robotics. All right, said Robertson. That is our defense, an absolutely airtight one. To a robotics engineer not necessarily to a judge. They're setting themselves up a position from which they can demonstrate that EZ-27 was no ordinary robot. It was the first of its type to be offered to the public. It was an experimental model that needed field testing, and the university was the only decent way to provide such testing. That would look plausible in the light of Dr. Lanning's strong efforts to place the robot and the willingness of U.S. robots to lease it for so little. The prosecution would then argue that the field test proved easy to have been a failure. Now do you see the purpose of what's been going on? But EZ-27 was a perfectly good model, argued Robertson. It was the 27th in production. Which is really a bad point, said Defense somberly. What was wrong with the first 26? Obviously something. Why shouldn't there be something wrong with the 27th, too? 
There was nothing wrong with the first twenty-six, except that they weren't complex enough for the task. These were the first positronic brains of the sort to be constructed, and it was rather hit and miss to begin with. But the three laws held in all of them. No robot is so imperfect that the three laws don't hold. Dr. Lanning has explained this to me, Mr. Robertson, and I am willing to take his word for it. The judge, however, may not be. We are expecting a decision from an honest and intelligent man who knows no robotics, and thus may be led astray. For instance, if you or Dr. Lanning or Dr. Calvin were to say on the stand that any positronic brains were constructed hit and miss, as you just did, prosecution would tear you apart in cross-examination. Nothing would salvage our case so that's something to avoid. Robertson growled. If only Easy would talk. Defense shrugged. A robot is incompetent as a witness, so that would do us no good. At least we'd know some of the facts. We'd know how it came to do such a thing. Susan Calvin fired up. A dullish red touched her cheeks, and her voice had a trace of warmth in it. We know how easy came to do it. It was ordered to. I've explained this to counsel, and I'll explain it to you now. Ordered to by whom? asked Robertson in honest astonishment. No one ever told him anything, he thought resentfully. These research people considered themselves the owners of U.S. robots, by God. By the plaintiff, said Dr. Calvin. In heaven's name, why? I don't know why yet. Perhaps just that we might be sued, that he might gain some cash. There were blue glints in her eyes as she said that. Then why doesn't Easy say so? Isn't that obvious? It's been ordered to keep quiet about the matter. Why should that be obvious? demanded Robertson truculently. Well, it's obvious to me. Robot psychology is my profession. If Easy will not answer questions about the matter directly, he will answer questions on the fringe of the matter. By measuring increased hesitation in his answers as the central question is approached, by measuring the area of blankness and the intensity of counterpotentials set up, it is possible to tell with scientific precision that his troubles are the result of an order not to talk, with its strength based on first law. In other words, he's been told that if he talks, harm will be done a human being. Presumably harm to the unspeakable Professor Ninheimer, the plaintiff, who, to the robot, would seem a human being. Well then, said Robertson, can't you explain that if he keeps quiet, harm will be done to U.S. robots? U.S. robots is not a human being, and the first law of robotics does not recognize a corporation as a person the way ordinary laws do. Besides, it would be dangerous to try to lift this particular sort of inhibition. The person who laid it on could lift it off least dangerously, because the robot's motivations in that respect are centered on that person. Any other course— She shook her head and grew almost impassioned. I won't let the robot be damaged. Lanning interrupted with the air of bringing sanity to the problem. It seems to me that we have only to prove a robot incapable of the act which Easy is accused. We can do that. Exactly, said Defense, in annoyance. You can do that. The only witnesses capable of testifying to Easy's condition and to the nature of Easy's state of mind are employees of U.S. robots. The judge can't possibly accept their testimony as unprejudiced. How can he deny expert testimony? by refusing to be convinced by it. That's his right as the judge. Against the alternative that a man like Professor Ninheimer deliberately set about ruining his own reputation, even for a sizable sum of money, the judge isn't going to accept the technicalities of your engineers. The judge is a man, after all. If he has to choose between a man doing an impossible thing and a robot doing an impossible thing, he's quite likely to decide in favor of the man. A man can do an impossible thing, said Lanning, because we don't know all the complexities of the human mind, and we don't know what in a given human mind is impossible and what is not. We do know what is really impossible to a robot. Well, we'll see if we can't convince the judge of that, Defense replied wearily. If all you say is so, rumbled Robertson, I don't see how you can. We'll see. 
It's good to know and be aware of the difficulties involved, but let's not be too downhearted. I've tried to look ahead a few moves in the chess game, too. With a stately nod in the direction of the robo-psychologist, he added, with the help of the good lady here. Lanning looked from one to the other and said, What the devil is this? But the bailiff thrust his head into the room and announced somewhat breathlessly that the trial was about to resume. They took their seats, examining the man who had started all the trouble. Simon Ninheimer owned a fluffy head of sandy hair, a face that narrowed past a beaked nose toward a pointed chin, and a habit of sometimes hesitating before key words in his conversation that gave him an air of a seeker after an almost unbearable precision. When he said, "'The sun rises in the, uh, east,' one was certain he had given due consideration to the possibility that it might at some time rise in the west. Prosecution said, "'Did you oppose employment of Robot EZ-27 by the university?' "'I did, sir.' Why was that? I did not feel that we understood the, uh, motives of U.S. robots thoroughly. I mistrusted their anxiety to place the robot with us. Did you feel that it was capable of doing the work that it was allegedly designed to do? I know for a fact that it was not. Would you state your reasons? Simon Ninheimer's book, entitled Social Tensions Involved in Spaceflight and Their Resolution, had been eight years in the making. Ninheimer's search for precision was not confined to his habits of speech, and in a subject like sociology, almost inherently imprecise, it left him breathless. Even with the material in galley proofs, he felt no sense of completion. Rather the reverse, in fact, staring at the long strips of print, he felt only the itch to tear the lines of type apart and rearrange them differently. Jim Baker, instructor and soon-to-be assistant professor of sociology, found Ninheimer, three days after the first batch of galleys had arrived from the printer, staring at the handful of paper in abstraction. The galleys came in three copies, one for Ninheimer to proofread, one for Baker to proofread independently, and a third marked original, which was to receive the final corrections, a combination of those made by Ninheimer and by Baker, after a conference at which possible conflicts and disagreements were ironed out. This had been their policy on the several papers on which they had collaborated in the past three years, and it worked well. Baker, young and ingratiatingly soft-voiced, had his own copies of the galleys in his hand. He said eagerly, I've done the first chapter, and it contains some typographical buttes. The first chapter always has them, said Ninheimer distantly. Do you want to go over it now? Ninheimer brought his eyes to grave focus on Baker. I haven't done anything on the galleys, Jim. I don't think I'll bother. Baker looked confused. Not bother? Ninheimer pursed his lips. I've asked about the, uh, workload of the machine. After all, he was originally, uh, promoted as a proofreader. They've set a schedule. The machine? You mean easy? I believe that is the foolish name they gave it. But, Dr. Ninheimer, I thought you were staying clear of it. I seem to be the only one doing so. Perhaps I ought to take my share of the, uh, advantage. Oh. "'Well, I seem to have wasted time on this first chapter, then,' said the younger man ruefully. "'Not wasted. We can compare the machine's result with yours as a check. "'If you want to, but—' "'Yes. "'I doubt that we'll find anything wrong with Easy's work. "'It's supposed never to have made a mistake.' "'I dare say,' said Ninheimer dryly. The first chapter was brought in again by Baker four days later. This time it was Ninheimer's copy, fresh from the special annex that had been built to house Easy and the equipment it used. Baker was jubilant. Dr. Ninheimer, it not only caught everything I caught, it found a dozen errors I missed. The whole thing took it twelve minutes. Ninheimer looked over the sheaf with the neatly printed marks and symbols in the margins. He said, 
It is not as complete as you and I would have made it. We would have entered an insert on Suzuki's work on the neurological effects of low gravity. You mean his paper in sociological reviews? Of course. Well, you can't expect impossibilities of easy. It can't read the literature for us. I realize that. As a matter of fact, I have prepared the insert. I will see the machine and make certain it knows how to, uh, handle inserts. It will know. I prefer to make certain. Ninheimer had to make an appointment to see Easy, and then could get nothing better than fifteen minutes in the late evening. But the fifteen minutes turned out to be ample. Robot Easy 27 understood the matter of inserts at once. Ninheimer found himself uncomfortable at close quarters with the robot for the first time. Almost automatically, as though it were human, he found himself asking, "'Are you happy with your work?' "'Most happy, Professor Ninheimer,' said Easy solemnly, the photocells that were its eyes gleaming their normal deep red. "'You know me?' From the fact that you present me with additional material to include in the galleys, it follows that you are the author. The author's name, of course, is at the head of each sheet of galley proof. I see. You make, um, deductions, then. Tell me, he couldn't resist the question, what do you think of the book so far? Easy said, I find it very pleasant to work with. Pleasant? That is an odd word for a... Uh, a mechanism without emotion. I've been told you have no emotion. The words of your book go in accordance with my circuits, Easy explained. They set up little or no counter-potentials. It is in my brain paths to translate this mechanical fact into a word such as pleasant. The emotional context is fortuitous. I see. Why do you find the book pleasant? It deals with human beings, Professor, and not with inorganic materials or mathematical symbols. Your book attempts to understand human beings and to help increase human happiness. And this is what you try to do, and so my book goes in accordance with your circuits? Is that it? That is it, Professor. The fifteen minutes were up. Ninheimer left and went to the university library, which was on the point of closing. He kept them open long enough to find an elementary text on robotics. He took it home with him. Except for occasional insertion of late material, the galleys went to Easy and from him to the publishers with little intervention from Ninheimer at first, and none at all later. Baker said a little uneasily, It almost gives me a feeling of uselessness. It should give you a feeling of having time to begin a new project, said Ninheimer, without looking up from the notations he was making in the current issue of Social Science Abstracts. I'm just not used to it. I keep worrying about the galleys. It's silly, I know. It is. The other day I got a couple of sheets before Easy sent them off to— What? Ninheimer looked up, scowling. The copy of Abstracts slid shut. Did you disturb the machine at its work? Only for a minute. Everything was all right. Oh, it changed one word. You referred to something as criminal. It changed the word to reckless. It thought the second adjective fit in better with the context. Ninheimer grew thoughtful. What did you think? You know, I agreed with it. I let it stand. Ninheimer turned in his swivel chair to face his young associate. See here, I wish you wouldn't do this again. If I am to use the machine, I wish the, uh, full advantage of it. If I am to use it and lose your, uh, services anyway because you supervise it, when the whole point is that it requires no supervision, I gain nothing. Do you see? Yes, Dr. Ninheimer, said Baker, subdued. The advance copies of Social Tensions arrived in Dr. Ninheimer's office on the 8th of May. He looked through it briefly, flipping pages and pausing to read a paragraph here and there. Then he put his copies away. As he explained later, he forgot about it. For eight years he had worked at it, but now, and for months in the past, other interests had engaged him while Easy had taken the load of the book off his shoulders. 
He did not even think to donate the usual complimentary copy to the university library. Even Baker, who had thrown himself into work and had steered clear of the department head since receiving his rebuke at their last meeting, received no copy. On the 16th of June that stage ended. Ninheimer received a phone call and stared at the image in the plate with surprise. Spidell, are you in town? No, sir, I'm in Cleveland. Spidell's voice trembled with emotion. Then why the call? Because I've just been looking through your new book. Ninheimer, are you mad? Have you gone insane? Ninheimer stiffened. Is something, uh, wrong? he asked in alarm. Wrong? I refer you to page 562. What in blazes do you mean by interpreting my work as you do? Where in the paper cited do I make the claim that the criminal personality is non-existent, and that it is the law enforcement agencies that are the true criminals? Here, let me quote. Wait, wait, cried Ninheimer, trying to find the page. Let me see, let me see. Good God! Well? Spidell, I don't see how this could have happened. I never wrote this. But that's what's printed, and that distortion isn't the worst. You look at page 690 and imagine what Ipatiev is going to do to you when he sees the hash you've made of his findings. Look, Ninheimer, the book is riddled with this sort of thing. I don't know what you are thinking of, but there's nothing to do but get the book off the market. And you'd better be prepared for extensive apologies at the next association meeting. Spidell, listen to me. But Spidell had flashed off with a force that had the plate glowing with after-images for fifteen seconds. It was then that Ninheimer went through the book and began marking off passages with red ink. He kept his temper remarkably well when he faced Easy again, but his lips were pale. He passed the book to Easy and said, Will you read the marked passages on pages 562, 631, 664, and 690? Easy did so in four glances. Yes, Professor Ninheimer. This is not as I had it in the original galleys. No, sir, it is not. Did you change it to read as it now does? Yes, sir. Why? Sir, the passages as they read in your version were most uncomplimentary to certain groups of human beings. I felt it advisable to change the wording to avoid doing them harm. How dared you do such a thing? The first law professor does not let me, through any inaction, allow harm to come to human beings. Certainly, considering your reputation in the world of sociology and the wide circulation your book would receive among scholars, considerable harm would come to a number of the human beings you speak of. But you realize the harm that will come to me now? It was necessary to choose the alternative with less harm. Professor Ninheimer, shaking with fury, staggered away. It was clear to him that U.S. robots would have to account to him for this. There was some excitement at the defendant's table, which increased as prosecution drove the point home. Then Robot EZ-27 informed you that the reason for its action was based on the first law of robotics? That is correct, sir. That, in effect, it had no choice? Yes, sir. It follows, then, that U.S. robots designed a robot that would of necessity rewrite books to accord with its own conceptions of what was right. And yet they palmed it off as simple proofreader. Would you say that? Defense objected firmly at once, pointing out that the witness was being asked for a decision on a matter in which he had no competence. The judge admonished prosecution in the usual terms, but there was no doubt that the exchange had sunk home, not least upon the attorney for the defense. Defense asked for a short recess before beginning cross-examination, using a legal technicality for the purpose that got him five minutes. He leaned over toward Susan Calvin. Is it possible, Dr. Calvin, that Professor Ninheimer is telling the truth, and that Easy was motivated by the first law? Calvin pressed her lips together, then said, No, it isn't possible. 
The last part of Ninheimer's testimony is deliberate perjury. Easy is not designed to be able to judge matters at the stage of abstraction represented by an advanced textbook on sociology. It would never be able to tell that certain groups of humans would be harmed by a phrase in such a book. Its mind is simply not built for that. I suppose, though, that we can't prove this to a layman, said Defense pessimistically. No, admitted Calvin. The proof would be highly complex. Our way out is still what it was. We must prove Ninheimer is lying, and nothing he has said need change our plan of attack. Very well, Dr. Calvin, said Defense. I must accept your word in this. We'll go on as planned. In the courtroom, the judge's gavel rose and fell, and Dr. Ninheimer took the stand once more. He smiled a little, as one who feels his position to be impregnable, and rather enjoys the prospect of countering a useless attack. Defense approached warily and began softly. Dr. Ninheimer, do you mean to say that you were completely unaware of these alleged changes in your manuscript until such time as Dr. Spidell called you on the 16th of June? That is correct, sir. Did you never look at the galleys after Robot EZ-27 had proofread them? At first I did, but it seemed to me a useless task. I relied on the claims of U.S. robots. The absurd, uh, changes were made only in the last quarter of the book, after the robot, I presume, had learned enough about sociology. Never mind your presumptions, said Defense. I understood your colleague Dr. Baker saw the later galleys on at least one occasion. Do you remember testifying to that effect? Yes, sir. As I said, he told me about seeing one page, and even there the robot had changed a word. Again Defense broke in. Don't you find it strange, sir, that after over a year of implacable hostility to the robot, after having voted against it in the first place and having refused to put it to any use whatever, you suddenly decided to put your book, your magnum opus, into its hands? I don't find that strange. I simply decided that I might as well use the machine. And you were so confident of Robot EZ-27, all of a sudden, that you didn't even bother to check your galleys? I told you I was, uh, persuaded by U.S. robots' propaganda. So persuaded that when your colleague, Dr. Baker, attempted to check on the robot, you berated him soundly? I didn't berate him. I merely did not wish to have him, uh, waste his time. At least I thought then it was a waste of time. I did not see the significance of that change in a word at the— Defense said with heavy sarcasm— I have no doubt you were instructed to bring up that point in order that the word change be entered in the record. He altered his line to forestall objection and said, The point is that you were extremely angry with Dr. Baker. No, sir, not angry. You didn't give him a copy of your book when you received it? Simple forgetfulness. I didn't give the library its copy either. Ninheimer smiled cautiously. Professors are notoriously absent-minded. Defense said, Do you find it strange that after more than a year of perfect work, Robot EZ-27 should go wrong on your book? On a book, that is, which was written by you, who was, of all people, the most implacably hostile to the robot. My book was the only sizable work dealing with mankind that it had to face. The three laws of robotics took hold then. Several times, Dr. Ninheimer, said Defense, you have tried to sound like an expert on robotics. Apparently you suddenly grew interested in robotics and took out books on the subject from the library. You testified to that effect, did you not? One book, sir. That was the result of what seems to me to have been, um, natural curiosity. And it enabled you to explain why the robot should, as you allege, have distorted your book? Yes, sir. Very convenient. But are you sure your interest in robotics was not intended to enable you to manipulate the robot for your own purposes? Ninheimer flushed. Certainly not, sir. Defense's voice rose. In fact, are you sure the alleged altered passages were not as you had them in the first place? The sociologist half rose. That's, uh, uh, ridiculous. I have the galleys. He had difficulty speaking, and prosecution rose to insert smoothly, 
With your permission, Your Honor, I intend to introduce as evidence the set of galleys given by Dr. Ninheimer to Robot EZ-27, and the set of galleys mailed by Robot EZ-27 to the publishers. I will do so now, if my esteemed colleague so desires, and will be willing to allow a recess in order that the two sets of galleys may be compared. Defense waved his hand impatiently. That is not necessary. My honored opponent can introduce those galleys whenever he chooses. I'm sure they will show whatever discrepancies are claimed by the plaintiff to exist. What I would like to know of the witness, however, is whether he also has in his possession Dr. Baker's galleys. Dr. Baker's galleys? Ninheimer frowned. He was not yet quite master of himself. Yes, Professor, I mean Dr. Baker's galleys. You testified to the effect that Dr. Baker had received a separate copy of the galleys. I will have the clerk read your testimony if you are suddenly a selective type of amnesiac. Or is it just that professors are, as you say, notoriously absent-minded? Ninheimer said, I remember Dr. Baker's galleys. They weren't necessary once the job was placed in the care of the proofreading machine. So you burned them? No, I put them in the wastebasket. Burn them, dump them, what's the difference? The point is you got rid of them. There's nothing wrong, began Ninheimer weakly. Nothing wrong? thundered Defense. Nothing wrong except that there is now no way we can check to see if on certain crucial galley sheets you might not have substituted a harmless blank one from Dr. Baker's copy for a sheet in your own copy which you had deliberately mangled in such a way as to force the robot to— Prosecution shouted a furious objection. Just as Shane leaned forward, his round face doing its best to assume an expression of anger equivalent to the intensity of the emotion felt by the man, the judge said, "'Do you have any evidence, Counselor, for the extraordinary statement you have just made?' Defense said quietly, "'No direct evidence, Your Honor. But I would like to point out that, viewed properly, the sudden conversion of the plaintiff from anti-roboticism, his sudden interest in robotics, his refusal to check the galleys or to allow anyone else to check them, his careful effort to keep anyone from seeing the book immediately after publication, all very clearly point— Counselor, interrupted the judge impatiently, this is not the place for esoteric deductions. The plaintiff is not on trial, neither are you prosecuting him. I forbid this line of attack, and I can only point out that the desperation that must have induced you to do this cannot help but weaken your case. If you have legitimate questions to ask, Counselor, you may continue with your cross-examination, but I warn you against another such exhibition in this courtroom. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Robertson whispered heatedly as counsel for the defense returned to his table. What good did that do, for God's sake? The judge is dead set against you now. Defense replied calmly. But Ninheimer is good and rattled, and we've set him up for tomorrow's move. He'll be ripe. Susan Calvin nodded gravely. The rest of prosecution's case was mild in comparison. Dr. Baker was called and bore out most of Ninheimer's testimony. Doctors Spidell and Ipatiev were called, and they expounded most movingly on their shock and dismay at certain quoted passages in Dr. Ninheimer's book. Both gave their professional opinion that Dr. Ninheimer's professional reputation had been seriously impaired. The galleys were introduced in evidence, as were copies of the finished book. Defense cross-examined no more that day. Prosecution rested, and the trial was recessed till the next morning. Defense made his first motion at the beginning of the proceedings on the second day. He requested that Robot EZ-27 be admitted as a spectator to the proceedings. Prosecution objected at once, and Justice Shane called both to the bench. Prosecution said hotly, This is obviously illegal. A robot may not be in any edifice used by the general public. This courtroom, pointed out defense, is closed to all but those having an immediate connection with the case. A large machine of known erratic behavior would disturb my clients and my witnesses by its very presence. It would make hash out of the proceedings. The judge seemed inclined to agree. 
He turned to Defense and said rather unsympathetically, What are the reasons for your request? Defense said, It will be our contention that Robot EZ-27 could not possibly, by the nature of its construction, have behaved as it has been described as behaving. It will be necessary to prevent a few demonstrations. Prosecution said, I don't see the point, Your Honor. Demonstrations conducted by men employed at U.S. robots are worth little as evidence when U.S. robots is the defendant. Your Honor, said defense, the validity of any evidence is for you to decide, not for the prosecuting attorney. At least that is my understanding. Justice Shane, his prerogatives encroached upon, said, Your understanding is correct. Nevertheless, the presence of a robot here does raise important legal questions. Surely, Your Honor, nothing that should be allowed to override the requirements of justice. If the robot is not present, we are prevented from presenting our only defense. The judge considered. There would be the question of transporting the robot here. That is a problem with which U.S. robots has frequently been faced. We have a truck parked outside the courtroom, constructed according to the laws governing the transportation of robots. Robot EZ-27 is in a packing case inside with two men guarding it. The doors to the truck are properly secured, and all other necessary precautions have been taken. You seem certain, said Justice Shane, in renewed ill temper, that judgment on this point will be in your favor. Not at all, Your Honor. If it is not, we simply turn the truck about. I have made no presumptions concerning your decision. The judge nodded. The request on the part of the defense is granted. The crate was carried in on a large dolly, and the two men who handled it opened it. The courtroom was immersed in a dead silence. Susan Calvin waited as the thick slabs of celluform went down, then held out one hand. Come, easy. The robot looked in her direction and held out its large metal arm. It towered over her by two feet, but followed meekly, like a child in the clasp of its mother. Someone giggled nervously and choked it off at a hard glare from Dr. Calvin. Easy seated itself carefully in a large chair brought by the bailiff, which creaked but held. Defense said, When it becomes necessary, Your Honor, we will prove that this is actually Robot EZ-27, the specific robot in the employ of Northeastern University during the period of time with which we are concerned. Good, his honor said. That will be necessary. I, for one, have no idea how you can tell one robot from another. And now, said Defense, I would like to call my first witness to the stand. Professor Simon Ninheimer, please. The clerk hesitated, looked at the judge. Just as Shane asked with visible surprise, you are calling the plaintiff as your witness? Yes, Your Honor. I hope that you are aware that as long as he's your witness, you will be allowed none of the latitude you might exercise if you were cross-examining an opposing witness. Defense said smoothly, My only purpose in all this is to arrive at the truth. It will not be necessary to do more than ask a few polite questions. Well, said the judge dubiously, you're the one handling the case. Call the witness. Ninheimer took the stand and was informed that he was still under oath. He looked more nervous than he had the day before, almost apprehensive. But defense looked at him benignly. Now, Professor Ninheimer, you are suing my clients in the amount of $750,000. That is the, uh, sum, yes. That is a great deal of money. I have suffered a great deal of harm. Surely not that much. The material in question involves only a few passages in a book. Perhaps these were unfortunate passages, but, after all, books sometimes appear with curious mistakes in them. Ninheimer's nostrils flared. Sir, this book was to have been the climax of my professional career. Instead, it makes me look like an incompetent scholar, a perverter of the views held by my honored friends and associates, and a believer of ridiculous and, uh, outmoded viewpoints. My reputation is irretrievably shattered. I can never hold up my head in any, uh, assemblage of scholars, regardless of the outcome of this trial. 
I certainly cannot continue in my career, which has been the whole of my life. The very purpose of my life has been, ah, uh, aborted and destroyed. Defense made no attempt to interrupt the speech, but stared abstractedly at his fingernails as it went on. He said very soothingly, But surely, Professor Ninheimer, at your present age, you could not hope to earn more than, let us be generous, one hundred fifty thousand dollars during the remainder of your life. Yet you are asking the court to award you five times as much. Ninheimer said with an even greater burst of emotion, it is not in my lifetime alone that I am ruined. I do not know for how many generations I shall be pointed at by sociologists as a, a, a fool or maniac. My real achievements will be buried and ignored. I am ruined not only until the day of my death, but for all time to come, because there will always be people who will not believe that a robot made those insertions. It was at this point that Robot EZ-27 rose to his feet. Susan Calvin made no move to stop him. She sat motionless, staring straight ahead. Defense sighed softly. Easy's melodious voice carried clearly. It said, I would like to explain to everyone that I did insert certain passages in the galley proofs that seemed directly opposed to what had been there at first. Even the prosecuting attorney was too startled at the spectacle of a seven-foot robot rising to address the court to be able to demand the stopping of what was obviously a most irregular procedure. When he could collect his wits, it was too late, for Ninheimer rose in the witness chair, his face working. He shouted wildly, "'Damn you! You were instructed to keep your mouth shut about—' He ground to a choking halt, and Easy was silent too. Prosecution was on his feet now, demanding that a mistrial be declared. Justice Shane banged his gavel desperately. "'Silence! Silence!' Certainly there is every reason here to declare a mistrial, except that in the interests of justice I would like to have Professor Ninheimer complete his statement. I distinctly heard him say to the robot that the robot had been instructed to keep its mouth shut about something. There was no mention in your testimony, Professor Ninheimer, as to any instructions to the robot to keep silent about anything. Ninheimer stared wordlessly at the judge. Justice Shane said, did you instruct Robot EZ-27 to keep silent about something? And if so, about what? Your Honor, began Ninheimer hoarsely, and couldn't continue. The judge's voice grew sharp. Did you in fact order the inserts in question to be made in the galleys, and then order the robot to keep quiet about your part in this? Prosecution objected vigorously, but Ninheimer shouted, Oh, what's the use? Yes! Yes! and he ran from the witness-stand. He was stopped at the door by the bailiff and sank hopelessly into one of the last rows of seats, head buried in both hands. Just as Shane said, It is evident to me that Robot EZ-27 was brought here as a trick. Except for the fact that the trick served to prevent a serious miscarriage of justice, I would certainly hold attorney for the defense in contempt. It is clear now, beyond any doubt, that the plaintiff has committed what is to me a completely inexplicable fraud, since apparently he was knowingly ruining his career in the process. Judgment, of course, was for the defendant. Dr. Susan Calvin had herself announced at Dr. Ninheimer's bachelor quarters in University Hall. The young engineer who had driven the car offered to go up with her, but she looked at him scornfully. Do you think he'll assault me? Wait down here. Ninheimer was in no mood to assault anyone. He was packing, wasting no time, anxious to be away before the adverse conclusion of the trial became general knowledge. He looked at Calvin with a queerly defiant air and said, Are you coming to warn me of a countersuit? If so, it will get you nothing. I have no money, no job, no future. I can't even meet the costs of the trial. If you're looking for sympathy, said Calvin coldly, don't look for it here. This was your doing. However, there will be no countersuit, neither of you nor of the university. We will even do what we can to keep you from going to prison for perjury. We aren't vindictive. Oh, is that why I'm not already in custody for forswearing myself? I had wondered. But then, 
he added bitterly. Why should you be vindictive? You have what you want now. Some of what we want, yes, said Calvin. The university will keep easy in its employ at a considerably higher rental fee. Furthermore, certain underground publicity concerning the trial will make it possible to place a few more of the easy models in other institutions without danger of a repetition of this trouble. Then why have you come to see me? Because I don't have all of what I want yet. I want to know why you hate robots as you do. Even if you had won the case, your reputation would have been ruined. The money you might have obtained could not have compensated for that. Would the satisfaction of your hatred for robots have done so? Are you interested in human minds, Dr. Calvin? asked Ninheimer, with acid mockery. In so far as their reactions concern the welfare of robots, yes. For that reason I have learned a little of human psychology. Enough of it to be able to trick me. That wasn't hard, said Calvin, without pomposity. The difficult thing was doing it in such a way as not to damage easy. It is like you to be more concerned for a machine than for a man. He looked at her with savage contempt. It left her unmoved. It merely seems so, Professor Ninhammer. It is only by being concerned for robots that one can truly be concerned for twenty-first century man. You would understand this if you were a roboticist. I have read enough robotics to know I don't want to be a roboticist. Pardon me, you have read a book on robotics. It has taught you nothing. You learned enough to know that you could order a robot to do many things, even to falsify a book, if you went about it properly. You learned enough to know that you could not order him to forget something entirely without risking detection, but you thought you could order him into simple silence more safely. You were wrong. You guessed the truth from his silence. It wasn't guessing. You were an amateur and didn't know enough to cover your tracks completely. My only problem was to prove the matter to the judge, and you were kind enough to help us there, in your ignorance of the robotics you claim to despise. Is there any purpose in this discussion? asked Ninheimer wearily. For me, yes, said Susan Calvin, because I want you to understand how completely you have misjudged robots. You silenced Easy by telling him that if he told anyone about your own distortion of the book you would lose your job. That set up a certain potential within Easy toward silence, one that was strong enough to resist our efforts to break it down. We would have damaged the brain if we had persisted. On the witness stand, however, you yourself put up a higher counter-potential. You said that because people would think that you, not a robot, had written the disputed passages in the book, you would lose far more than just your job. You would lose your reputation, your standing, your respect, your reason for living. You would lose the memory of you after death. A new and higher potential was set up by you, and easy talked. Oh, God, said Ninheimer, turning his head away. Calvin was inexorable. She said, do you understand why he talked? It was not to accuse you, but to defend you. It can be mathematically shown that he was about to assume full blame for your crime, to deny that you had anything to do with it. The first law required that. He was going to lie, to damage himself, to bring monetary harm to a corporation. All that meant less to him than did the saving of you. If you really understood robots and robotics, you would have let him talk. But you did not understand, as I was sure you wouldn't, as I guaranteed to the defense attorney that you wouldn't. You were certain in your hatred of robots that Easy would act as a human being would act, and defend itself at your expense. So you flared out at him in panic and destroyed yourself. Ninheimer said with feeling, I hope some day your robots turn on you and kill you. Don't be foolish, said Calvin. Now I want you to explain why you've done all this. Ninheimer grinned a distorted, humorless grin. I am to dissect my mind, am I, for your intellectual curiosity, in return for immunity from a charge of perjury? Put it that way if you like, said Calvin emotionlessly. But explain. So that you can counter future anti-robot attempts more efficiently, with greater understanding? I accept that. You know, said Ninheimer, 
I'll tell you, just to watch it do you no good at all. You can't understand human motivation. You can only understand your damned machines, because you're a machine yourself with skin on. He was breathing hard, and there was no hesitation in his speech, no searching for precision. It was as though he had no further use for precision. He said, For two hundred and fifty years the machine has been replacing man and destroying the hand craftsman. Pottery is spewed out of molds and presses. Works of art have been replaced by identical gimcracks stamped out on a die. Call it progress if you wish. The artist is restricted to abstractions, confined to the world of ideas. He must design something in mind, and then the machine does the rest. Do you suppose the potter is content with mental creation? Do you suppose the idea is enough, that there is nothing in the feel of the clay itself, in watching the thing grow as hand and mind work together? Do you suppose the actual growth doesn't act as a feedback to modify and improve the idea? You are not a potter, said Dr. Calvin. I am a creative artist. I design and build articles and books. There is more to it than the mere thinking of words and of putting them in the right order. If that were all, there would be no pleasure in it, no return. A book should take shape in the hands of the writer. One must actually see the chapters grow and develop. One must work and rework and watch the changes take place beyond the original concept even. There is taking the galleys in hand and seeing how the sentences look in print and molding them again. There are a hundred contacts between a man and his work at every stage of the game, and the contact itself is pleasurable and repays a man for the work he puts into his creation more than anything else could. Your robot would take all that away. So does a typewriter. So does a printing press. Do you propose to return to the hand illumination of manuscripts? Typewriters and printing presses take away some, but your robot would deprive us of all. Your robot takes over the galleys. Soon it or other robots would take over the original writing, the searching of the sources, the checking and cross-checking of passages, perhaps even the deduction of conclusions. What would that leave the scholar? One thing only the barren decisions concerning what orders to give the robot next. I want to save the future generations of the world of scholarship from such a final hell. That meant more to me than even my own reputation, and so I set out to destroy U.S. robots by whatever means. You were bound to fail, said Susan Calvin. I was bound to try, said Simon Ninheimer. Calvin turned and left. She did her best to feel no pang of sympathy for the broken man. She did not entirely succeed. Christmas Without Rodney It all started with Gracie, my wife of nearly forty years, wanting to give Rodney time off for the holiday season, and it ended with me in an absolutely impossible situation. I'll tell you about it if you don't mind, because I've got to tell somebody. Naturally, I'm changing names and details for our own protection. It was just a couple of months ago, mid-December, and Gracie said to me, Why don't we give Rodney time off for the holiday season? Why shouldn't he celebrate Christmas, too? I remember I had my optics unfocused at the time. There's a certain amount of relief in letting things go hazy when you want to rest or just listen to music but I focused them quickly to see if Gracie were smiling or had a twinkle in her eye. Not that she has much of a sense of humor, you understand. She wasn't smiling. No twinkle. I said, why on earth should we give him time off? Why not? Do you want to give the freezer a vacation, the sterilizer, the holo viewer? Shall we just turn off the power supply? Come, Howard, she said. Rodney isn't a freezer or a sterilizer. He's a person. He's not a person. He's a robot. He wouldn't want a vacation. How do you know? And he's a person. He deserves a chance to rest and just revel in the holiday atmosphere. I wasn't going to argue that person thing with her. I know you've all read those polls which show that women are three times as likely to resent and fear robots as men are. Perhaps that's because robots tend to do what was once called, in the bad old days, women's work 
and women fear being made useless, though I should think they'd be delighted. In any case, Gracie is delighted, and she simply adores Rodney. That's her word for it. Every other day, she says, I just adore Rodney. You've got to understand that Rodney is an old-fashioned robot whom we've had about seven years. He's been adjusted to fit in with our old-fashioned house and our old-fashioned ways, and I'm rather pleased with him myself. Sometimes I wonder about getting one of those slick modern jobs which are automated to death, like the one our son Delancey has, but Gracie would never stand for it. But then I thought of Delancey and I said, How are we going to give Rodney time off, Gracie? Delancey is coming in with that gorgeous wife of his. I was using gorgeous in a sarcastic sense, but Gracie didn't notice. It's amazing how she insists on seeing a good side even when it doesn't exist. And how are we going to have the house in good shape and meals made and all the rest of it without Rodney? But that's just it, she said earnestly. Delancey and Hortense could bring their robot and he could do it all. You know they don't think much of Rodney, and they'd love to show what theirs can do, and Rodney can have a rest. I grunted and said, If it will make you happy, I suppose we can do it. It'll only be for three days. But I don't want Rodney thinking he'll get every holiday off. It was another joke, of course, but Gracie just said very earnestly, No, Howard, I will talk to him and explain it's only just once in a while. She can't quite understand that Rodney is controlled by the three laws of robotics and that nothing has to be explained to him. So I had to wait for Delancey and Hortense, and my heart was heavy. Delancey is my son, of course, but he's one of your upwardly mobile bottom-line individuals. He married Hortense because she has excellent connections in business and can help him in that upward shove. At least I hope so, because if she has another virtue, I have never discovered it. They showed up with their robot two days before Christmas. The robot was as glitzy as Hortense and looked almost as hard. He was polished to a high gloss, and there was none of Rodney's clumping. Hortense's robot, I'm sure she dictated the design, moved absolutely silently. He kept showing up behind me for no reason and giving me heart failure every time I turned around and bumped into him. Worse, Delancey brought eight-year-old Leroy. Now, he's my grandson, and I would swear to Hortense's fidelity because I'm sure no one would voluntarily touch her, but I've got to admit that putting him through a concrete mixer would improve him no end. He came in demanding to know if we had sent Rodney to the metal reclamation unit yet. He called it the bus-stop place. Hortense sniffed and said, Since we have a modern robot with us, I hope you keep Rodney out of sight. I said nothing, but Gracie said, Certainly, dear. In fact, we've given Rodney time off. Delancey made a face, but didn't say anything. He knew his mother. I said pacifically, Suppose we start off by having Rambo make something good to drink, eh? Coffee, tea, hot chocolate, a bit of brandy? Rambo was their robot's name. I don't know why, except that it starts with R. There's no law about it. But you've probably noticed for yourself that almost every robot has a name beginning with R. R for robot, I suppose. The usual name is Robert. There must be a million robot Roberts in the Northeast Corridor alone. And frankly, it's my opinion that's the reason human names just don't start with R anymore. You get Bob and Dick, but not Robert or Richard. You get Posey and Trudy, but not Rose or Ruth. Sometimes you get unusual R's. I know of three robots called Rutabaga, and two that are Ramesses. But Hortense is the only one I know who named a robot Rambo, a syllable combination I've never encountered, and I've never liked to ask why. I was sure the explanation would prove to be unpleasant. Rambo turned out to be useless at once. He was, of course, programmed for the Delancey Hortense menage, and that was utterly modern and utterly automated. To prepare drinks in his own home, all Rambo had to do was to press appropriate buttons. Why anyone would need a robot to press buttons, I would like to have explained to me. He said so. He turned to Hortense and said in a voice like honey, it wasn't Rodney's city boy voice with its trace of Brooklyn, the equipment is lacking, madam and Hortense drew a sharp breath. You mean you still don't have a robotized kitchen, Grandfather? 
She called me nothing at all until Leroy was born, howling, of course, and then she promptly called me grandfather. Naturally, she never called me Howard. That would tend to show me to be human, or, more unlikely, show her to be human. I said, well, it's robotized when Rodney is in it. I dare say, she said, but we're not living in the twentieth century, grandfather. I thought, how I wish we were. But I just said, well, why not program Rambo how to operate our controls? I'm sure he can pour and mix and heat and do whatever else is necessary. I'm sure he can, said Hortense, but thank fate he doesn't have to. I'm not going to interfere with his programming. It will make him less efficient. Gracie said, worried but amiable, but if we don't interfere with his programming, then I'll just have to instruct him step by step. But I don't know how it's done. I've never done it. I said, Rodney can tell him. Gracie said, Oh, Howard, we've given Rodney a vacation. I know, but we're not going to ask him to do anything. Just tell Rambo here what to do, and then Rambo can do it. Whereupon Rambo said stiffly, Madam, there is nothing in my programming or in my instructions that would make it mandatory for me to accept orders given me by another robot, especially one that is an earlier model. Hortense said soothingly, Of course, Rambo, I'm sure that Grandfather and Grandmother understand that. I noticed that Delancey never said a word. I wonder if he ever said a word when his dear wife was present. I said, All right, I tell you what. I'll have Rodney tell me, and then I will tell Rambo. Rambo said nothing to that. Even Rambo is subject to the second law of robotics, which makes it mandatory for him to obey human orders. Hortense's eyes narrowed, and I knew that she would like to tell me that Rambo was far too fine a robot to be ordered about by the likes of me, but some distant and rudimentary near-human waft of feeling kept her from doing so. Little Leroy was hampered by no such quasi-human restraints. He said, I don't want to have to look at Rodney's ugly puss. I bet he don't know how to do anything, and if he does, old Grandpa would get it all wrong anyway. It would have been nice, I thought, if I could be alone with little Leroy for five minutes and reason calmly with him with a brick. But a mother's instinct told Hortense never to leave Leroy alone with any human being whatever. There was nothing to do, really, but get Rodney out of his niche in the closet where he had been enjoying his own thoughts. I wonder if a robot has his own thoughts when he is alone, and put him to work. It was hard. He would say a phrase, then I would say the same phrase, then Rambo would do something, then Rodney would say another phrase, and so on. It all took twice as long as if Rodney were doing it himself, and it wore me out, I can tell you, because everything had to be like that using the dishwasher sterilizer, cooking the Christmas feast, cleaning up messes on the table or on the floor, everything. Gracie kept moaning that Rodney's vacation was being ruined, but she never seemed to notice that mine was too, though I did admire Hortense for her manner of saying something unpleasant at every moment that some statement seemed called for. I noticed particularly that she never repeated herself once. Anyone can be nasty, but to be unfailingly creative in one's nastiness filled me with a perverse desire to applaud now and then. But really, the worst thing of all came on Christmas Eve. The tree had been put up, and I was exhausted. We didn't have the kind of situation in which an automated box of ornaments was plugged into an electronic tree, and at the touch of one button there would result an instantaneous and perfect distribution of ornaments. On our tree, of ordinary, old-fashioned plastic, the ornaments had to be placed, one by one, by hand. Hortense looked revolted, but I said, Actually, Hortense, this means you can be creative and make your own arrangement. Hortense sniffed, rather like the scrape of claws on a rough plaster wall, and left the room with an obvious expression of nausea on her face. I bowed in the direction of her retreating back, glad to see her go and then began the tedious task of listening to Rodney's instructions and passing them on to Rambo. When it was over, I decided to rest my aching feet and mind by sitting in a chair in a far and rather dim corner of the room. I had hardly folded my aching body into the chair when little Leroy entered. He didn't see me, I suppose, 
or then again he might simply have ignored me as being part of the less important and interesting pieces of furniture in the room. He cast a disdainful look on the tree and said to Rambo, Listen, where are the Christmas presents? I bet old Gramps and Graham got me lousy ones, but I ain't going to wait for no tomorrow morning. Rambo said, I do not know where they are, little master. Ha! said Leroy, turning to Rodney. How about you, stink face? Do you know where the presents are? Rodney would have been within the bounds of his programming to have refused to answer on the grounds that he did not know he was being addressed, since his name was Rodney and not Stinkface. I'm quite certain that that would have been Rambo's attitude. Rodney, however, was of different stuff. He answered politely, Yes, I do, little master. So where is it, you old puke? Rodney said, I don't think it would be wise to tell you, little master. That would disappoint Gracie and Howard, who would like to give the presents to you tomorrow morning. Listen, said little Leroy, who do you think you're talking to, you dumb robot? Now I gave you an order. You bring those presents to me. And in an attempt to show Rodney who was master, he kicked the robot in the shin. It was a mistake. I saw it would be that a second before, and that was a joyous second. Little Leroy, after all, was ready for bed, though I doubted that he ever went to bed before he was good and ready. Therefore he was wearing slippers. What's more, the slipper sailed off the foot with which he kicked, so that he ended by slamming his bare toes hard against the solid chrome steel of the robotic shin. He fell to the floor howling, and in rushed his mother. What is it, Leroy? What is it? Whereupon little Leroy had the immortal gall to say, He hit me! That old monster robot hit me! Hortense screamed. She saw me and shouted, That robot of yours must be destroyed! I said, Come, Hortense, a robot can't hit a boy. First law of robotics prevents it. It's an old robot, a broken robot. Leroy says, Leroy lies. There is no robot, no matter how old or how broken, who could hit a boy. Then he did it. Grandpa did it, howled Leroy. I wish I did, I said quietly. But no robot would have allowed me to. Ask your own. Ask Rambo if he would have remained motionless while either Rodney or I had hit your boy. Rambo? I put it in the imperative, and Rambo said, I would not have allowed any harm to come to the little master, madam. But I did not know what he purposed. He kicked Rodney's shin with his bare foot, madam. Hortense gasped, and her eyes bulged in fury. Then he had a good reason to do so. I'll still have your robot destroyed. Go ahead, Hortense. Unless you're willing to ruin your robot's efficiency by trying to reprogram him to lie, he will bear witness to just what preceded the kick, and so, of course, with pleasure will I. Hortense left the next morning, carrying the pale-faced Leroy with her. It turned out he had broken a toe, nothing he didn't deserve, and an endlessly wordless Delancey. Gracie wrung her hands and implored them to stay, but I watched them leave without emotion. No, that's a lie. I watched them leave with lots of emotion, all pleasant. Later I said to Rodney, when Gracie was not present, I'm sorry, Rodney, that was a horrible Christmas, all because we tried to have it without you. We'll never do that again, I promise. Thank you, sir, said Rodney. I must admit that there were times these two days when I earnestly wished the laws of robotics did not exist. I grinned and nodded my head, but that night I woke up out of a sound sleep and began to worry. I've been worrying ever since. I admit that Rodney was greatly tried, but a robot can't wish the laws of robotics did not exist. He can't, no matter what the circumstances. If I report this, Rodney will undoubtedly be scrapped, and if we're issued a new robot as recompense, Gracie will simply never forgive me, never. No robot, however new, however talented, can possibly replace Rodney in her affection. In fact, I'll never forgive myself. Quite apart from my own liking for Rodney, I couldn't bear to give Hortense the satisfaction. But if I do nothing, I live with a robot capable of wishing the laws of robotics did not exist. From wishing they did not exist to acting as if they did not exist is just a step. 
At what moment will he take that step, and in what form will he show that he has done so? What do I do? What do I do? Robots I have known Mechanical men, or to use Chopik's now universally accepted term robots, are a subject to which the modern science fiction writer has turned again and again. There is no uninvented invention, with the possible exception of the spaceship, that is so clearly pictured in the minds of so many. A sinister form, large, metallic, vaguely human, moving like a machine and speaking with no emotion. The key word in the description is sinister, and therein lies a tragedy, for no science fiction theme wore out its welcome as quickly as did the robot. Only one robot plot seemed available to the average author, the mechanical man that proved a menace, the creature that turned against its creator, the robot that became a threat to humanity. And almost all stories of this sort were heavily surcharged, either explicitly or implicitly, with the weary moral that there are some things mankind must never seek to learn. This sad situation has, since 1940, been largely ameliorated. Stories about robots abound, a newer viewpoint, more mechanistic and less moralistic, has developed. For this development, some people, notably Mr. Groff Conklin in the introduction to his science fiction anthology entitled Science Fiction Thinking Machines, published in 1954, have seen fit to attach at least partial credit to a series of robot stories I wrote beginning in 1940. Since there is probably no one on earth less given to false modesty than myself, I accept said partial credit with equanimity and ease modifying it only to include Mr. John W. Campbell, Jr., editor of Astounding Science Fiction, with whom I had many fruitful discussions on robot stories. My own viewpoint was that robots were story material, not as blasphemous imitations of life, but merely as advanced machines. A machine does not turn against its creator if it is properly designed. When a machine such as a power saw seems to do so by occasionally lopping off a limb, this regrettable tendency towards evil is combated by the installation of safety devices. Analogous safety devices would, it seemed obvious, be developed in the case of robots, and the most logical place for such safety devices would seem to be in the circuit patterns of the robotic brain. Let me pause to explain that in science fiction we do not quarrel intensively concerning the actual engineering of the robotic brain. Some mechanical device is assumed which, in a volume that approximates that of the human brain, must contain all the circuits necessary to allow the robot a range of perception and response reasonably equivalent to that of a human being. How that can be done without the use of mechanical units the size of a protein molecule, or at the very least the size of a brain cell, is not explained. Some authors may talk about transistors and printed circuits. Most say nothing at all. My own pet trick is to refer somewhat mystically to positronic brains, leaving it to the ingenuity of the reader to decide what positrons have to do with it, and to his good will to continue reading after having failed to reach a decision. In any case, as I wrote my series of robot stories, the safety devices gradually crystallized in my mind as the three laws of robotics. These three laws were first explicitly stated in Runaround. As finally perfected, the three laws read as follows. First law, a robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Second law, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Third law, a robot must protect its own existence, as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. These laws are firmly built into the robotic brain, or at least the circuit equivalents are. Naturally, I don't describe the circuit equivalents. In fact, I never discuss the engineering of the robots for the very good reason that I am colossally ignorant of the practical aspects of robotics. The first law, as you can readily see, immediately eliminates that old, tired plot which I will not offend you by referring to any further. 
although at first flush it may appear that to set up such restrictive rules must hamper the creative imagination, it has turned out that the laws of robotics have served as a rich source of plot material. They have proved anything but a mental roadblock. An example would be the story Runaround, to which I have already referred. The robot in that story, an expensive and experimental model, is designed for operation on the sun side of the planet Mercury. The third law has been built into him more strongly than usual for obvious economic reasons. He has been sent out by his human employers, as the story begins, to obtain some liquid selenium for some vital and necessary repairs. Liquid selenium lies about in puddles in the heat of Mercury's sunward side, I will ask you to believe. Unfortunately, the robot was given his order casually, so that the second law circuit set up was weaker than usual. Still more unfortunately, the selenium pool to which the robot was sent was near a site of volcanic activity, as a result of which there were sizable concentrations of carbon monoxide in the area. At the temperature of Mercury's sun side, I surmised that carbon monoxide would react fairly quickly with iron to form volatile iron carbonyls so that the robot's more delicate joints might be badly damaged. The further the robot penetrates into this area, the greater the danger to his existence, and the more intensive is the third law effect driving him away. The second law, however, ordinarily the superior, drives him onward. At a certain point, the unusually weak second law potential and the unusually strong third law potential reach a balance, and the robot can neither advance nor retreat. He can only circle the selenium pool on the equipotential locus that makes a rough circle about the site. Meanwhile, our heroes must have the selenium. They chase after the robot in special suits, discover the problem, and wonder how to correct it. After several failures, the correct answer is hit upon. One of the men deliberately exposes himself to Mercury's sun in such a way that, unless the robot rescues him, he will surely die. That brings the first law into operation, which, being superior to both second and third, pulls the robot out of his useless orbit and brings on the necessary happy ending. It is in the story Runaround, by the way, that I believe I first made use of the term robotics, implicitly defined as the science of robot design, construction, maintenance, etc. Years later, I was told that I had invented the term and that it had never seen publication before. I do not know whether this is true. If it is true, I am happy, because I think it is a logical and useful word, and I hereby donate it to real workers in the field with all good will. None of my other robot stories spring so immediately out of the three laws as does run around, but all are born of the laws in some way. There is the story, for instance, of the mind-reading robot, who was forced to lie because he was unable to tell any human being anything other than that which the human in question wished to hear. The truth, you see, would almost invariably cause harm to the human being in the form of disappointment, disillusion, embarrassment, chagrin, and other similar emotions, all of which were but too plainly visible to the robot. Then there was the puzzle of the man who was suspected of being a robot, that is, of having a quasi-protoplasmic body and a robot's positronic brain. One way of proving his humanity would be for him to break the first law in public, so he obliges by deliberately striking a man. But the story ends in doubt, because there is still the suspicion that the other man might also be a robot and there is nothing in the three laws that would prevent a robot from hitting another robot. And then we have the ultimate robots, models so advanced that they are used to pre-calculate such things as weather, crop harvests, industrial production figures, political developments, and so on. This is done in order that world economy may be less subject to the whims of those factors which are now beyond man's control. But these ultimate robots, it seems, are still subject to the first law. They cannot, through inaction, allow human beings to come to harm, so they deliberately give answers which are not necessarily truthful and which cause localized economic upsets so designed as to maneuver mankind along the road that leads to peace and prosperity. 
So the robots finally win the mastery after all, but only for the good of man. The interrelationship of man and robot is not to be neglected. Mankind may know of the existence of the three laws on an intellectual level and yet have an ineradicable fear and distrust for robots on an emotional level. If you wanted to invent a term, you might call it a Frankenstein complex. There is also the more practical matter of the opposition of labor unions, for instance, to the possible replacement of human labor by robot labor. This, too, can give rise to stories. My first robot story concerned a robot nursemaid and a child. The child adored its robot, as might be expected, but the mother feared it, as might also be expected. The nub of the story lay in the mother's attempt to get rid of it and in the child's reaction to that. My first full-length robot novel, The Caves of Steel, 1954, peers further into the future and is laid in a time when other planets, populated by emigrating Earthmen, have adopted a thoroughly robotized economy, but where Earth itself, for economic and emotional reasons, still objects to the introduction of the metal creatures. A murder is committed, with robot hatred as the motive. It is solved by a pair of detectives, one a man, one a robot, with a great portion of the deductive reasoning, to which detective stories are prone, revolving about the three laws and their implications. I have managed to convince myself that the three laws are both necessary and sufficient for human safety in regard to robots. It is my sincere belief that some day, when advanced human-like robots are indeed built, something very like the three laws will be built into them. I would enjoy being a prophet in this respect, and I regret only the fact that the matter probably cannot be arranged in my lifetime. Note. This essay was written in 1956. In the years since, robotics has indeed entered the English language and is universally used, and I have lived to see roboticists taking the three laws very seriously. End of note. The New Teachers The percentage of older people in the world is increasing, and that of younger people decreasing, and this trend will continue if the birth rate should drop and medicine continue to extend the average lifespan. In order to keep older people imaginative and creative, and to prevent them from becoming an ever-growing drag on a shrinking pool of creative young, I have recommended frequently that our educational system be remodeled and that education be considered a lifelong activity. But how can this be done? Where will all the teachers come from? Who says, however, that all teachers must be human beings, or even animate? Suppose that over the next century communication satellites become numerous and more sophisticated than those we've placed in space so far. Suppose that in place of radio waves the more capacious laser beam of visible light becomes the chief communications medium. Under these circumstances there would be room for many millions of separate channels for voice and picture, and it is easy to imagine every human being on earth having a particular television wavelength assigned to her or him. Each person child, adult, or elderly, can have his own private outlet to which could be attached at certain desirable periods of time his or her personal teaching machine. It would be a far more versatile and interactive teaching machine than anything we could put together now, for computer technology will also have advanced in the interval. We can reasonably hope that the teaching machine will be sufficiently intricate and flexible to be capable of modifying its own program, that is, learning, as a result of the student's input. In other words, the student will ask questions, answer questions, make statements, offer opinions, and from all of this the machine will be able to gauge the student well enough to adjust the speed and intensity of its course of instruction and, what's more, shift it in the direction of the student interest displayed. We can't imagine a personal teaching machine to be very big, however. It might resemble a television set in size and appearance. Can so small an object contain enough information to teach the students as much as they want to know, in any direction intellectual curiosity may lead them? No, not if the teaching machine is self-contained. 
but need it be? In any civilization with computer science so advanced as to make teaching machines possible, there will surely be thoroughly computerized central libraries. Such libraries may even be interconnected into a single planetary library. All teaching machines would be plugged into this planetary library, and each could then have at its disposal any book, periodical, document, recording, or video cassette encoded there. If the machine has it, the student would have it too, either placed directly on a viewing screen or reproduced in print on paper for more leisurely study. Of course, human teachers will not be totally eliminated. In some subjects, human interaction is essential athletics, drama, public speaking, and so on. There is also value and interest in groups of students working in a particular field, getting together to discuss and speculate with each other and with human experts, sparking each other to new insights. After this human interchange they may return, with some relief, to the endlessly knowledgeable, endlessly flexible, and most of all endlessly patient machines. But who will teach the teaching machines? Surely the students who learn will also teach. Students who learn freely in those fields and activities that interest them are bound to think, speculate, observe, experiment, and now and then come up with something of their own that may not have been previously known. They would transmit that knowledge back to the machines, which will in turn record it, with due credit presumably, in the planetary library thus making it available to other teaching machines. All will be put back into the central hopper to serve as a new and higher starting point for those who come after. The teaching machines will thus make it possible for the human species to race forward to heights and in directions now impossible to foresee. But I am describing only the mechanics of learning. What are the content? What subjects will people study in the age of the teaching machine? I'll speculate on that in the next essay. Whatever you wish. The difficulty in deciding on what the professions of the future would be is that it all depends on the kind of future we choose to have. If we allow our civilization to be destroyed, the only profession of the future will be scrounging for survival, and few will succeed at it. Suppose, though, that we keep our civilization alive and flourishing, and therefore that technology continues to advance. It seems logical that the professions of such a future would include computer programming, lunar mining, fusion engineering, space construction, laser communications, neurophysiology, and so on. I can't help but think, however, that the advance of computerization and automation is going to wipe out the sub-work of humanity, the dull pushing and shoving and punching and clicking and filing and all the other simple and repetitive motions, both physical and mental, that can be done perfectly easily and better by machines no more complicated than those we can already build. In short, the world could be so well run that only a relative handful of human foremen would be needed to engage in the various professions and supervisory work necessary to keep the world's population fed, housed, and cared for. What about the majority of the human species in this automated future? What about those who don't have the ability or the desire to work at the professions of the future, or for whom there is no room in those professions? It may be that most people will have nothing to do of what we think of as work nowadays. This could be a frightening thought. What will people do without work? Won't they sit around and be bored, or worse, become unstable or even vicious? The saying is that Satan finds mischief still for idle hands to do. But we judge from the situation that has existed till now, a situation in which people are left to themselves to rot. Consider that there have been times in history when an aristocracy lived in idleness off the backs of flesh and blood machines called slaves or serfs or peasants. When such a situation was combined with a high culture, however, aristocrats used their leisure to become educated in literature, the arts, and philosophy. Such studies were not useful for work, but they occupied the mind, made for interesting conversation and an enjoyable life. These were the liberal arts, 
arts for free men who didn't have to work with their hands, and these were considered higher and more satisfying than the mechanical arts, which were merely materially useful. Perhaps, then, the future will see a world aristocracy supported by the only slaves that can humanely serve in such a post, sophisticated machines, and there will be an infinitely newer and broader liberal arts program, taught by the teaching machines, from which each person could choose. Some might choose computer technology, or fusion engineering, or lunar mining, or any of the professions that would seem vital to the proper functioning of the world. Why not? Such professions, placing demands on human imagination and skill, would be very attractive to many, and there will surely be enough who will be voluntarily drawn to these occupations to fill them adequately. But to most people the field of choice might be far less cosmic. It might be stamp collecting, pottery, ornamental painting, cooking, dramatics, or whatever. Every field will be an elective, and the only guide will be whatever you wish. Each person, guided by teaching machines sophisticated enough to offer a wide sampling of human activities, can then choose what he or she can best and most willingly do. Is the individual person wise enough to know what he or she can best do? Why not? Who else can know, and what can a person do best except that which he or she wants to do most? Won't people choose to do nothing, sleep their lives away? If that's what they want, why not? Except that I have a feeling they won't. Doing nothing is hard work, and it seems to me would be indulged in only by those who have never had the opportunity to evolve out of themselves something more interesting and therefore easier to do. In a properly automated and educated world, then, machines may prove to be the true humanizing influence. It may be that machines will do the work that makes life possible, and that human beings will do all the other things that make life pleasant and worthwhile. The Friends We Make The term robot dates back only sixty years. It was invented by the Czech playwright Karl Čapek in his play R.U.R., and is a Czech word meaning worker. The idea, however, is far older. It is as old as man's longing for a servant as smart as a human being, but far stronger, and incapable of growing weary, bored, or dissatisfied. In the Greek myths, the god of the forge, Hephaestus, had two golden girls, as bright and alive as flesh and blood girls, to help him and the island of Crete was guarded in the myths by a bronze giant named Talos, who circled its shores perpetually and tirelessly, watching for intruders. Are robots possible, though? And if they are, are they desirable? Mechanical devices with gears and springs and ratchets could certainly make man-like devices perform man-like actions, but the essence of a successful robot is to have it think and think well enough to perform useful functions without being continually supervised. But thinking takes a brain. The human being is made up of microscopic neurons, each of which has an extraordinarily complex substructure. There are ten billion neurons in the brain, and ninety billion supporting cells, all hooked together in a very intricate pattern. How can anything like that be duplicated by some man-made device in a robot? It wasn't until the invention of the electronic computer thirty-five years ago that such a thing became conceivable. Since its birth, the electronic computer has grown ever more compact, and each year it becomes possible to pack more and more information into less and less volume. In a few decades, might not enough versatility to direct a robot be packed into a volume the size of the human brain? Such a computer would not have to be as advanced as the human brain, but only advanced enough to guide the actions of a robot designed, let us say, to vacuum rugs, to run a hydraulic press, to survey the lunar surface. A robot would, of course, have to include a self-contained energy source. We couldn't expect it to be forever plugged into a wall socket. This, however, can be handled. A battery that needs periodic charging is not so different from a living body that needs periodic feeding. But why bother with a humanoid shape? 
Would it not be more sensible to devise a specialized machine to perform a particular task without asking it to take on all the inefficiencies involved in arms, legs, and torso? Suppose you design a robot that can hold a finger in a furnace to test its temperature and turn the heating unit on and off to maintain that temperature nearly constant. Surely a simple thermostat made of a bimetallic strip will do the job as well. Consider, though, that over the thousands of years of man's civilization we have built a technology geared to the human shape. Products for human's use are designed in size and form to accommodate the human body. How it bends and how long, wide, and heavy the various bending parts are. Machines are designed to fit the human reach and the width and position of human fingers. We have only to consider the problems of human beings who happen to be a little taller or shorter than the norm, or even just left-handed, to see how important it is to have a good fit into our technology. If we want a directing device, then, one that can make use of human tools and machines, and that can fit into the technology, we would find it useful to make that device in the human shape, with all the bends and turns of which the human body is capable. Nor would we want it to be too heavy or too abnormally proportioned. Average in all respects would be best. Then, too, we relate to all non-human things by finding or inventing something human about them. We attribute human characteristics to our pets and even to our automobiles. We personify nature and all the products of nature, and in earlier times made human-shaped gods and goddesses out of them. Surely, if we are to take on thinking partners, or at the least thinking servants in the form of machines, we will be more comfortable with them, and we will relate to them more easily if they are shaped like humans. It will be easier to be friends with human-shaped robots than with specialized machines of unrecognizable shape. And I sometimes think that in the desperate straits of humanity today, we would be grateful to have non-human friends, even if they are only friends we build ourselves. Our Intelligent Tools Robots don't have to be very intelligent to be intelligent enough. If a robot can follow simple orders and do the housework, or run simple machines in a cut-and-dried, repetitive way, we would be perfectly satisfied. Constructing a robot is hard because you must fit a very compact computer inside its skull if it is to have a vaguely human shape. Making a sufficiently complex computer as compact as the human brain is also hard. But, robots aside, why bother making a computer that compact? The units that make up a computer have been getting smaller and smaller, to be sure, from vacuum tubes to transistors to tiny integrated circuits and silicon chips. Suppose that, in addition to making the units smaller, we also make the whole structure bigger. A brain that gets too large would eventually begin to lose efficiency, because nerve impulses don't travel very quickly. Even the speediest nerve impulses travel at only about 3.75 miles a minute. A nerve impulse can flash from one end of the brain to the other in one four hundred fortieth of a second, but a brain nine miles long, if we could imagine one, would require 2.4 minutes for a nerve impulse to travel its length. The added complexity made possible by the enormous size would fall apart simply because of the long wait for information to be moved and processed within it. Computers, however, use electric impulses that travel at more than 11 million miles per minute. A computer 400 miles wide would still flash electric impulses from end to end in about one four hundred fortieth of a second. In that respect, at least, a computer of that asteroidal size could still process information as quickly as the human brain could. If, therefore, we imagine computers being manufactured with finer and finer components, more and more intricately interrelated, and also imagine those same computers becoming larger and larger, might it not be that the computers would eventually become capable of doing all the things a human brain can do? Is there a theoretical limit to how intelligent a computer can become? I've never heard of any. It seems to me that each time we learn to pack more complexity into a given volume, the computer can do more. 
each time we make a computer larger while keeping each portion as densely complex as before, the computer can do more. Eventually, if we learn how to make a computer sufficiently complex and sufficiently large, why should it not achieve a human intelligence? Some people are sure to be disbelieving and say, but how can a computer possibly produce a great symphony, a great work of art, a great new scientific theory? The retort I am usually tempted to make to this question is, can you? But, of course, even if the questioner is ordinary, there are extraordinary people who are geniuses. They attain genius, however, only because atoms and molecules within their brains are arranged in some complex order. There's nothing in their brains but atoms and molecules. If we arrange atoms and molecules in some complex order in a computer, the products of genius should be possible to it. And if the individual parts are not as tiny and delicate as those of the brain, we compensate by making the computer larger. Some people may say, but computers can only do what they're programmed to do. The answer to that is true, but brains can do only what they're programmed to do by their genes. Part of the brain's programming is the ability to learn, and that will be part of a complex computer's programming. In fact, if a computer can be built to be as intelligent as a human being, why can't it be made more intelligent as well? Why not indeed? Maybe that's what evolution is all about. Over the space of three billion years, hit-and-miss development of atoms and molecules has finally produced, through glacially slow improvement, a species intelligent enough to take the next step in a matter of centuries or even decades. Then things will really move. But if computers become more intelligent than human beings, might they not replace us? Well, shouldn't they? They may be as kind as they are intelligent, and just let us dwindle by attrition. They might keep some of us as pets, or on reservations. Then, to consider what we're doing to ourselves right now, to all living things, and to the very planet we live on. Maybe it is time we were replaced. Maybe the real danger is that computers won't be developed to the point of replacing us fast enough. Think about it. Note. I present this view only as something to think about. I consider a quite different view in Intelligences Together, later in this collection. End of note. The Laws of Robotics It isn't easy to think about computers without wondering if they will ever take over. Will they replace us, make us obsolete, and get rid of us the way we got rid of spears and tinderboxes? If we imagine computer-like brains inside the metal imitations of human beings that we call robots, the fear is even more direct. Robots look so much like human beings that their very appearance may give them rebellious ideas. This problem faced the world of science fiction in the 1920s and 1930s, and many were the cautionary tales written of robots that were built and then turned on their creators and destroyed them. When I was a young man, I grew tired of that caution, for it seemed to me that a robot was a machine, and that human beings were constantly building machines. Since all machines are dangerous, one way or another, human beings built safeguards into them. In 1939, therefore, I began to write a series of stories in which robots were presented sympathetically, as machines that were carefully designed to perform given tasks, with ample safeguards built into them to make them benign. In a story I wrote in October 1941, I finally presented the safeguards in the specific form of the Three Laws of Robotics. I invented the word robotics, which had never been used before. Here they are. 1. A robot may not injure a human being, or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. 2. A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where those orders would conflict with the first law. 3. A robot must protect its own existence, except where such protection would conflict with the first and second law. These laws were programmed into the computerized brain of the robot, and the numerous stories I wrote about robots took them into account. 
Indeed, these laws proved so popular with the readers and made so much sense that other science fiction writers began to use them without ever quoting them directly. Only I may do that. And all the old stories of robots destroying their creators died out. Ah, but that's science fiction. What about the work really being done now on computers and on artificial intelligence? When machines are built that begin to have an intelligence of their own, will something like the three laws of robotics be built into them? Of course they will, assuming the computer designers have the least bit of intelligence. What's more, the safeguards will not merely be like the three laws of robotics, they will be the three laws of robotics. I did not realize at the time I constructed those laws that humanity has been using them since the dawn of time. Just think of them as the three laws of tools, and this is the way they would read. 1. A tool must be safe to use. Obviously, knives have handles and swords have hilts. Any tool that is sure to harm the user, provided the user is aware, will never be used routinely, whatever its other qualifications. 2. A tool must perform its function, provided it does so safely. 3. A tool must remain intact during use unless its destruction is required for safety or unless its destruction is part of its function. No one ever cites these three laws of tools because they are taken for granted by everyone. Each law, were it quoted, would be sure to be greeted by a chorus of, well, of course. Compare the three laws of tools, then, with the three laws of robotics, law by law, and you will see that they correspond exactly. And why not, since the robot, or, if you will, the computer, is a human tool? But are safeguards sufficient? Consider the effort that is put into making the automobile safe, yet automobiles still kill 50,000 Americans a year. Consider the effort that is put into making banks secure, yet there are still bank robberies in a steady drum roll. Consider the effort that is put into making computer programs secure, yet there is the growing danger of computer fraud. Computers, however, if they get intelligent enough to take over, may also be intelligent enough no longer to require the three laws. They may, of their own benevolence, take care of us and guard us from harm. Some of you may argue, though, that we're not children, and that it would destroy the very essence of our humanity to be guarded. Really? Look at the world today and the world in the past, and ask yourself if we're not children, and destructive children at that, and if we don't need to be guarded in our own interest. If we demand to be treated as adults, shouldn't we act like adults? And when do we intend to start? Future Fantastic In the past, three fundamental advances in human communication evolved that altered every facet of our world enormously and permanently. The first advance was speech, the second writing, and the third printing. Now we face a fourth advance in communication every bit as important as the first three, the computer. This fourth revolution will enable most human beings to be more creative than they've ever been before. And provided we do not destroy the world by nuclear warfare, overpopulation, or pollution, we will have a world of the techno-child, a world as different from our present one as today's is from the world of the caveman. How will the lives of the next generation be different from their parents and grandparents? One immediate response is to view the computer merely as another form of amusement, rather like a super TV. It can be used for complex games, for making contact with friends, or for various trivial pursuits. Still, such things can change the world. For one thing, communication by computer networks can wipe out the feeling of distance. It can make the globe seem like a neighborhood, and this can have important consequences the development of the concept of humanity as a single society, not as a collection of endlessly and inevitably warring social segments. The world might develop a global lingua franca, a language, no doubt something quite close to today's English, that everyone can understand, even though people would retain their individual languages for local use. Then, too, since communication will be so easy, and since mechanical and electronic devices can be controlled remotely, 
Telemetering, for example, makes it possible even now for engineers to send instructions to and obtain obedience from devices sailing past planets billions of miles away. Computers will reduce the necessity of using physical transportation to gain or gather information. There will, of course, be no bar to travel. You can still be a tourist or visit friends or family in person rather than by closed-circuit television. But you will not have to battle hordes of people merely to carry or receive information that can be transferred by computer. This means that the techno-children of tomorrow will be accustomed to living in a decentralized world, to reaching out in a variety of ways from their homes, or wherever they are, to do what needs doing. At one and the same time, they will feel both entirely isolated and in total contact. The children of the next generation, and the society they will create, will see the greatest impact from computers in the area of education. Currently, our society is intent on educating as many children as possible. The limit in the number of teachers means that students learn in mass. Every student in a school district, or state, or nation is taught the same thing at the same time, in more or less the same way. But because each child has individual interests and methods of learning, the experience of mass education turns out to be unpleasant. The result is that most adults resist the learning process in post-school life. They've had enough of it. Learning could be pleasant, even all-absorbingly fascinating, if children studied something that specifically interested them individually, on their own time and in their own way. Such study is currently possible through public libraries. But the library is a clumsy tool. One must go there. Borrowing is limited to a few volumes, and books must be returned after a short time. Clearly, the solution is to move libraries into the home. Just as record players brought home the concert hall and television brought home the movie theater, the computer can bring home the public library. Tomorrow's techno-children will have a ready means of sating their curiosity. They will know at an early age how to command their computers to give listings of materials. As their interests are aroused, and guided, it is to be hoped, by their teachers at school, they will learn more in less time and find new byways to follow. Education will have a strong component of self-motivation added to it. The ability to follow a personal path will encourage the techno-child to associate learning with pleasure and grow into a lively techno-adult, eager, curious, and ready to expand the mental environment for as long as his or her brain remains physically undulled by the ravages of old age. This new approach to education can also influence another area of life, work. Until now, most human beings have worked at jobs that seriously underutilized the brain. In the ages when work consisted largely of brutish physical labor, few ever had the chance to lift their eyes to the stars or ponder abstractions. Even when the Industrial Revolution brought machinery that could lift the load of physical labor from the backs of humanity, meaningless skilled work took its place. Today, employees on the assembly line and in offices still perform jobs that require little thought. For the first time in history, skilled machines or robots will be able to do those mindless jobs. Any job that is so simple and repetitive that a robot can do it as well as, if not better than, a person, is beneath the dignity of the human brain. As techno-children turn into adults and move into the work world, they will have time to exercise more creativity, to work in the fields of drama, science, literature, government, and entertainment. And they will be ready for this kind of work as a result of the computerized revolution in education. Some might believe that it's simply impossible to expect people to be creative in large numbers. But that thinking comes from a world in which only a few escape the mental destruction of jobs that don't use the brain. We've been through this before. It was always assumed that literacy, for example, was the province of the few who had minds peculiarly adapted to the complicated task of reading and writing. Of course, with the advent of printing and mass education, it turned out that most human beings could be literate. What does all this mean? 
that we will be dealing with a world of leisure. Once computers and robots are doing the dull mechanical work, the world will start running itself to a far greater extent than ever before. Will there be more Renaissance people as a result? Yes. Currently, leisure is a small segment of life that is used narrowly because of lack of time, or is wasted on doing nothing in a desperate attempt to get far away from the hated workaday world. With leisure filling most of one's time, there will be no sensation of racing the clock, no compulsion to enter into a wild spree against the slavery of hateful work. People will sample a variety of interests without haste, become skillful or knowledgeable in a number of areas, and cultivate different talents at various times. This is not just guesswork. There have been eras in history when people had slaves, the brutalized human version of the computer, to do the work for them. Others have had patrons to support them. When even a few people have had ample leisure time to pursue their interests, the result has been an explosion of variegated culture. The Golden Age of Athens in the late 5th century BC and the Italian Renaissance in the 14th to 16th centuries are the most famous examples. Not only will people have the freedom to pursue hobbies and interests and dreams, but a great number of them will also want to share their talents. So many of us have a bit of the ham in us. We sing in the shower, take part in amateur theatrical productions, or love to swing along in parades. It is my guess that the twenty-first century may see a society in which one-third of the population will be engaged in entertaining the other two-thirds. And there are bound to be new forms of entertainment that one can now foresee only dimly. Three-dimensional TV is easy to forecast, and space may become a new arena for activity. In near-zero gravity, for example, the manipulation of balls may produce far more complicated forms of tennis or soccer. Ballet and even social dancing may become incredibly startling and require a new kind of coordination that's delightful to watch, as it will be as easy to move up and down as it is to move forward and backward or left and right. What about those people who choose not to share their bents and interests and instead retire into worlds of their own? Someone who is interested, for example, in learning about the history of costumes and who is capable of exploring the libraries of the world from an isolated corner might simply stay there. Might we then find ourselves in a society in which an unprecedented number of people are intellectual hermits? Might we breed a race of introverts? I think the chances are slim. People who grow ferociously interested in one aspect of knowledge or expertise are quite likely to be filled with missionary zeal. They will want to share their knowledge with others. Even today, someone who has an obscure field of interest is far more likely to want to explain it to everyone he or she meets than to sit silently in a corner. If there's any danger, it's that an arcane interest will nurture a loquacious boar rather than a hermit. We must not forget the tendency of those who share interests to wish to get together, to form a temporary sub-universe that is a haven of concentrated special fascination. In the 1970s, for example, someone had the idea of organizing a convention for Star Trek fans, expecting a few hundred at most to attend. Instead, fans poured in by the thousands, and television was supposed to be an isolating medium. Online gatherings, in which the computer is the medium and people are actively involved, will experience similarly high levels of participation. And in between the formal get-togethers, there will be a kaleidoscope of people linked into global communities by computerized communication. Perpetual conventions will take place, in which individuals continually drop in and out, bringing in findings or ideas and leaving stimulated. There will be a constant melange of teaching and learning. What I foresee is a society in intense creative ferment, people reaching out to others, new thoughts arising and spreading at a speed never before imagined, change and variety filling the planet, to say nothing of the smaller artificial worlds that will be constructed in space. It will be a new world that will look back at earlier centuries as having been only half alive. THE MACHINE AND THE ROBOT 
To a physicist, a machine is any device that transfers a force from the point where it is applied to another point where it is used, and in the process changes its intensity or direction. In this sense, it is difficult for a human being to make use of anything that is not part of his body without in the process using a machine. A couple of million years ago, when one could scarcely decide whether the most advanced hominids were more human-like than ape-like, pebbles were already being chipped and their sharp edges used to cut or scrape. And even a chipped pebble is a machine, for the force applied to the blunt edge by the hand is transmitted to the sharp end and in the process intensified. The force spread over the large area of the blunt end is equal to the force spread over the small area of the sharp end. The pressure, force per area, is therefore increased, and without ever increasing the total force, that force is intensified in action. The sharp-edged pebble could, by the greater pressure it exerts, force its way through an object as a rounded pebble or a man's hand could not. In actual practice, however, few people, other than physicists at their most rigid, would call a chipped pebble a machine. In actual practice, we think of machines as relatively complicated devices, and are more likely to use the name if the device is somewhat removed from direct human guidance and manipulation. The further a device is removed from human control, the more authentically mechanical it seems and the whole trend in technology has been to devise machines that are less and less under direct human control and more and more seem to have the beginning of a will of their own. A chipped pebble is almost part of the hand it never leaves. A thrown spear declares a sort of independence the moment it is released. The clear progression away from direct and immediate control made it possible for human beings, even in primitive times, to slide forward into extrapolation and to picture devices still less controllable, still more independent than anything of which they had direct experience. Immediately we have a form of fantasy, which some, defining the term more broadly than I would, might even call science fiction. Man can move on his feet by direct and intimate control, or on horseback, controlling the more powerful animal muscles by rein and heel, or on ship, making use of the invisible power of the wind. Why not progress into further etherealization by way of seven-league boots, flying carpets, self-propelled boats? The power used in these cases was magic the tapping of the superhuman and transcendental energies of gods or demons. Nor did these imaginings concern only the increased physical power of inanimate objects, but even increased mental power of objects which were still viewed as essentially inanimate. Artificial intelligence is not really a modern concept. Hephaestus, the Greek god of the forge, is pictured in the Iliad as having golden mechanical women, which were as mobile and as intelligent as flesh-and-blood women, and which helped him in his palace. Why not? After all, if a human smith makes inanimate metal objects of the base metal iron, why should not a god-smith make far more clever inanimate metal objects of the noble metal gold? It is an easy extrapolation, of the sort that comes as second nature to science fiction writers who, in primitive times, had to be myth-makers in default of science. But human artisans, if clever enough, could also make mechanical human beings. Consider Talos, a bronze warrior made by that Thomas Edison of the Greek myths, Daedalus. Talos guarded the shores of Crete, circling the island once each day and keeping off all intruders. The fluid that kept him alive was kept within his body by a plug at his heel. When the Argonauts landed on Crete, Medea used her magic to pull out the plug, and Talos lost all his pseudo-animation. It is easy to ascribe a symbolic meaning to this myth. Crete, starting in the fourth millennium B.C., before the Greeks had yet entered Greece, had a navy, the first working navy in human history. The Cretan navy made it possible for the islanders to establish an empire over what became the nearby islands and mainland. 
the Greek barbarians, invading the land, were more or less under Cretan dominion to begin with. The bronze-armored warriors carried by the ships guarded the Cretan mainland for two thousand years, and then failed. The plug was pulled, so to speak, when the island of Thera exploded in a vast volcanic eruption in 1500 B.C., and a tsunami greatly weakened the Cretan civilization, and the Greeks took over. Still, the fact that a myth is a sort of vague and distorted recall of something actual does not alter its function of indicating a way of human thinking. From the start, then, the machine has faced mankind with a double aspect. As long as it is completely under human control, it is useful and good and makes a better life for people. However, it is the experience of mankind, and was already his experience in quite early times, that technology is a cumulative thing, that machines are invariably improved, and that the improvement is always in the direction of etherealization, always in the direction of less human control and more auto-control, and at an accelerating rate. As the human control decreases, the machine becomes frightening in exact proportion. Even when the human control is not visibly decreasing, or is doing so at an excessively low rate, it is a simple task for human ingenuity to look forward to a time when the machine may go out of control altogether, and the fear of that can be felt in advance. What is the fear? The simplest and most obvious fear is that of the possible harm that comes from machinery out of control. In fact, any technological advance, however fundamental, has the double aspect of good harm and, in response, is viewed with a double aspect of love-fear. Fire warms you, gives you light, cooks your food, smelts your ore, and, out of control, burns and kills. Your knives and spears kill your animal enemies and your human foes, and, out of your control, are used by your foes to kill you. You can run down the list and build examples indefinitely, and there has never been any human activity which, on getting out of control and doing harm, has raised the sigh among many of, oh, if we had only stuck to the simple and virtuous lives of our ancestors, who were not cursed with this new-fangled misery. Yet is this fear of piecemeal harm from this advance, or that the kind of deep-seated terror, so difficult to express that it finds its way into the myths? I think not. Fear of machinery for the discomfort and occasional harm it brings has, at least until very recently, not moved humanity to more than that occasional sigh. The love of the uses of machinery has always far overbalanced such fears, as we might judge if we consider that very rarely in the history of mankind has any culture voluntarily given up significant technological advance because of the inconvenience or harm of its side effects. There have been involuntary retreats from technology as a result of warfare, civil strife, epidemics, or natural disasters, but the results of that are precisely what we call a dark age, and the population suffering from one does its best over the generations to get back on the track and restore the technology. Mankind has always chosen to counter the evils of technology not by abandonment of technology, but by additional technology. The smoke of an indoor fire was countered by the chimney. The danger of the spear was countered by the shield. The danger of the mass army was countered by the city wall. This attitude, despite the steady drizzle of backwardest outcries, has continued to the present. Thus the characteristic technological product of our present life is the automobile. It pollutes the air, assaults our eardrums, kills 50,000 Americans a year, and inflicts survivable injuries on hundreds of thousands. Does anyone seriously expect Americans to give up their murderous little pets voluntarily? Even those who attend rallies to denounce the mechanization of modern life are quite likely to reach those rallies by automobile. The first moment when the magnitude of possible evil was seen by many people as uncounterable by any conceivable good came with the fission bomb in 1945. Never before had any technological advance set off demands for abandonment 
by so large a percentage of the population. In fact, the reaction to the fission bomb set a new fashion. People were readier to oppose other advances they saw as unacceptably harmful in their side effects. Biological warfare, the SST, certain genetic experiments on microorganisms, breeder reactors, spray cans. And even so, not one of these items has yet been given up. But we're on the right track. The fear of the machine is not at the deepest level of the soul if the harm it does is accompanied by good, too. Or if the harm is merely to some people, the few who happen to be on the spot in a vehicular collision, for instance. The majority, after all, escape and reap the good of the machine. No, it is when the machine threatens all mankind in any way so that each individual human being begins to feel that he himself will not escape that fear overwhelms love. But since technology has begun to threaten the human race as a whole only in the last thirty years, were we immune to fear before that, or has the human race always been threatened? After all, is physical destruction by brute energy of a type only now in our fist the only way in which human beings can be destroyed? Might not the machine destroy the essence of humanity, our minds and souls, even while leaving our bodies intact and secure and comfortable? It is a common fear, for instance, that television makes people unable to read, and pocket computers will make them unable to add. Or think of the Spartan king who, on observing a catapult in action, mourned that that would put an end to human valor. Certainly such subtle threats to humanity have existed and been recognized through all the long ages when man's feeble control over nature made it impossible for him to do himself very much physical harm. The fear that machinery might make men effete is not yet, in my opinion, the basic and greatest fear. The one, it seems to me, that hits closest to the core is the general fear of irreversible change. Consider. There are two kinds of change that we can gather from the universe about us. One is cyclic and benign. Day both follows and is followed by night. Summer both follows and is followed by winter. Rain both follows and is followed by clear weather. And the net result is, therefore, no change. That may be boring, but it is comfortable and induces a feeling of security. In fact, so comfortable is the notion of short-term cyclic change implying long-term changelessness that human beings labor to find it everywhere. In human affairs there is the notion that one generation both follows and is followed by another, that one dynasty both follows and is followed by another, that one empire both follows and is followed by another. It is not a good analogy to the cycles of nature, since the repetitions are not exact, but it is good enough to be comforting. So strongly do human beings want the comfort of cycles that they will seize upon one even when the evidence is insufficient, or even when it actually points the other way. With respect to the universe, what evidence we have points to a hyperbolic evolution, a universe that expands forever out of the initial Big Bang and ends as formless gas and black holes. Yet our emotions drag us, against the evidence, to notions of oscillating, cyclic, repeating universes, in which even the black holes are merely gateways to new big bangs. But then there is the other change, to be avoided at all costs, the irreversible, malignant change, the one-way change, the permanent change, the change never to return. What is so fearful about it? The fact is that there is one such change that lies so close to ourselves that it distorts the entire universe for us. We are, after all, old, and though we were once young, we shall never be young again. Irreversible. Our friends are dead, and though they were once alive, they shall never be alive again. Irreversible. The fact is that life ends in death and that is not a cyclic change, and we fear that end and know it is useless to fight it. What is worse is that the universe doesn't die with us. Callously and immortally it continues onward in its cyclic changes, adding to the injury of death the insult of indifference. 
And what is still worse is that other human beings don't die with us. There are younger human beings, born later, who were helpless and dependent on us to start with, but who grow into supplanting nemeses and take our places as we age and die. To the injury of death is added the insult of supplantation. Did I say it is useless to fight this horror of death accompanied by indifference and supplantation? Not quite. The uselessness is apparent only if we cling to the rational, but there is no law that says we must cling to it, and human beings do not in fact do so. Death can be avoided by simply denying it exists. We can suppose that life on earth is an illusion, a short testing period prior to entry into some afterlife, where all is eternal and there is no question of irreversible change. Or we can suppose that it is only the body that is subject to death, and that there is an immortal component of ourselves, not subject to irreversible change, which might, after the death of one body, enter another, in indefinite, cyclic repetitions of life. These mythic inventions of afterlife and transmigration may make life tolerable for many human beings, and enable them to face death with reasonable equanimity. But the fear of death and supplantation is only masked and overlaid. It is not removed. In fact, the Greek myths involve the successive supplantation of one set of immortals by another, in what seems to be a despairing admission that not even eternal life and superhuman power can remove the danger of irreversible change and the humiliation of being supplanted. To the Greeks it was disorder, chaos, that first ruled the universe, and it was supplanted by Uranus, the sky, whose intricate powdering of stars and complexly moving planets symbolized order, cosmos. But Uranus was castrated by Kronos, his son. Kronos, his brothers, his sisters, and their progeny then ruled the universe. Kronos feared that he would be served by his children as he had served his father, a kind of cycle of irreversible changes, and devoured his children as they were born. He was duped by his wife, however, who managed to save her last-born, Zeus, and to spirit him away to safety. Zeus grew to adult godhood, rescued his siblings from his father's stomach, warred against Kronos and those who followed him, defeated him, and replaced him as ruler. There are supplantation myths among other cultures, too, even in our own, as the one in which Satan tried to supplant God and failed, a myth that reached its greatest literary expression in John Milton's Paradise Lost. And was Zeus safe? He was attracted to the sea-nymph Thetis, and would have married her had he not been informed by the fates that Thetis was destined to bear a son mightier than his father. That meant it was not safe for Zeus, or for any other god either, to marry her. She was therefore forced, much against her will, to marry Peleus, a mortal, and bear a mortal son, the only child the myths describe her as having. That son was Achilles, who was certainly far mightier than his father, and, like Talos, had only his heel as his weak point through which he might be killed. Now then, translate this fear of irreversible change and of being supplanted into the relationship of man and machine, and what do we have? Surely the great fear is not that machinery will harm us, but that it will supplant us. It is not that it will render us ineffective, but that it will make us obsolete. The ultimate machine is an intelligent machine, and there is only one basic plot to the intelligent machine story that it is created to serve man, but that it ends by dominating man. It cannot exist without threatening to supplant us, and it must therefore be destroyed, or we will be. There is the danger of the broom of the sorcerer's apprentice, the golem of Rabbi Love, the monster created by Dr. Frankenstein. As the child born of our body eventually supplants us, so does the machine born of our mind. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which appeared in 1818, represents a peak of fear, however, for, as it happened, circumstances conspired to reduce that fear, at least temporarily. Between the year 1815, which saw the end of a series of general European wars, and 1914, which saw the beginning of another, 
there was a brief period in which humanity could afford the luxury of optimism concerning its relationship to the machine. The Industrial Revolution seemed suddenly to uplift human power and to bring on dreams of a technological utopia on earth, in place of the mythic one in heaven. The good of machines seemed to far outbalance the evil, and the response of love far outbalanced the response of fear. It was in that interval that modern science fiction began, and by modern science fiction I refer to a form of literature that deals with societies differing from our own, specifically in the level of science and technology, and into which we might conceivably pass from our own society by appropriate changes in that level. This differentiates science fiction from fantasy or from speculative fiction, in which the fictional society cannot be connected with our own by any rational set of changes. Modern science fiction, because of the time of its beginning, took on an optimistic note. Man's relationship to the machine was one of use and control. Man's power grew, and man's machines were his faithful tools bringing him wealth and security, and carrying him to the farthest reaches of the universe. This optimistic note continues to this day, particularly among those writers who were molded in the years before the coming of the fission bomb, notably Robert Heinlein, Arthur C. Clarke, and myself. Nevertheless, with World War I, disillusionment set in. Science and technology, which promised an Eden, turned out to be capable of delivering hell as well. The beautiful airplane that fulfilled the age-old dream of flight could deliver bombs. The chemical techniques that produced anesthetics, dyes, and medicines produced poison gas as well. The fear of supplantation rose again. In 1921, not long after the end of World War I, Carl Chopik's drama R.U.R. appeared, and it was the tale of Frankenstein again, escalated to the planetary level. Not a single monster was created, but millions of robots, Chopik's word meaning worker, a mechanical one, that is. And it was not a single monster turning upon his single creator, but robots turning on humanity, wiping them out and supplanting them. From the beginning of the science fiction magazine in 1926 to 1959, a third of a century or a generation, optimism and pessimism battled each other in science fiction, with optimism, thanks chiefly to the influence of John W. Campbell, Jr., having the better of it. Beginning in 1939, I wrote a series of influential robot stories that self-consciously combated the Frankenstein complex and made of the robots the servants, friends, and allies of humanity. It was pessimism, however, that won in the end, and for two reasons. First, machinery grew more frightening. The fission bomb threatened physical destruction, of course, but worse still was the rapidly advancing electronic computer. Those computers seemed to steal the human soul. Deftly they solved our routine problems, and more and more we found ourselves placing our questions in the hands of these machines with increasing faith, and accepting their answers with increasing humility. All that fission and fusion bombs can do is destroy us. The computer might supplant us. The second reason is more subtle, for it involved a change in the nature of the science fiction writer. Until 1959 there were many branches of fiction, with science fiction perhaps the least among them. It brought its writers less in prestige and money than almost any other branch, so that no one wrote science fiction who wasn't so fascinated by it that he was willing to give up any chance at fame and fortune for its sake. Often that fascination stemmed from an absorption in the romance of science, so that science fiction writers would naturally picture men as winning the universe by learning to bend it to their will. In the 1950s, however, competition with TV gradually killed the magazines that supported fiction, and by the time the 1960s arrived, the only form of fiction that was flourishing and even expanding was science fiction. Its magazines continued, and an incredible paperback boom was initiated. To a lesser extent, it invaded movies and television, with its greatest triumphs undoubtedly yet to come. 
This meant that in the 1960s and 1970s, young writers began to write science fiction not because they wanted to, but because it was there, and because very little else was there. It meant that many of the new generation of science fiction writers had no knowledge of science, no sympathy for it, and were in fact rather hostile to it. Such writers were far more ready to accept the fear half of the love-fear relationship of man to machine. As a result, contemporary science fiction, far more often than not, is presenting us over and over with the myth of the child supplanting the parent, Zeus supplanting Kronos, Satan supplanting God, the machine supplanting humanity. Nightmares they are, and they are to be read as such. But allow me my own cynical commentary at the end. Remember that although Kronos foresaw the danger of being supplanted, and though he destroyed his children to prevent it, he was supplanted anyway, and rightly so, for Zeus was the better ruler. So it may be that although we will hate and fight the machines, we will be supplanted anyway, and rightly so, for the intelligent machines to which we will give birth may better than we carry on the striving toward the goal of understanding and using the universe, climbing to heights we ourselves could never aspire to. THE NEW PROFESSION Back in 1940, I wrote a story in which the leading character was named Susan Calvin. Good heavens, that's nearly half a century ago. She was a robo-psychologist by profession, and knew everything there was to know about what made robots tick. It was a science fiction story, of course. I wrote other stories about Susan Calvin over the next few years, and as I described matters, she was born in 1982, went to Columbia, majored in robotics, and graduated in 2003. She went on to do graduate work, and by 2010 was working at a firm called U.S. Robots and Mechanical Men, Incorporated. I didn't really take any of this seriously at the time I wrote it. What I was writing was just science fiction. Oddly enough, however, it's working out. Robots are in use on the assembly lines and are increasing in importance each year. The automobile companies are installing them in their factories by the tens of thousands. Increasingly, they will appear elsewhere as well, while ever more complex and intelligent robots will be appearing on the drawing boards. Naturally, these robots are going to wipe out many jobs, but they are going to create jobs, too. The robots will have to be designed in the first place, they will have to be constructed and installed, then, since nothing is perfect, they will occasionally go wrong and have to be repaired. To keep the necessity for repair to a minimum, they will have to be intelligently maintained. They may even have to be modified to do their work differently on occasion. To do all this, we will need a group of people whom we can call, in general, robot technicians. There are some estimates that by the time my fictional Susan Calvin gets out of college, there will be over two million robot technicians in the United States alone, and perhaps six million in the world generally. Susan won't be alone. To these technicians, suppose we add all the other people that will be employed by those rapidly growing industries that are directly or indirectly related to robotics. It may well turn out that the robots will create more jobs than they will wipe out. But, of course, the two sets of jobs will be different, which means there will be a difficult transition period in which those whose jobs have vanished are retrained so that they can fill new jobs that have appeared. This may not be possible in every case, and there will have to be innovative social initiatives to take care of those who, because of age or temperament, cannot fit into the rapidly changing economic scene. In the past, advances in technology have always necessitated the upgrading of education. Agricultural laborers didn't have to be literate, but factory workers did. So once the Industrial Revolution came to pass, industrialized nations had to establish public schools for the mass education of their populations. There must now be a further advance in education to go along with the new high-tech economy. Education in science and technology will have to be taken more seriously and made lifelong, for advances will occur too rapidly for people to be able to rely solely on what they learned as youngsters. Wait, 
I have mentioned robot technicians, but that is a general term. Susan Calvin was not a robot technician. She was, specifically, a robopsychologist. She dealt with robotic intelligence, with robots' ways of thinking. I have not yet heard anyone use that term in real life, but I think the time will come when it will be used, just as robotics was used after I had invented that term. After all, robot theoreticians are trying to develop robots that can see, that can understand verbal instructions, that can speak in reply. As robots are expected to do more and more tasks, more and more efficiently, and in a more and more versatile way, they will naturally seem more intelligent. In fact, even now there are scientists at MIT and elsewhere who are working very seriously on the question of artificial intelligence. Still, even if we design and construct robots that can do their jobs in such a way as to seem intelligent, it is scarcely likely that they will be intelligent in the same way that human beings are. For one thing, their brains will be constructed of materials different from the ones in our brains. For another, their brains will be made up of different components hooked together and organized in different ways, and will approach problems, very likely, in a totally different manner. Robotic intelligence may be so different from human intelligence that it will take a new discipline, robopsychology, to deal with it. That is where Susan Calvin will come in. It is she and others like her who will deal with robots where ordinary psychologists could not begin to do so. And this might turn out to be the most important aspect of robotics, for if we study in detail two entirely different kinds of intelligence, we may learn to understand intelligence in a much more general and fundamental way than is now possible. Specifically, we will learn more about human intelligence than may be possible to learn from human intelligence alone. The Robot as Enemy It was back in 1942 that I invented the three laws of robotics, and of these the first law is, of course, the most important. It goes as follows. A robot may not injure a human being, or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. In my stories I always make it clear that the laws, especially the first law, are an inalienable part of all robots, and that robots cannot and do not disobey them. I also make it clear, though perhaps not as forcefully, that these laws aren't inherent in robots. The ores and raw chemicals of which robots are formed do not already contain the laws. The laws are there only because they are deliberately added to the design of the robotic brain, that is, to the computers that control and direct robotic action. Robots can fail to possess the laws, either because they are too simple and crude to be given behavior patterns sufficiently complex to obey them, or because the people designing the robots deliberately choose not to include the laws in their computerized makeup. So far, and perhaps it will be so for a considerable time to come, it is the first of these alternatives that holds sway. Robots are simply too crude and primitive to be able to foresee that an act of theirs will harm a human being, and to adjust their behavior to avoid that act. They are, so far, only computerized levers capable of a few types of rote behavior, and they are unable to step beyond the very narrow limits of their instructions. As a result, robots have already killed human beings, just as enormous numbers of non-computerized machines have. It is deplorable but understandable, and we can suppose that as robots are developed with more elaborate sense perceptions and with the capability of more flexible responses, there will be an increasing likelihood of building safety factors into them that will be the equivalent of the three laws. But what about the second alternative? Will human beings deliberately build robots without the laws? I'm afraid that is a distinct possibility. People are already talking about security robots. There could be robot guards patrolling the grounds of a building or even its hallways. The function of these robots could be to challenge any person entering the grounds or the building. Presumably, persons who belonged there, or who were invited there, would be carrying or would be given some card or other form of identification that would be recognized by the robot who would then let them pass. In our security-conscious times, this might even seem a good thing. 
It would cut down on vandalism and terrorism, and it would, after all, only be fulfilling the function of a trained guard dog. But security breeds the desire for more security. Once a robot became capable of stopping an intruder, it might not be enough for it merely to sound an alarm. It would be tempting to endow the robot with the capability of ejecting the intruder, even if it would do injury in the process, just as a dog might injure you in going for your leg or throat. What would happen, though, when the chairman of the board found he had left his identifying card in his other pants, and was too upset to leave the building fast enough to suit the robot? Or what if a child wandered into the building without the proper clearance? I suspect that if the robot roughed up the wrong person, there would be an immediate clamor to prevent a repetition of the error. To go to a further extreme, there is talk of robot weapons, computerized planes, tanks, artillery, and so on, that would stalk the enemy relentlessly with superhuman senses and stamina. It might be argued that this would be a way of sparing human beings. We could stay comfortably at home and let our intelligent machines do the fighting for us. If some of them were destroyed, well, they are only machines. This approach to warfare would be particularly useful if we had such machines and the enemy didn't. But even so, could we be sure that our machines could always tell an enemy from a friend? Even when all our weapons are controlled by human hands and human brains, there is the problem of friendly fire. American weapons can accidentally kill American soldiers or civilians, and have actually done so in the past. This is human error, but nevertheless it's hard to take. But what if our robot weapons were to accidentally engage in friendly fire, and wipe out American people, or even just American property? That would be far harder to take, especially if the enemy had worked out stratagems to confuse our robots and encourage them to hit our own side. No, I feel confident that attempts to use robots without safeguards won't work, and that in the end we will come round to the three laws. Intelligences Together In Our Intelligent Tools, I mentioned the possibility that robots might become so intelligent that they would eventually replace us. I suggested, with a touch of cynicism, that in view of the human record, such a replacement might be a good thing. Since then, robots have rapidly become more and more important in industry, and although they are as yet quite idiotic on the intelligence scale, they are advancing quickly. Perhaps, then, we ought to take another look at the matter of robots, or computers, which are the actual driving mechanism of robots, replacing us. The outcome, of course, depends on how intelligent computers become, and whether they will become so much more intelligent than we are that they will regard us as no more than pets, at best, or vermin at worst. This implies that intelligence is a simple thing that can be measured with something like a ruler or a thermometer, or an IQ test, and then expressed in a single number. If the average human being is measured as 100 on an overall intelligence scale, then as soon as the average computer passes 100, we will be in trouble. Is that the way it works, though? Surely there must be considerable variety in such a subtle quality as intelligence, different species of it, so to speak. I presume it takes intelligence to write a coherent essay, to choose the right words, and to place them in the right order. I also presume it takes intelligence to study some intricate technical device, to see how it works and how it might be improved, or how it might be repaired if it had stopped working. As far as writing is concerned, my intelligence is extremely high. As far as tinkering is concerned, my intelligence is extremely low. Well then, am I a genius or an imbecile? The answer is neither. I'm just good at some things and not good at others and that's true of every one of us. Suppose, then, we think about the origins of both human intelligence and computer intelligence. The human brain is built up essentially of proteins and nucleic acids. It is the product of over three billion years of hit-or-miss evolution, and the driving forces of its development have been adaptation and survival. Computers, on the other hand, are built up essentially of metal and electron surges. They are the product of some forty years of deliberate human design and development, 
and the driving force of their development has been the human desire to meet perceived human needs. If there are many aspects and varieties of intelligence among human beings themselves, isn't it certain that human and computer intelligences are going to differ widely, since they have originated and developed under such different circumstances, out of such different materials, and under the impulse of such different drives? It would seem that computers, even comparatively simple and primitive specimens, are extraordinarily good in some ways. They possess capacious memories, have virtually instant and unfailing recall, and demonstrate the ability to carry through vast numbers of repetitive arithmetical operations without weariness or error. If that sort of thing is the measure of intelligence, then already computers are far more intelligent than we are. It is because they surpass us so greatly that we use them in a million different ways, and know that our economy would fall apart if they all stopped working at once. But such computer ability is not the only measure of intelligence. In fact, we consider that ability of so little value that no matter how quick a computer is, and how impressive its solutions, we see it only as an overgrown slide rule with no true intelligence at all. What the human specialty seems to be, as far as intelligence is concerned, is the ability to see problems as a whole, to grasp solutions through intuition or insight, to see new combinations, to be able to make extraordinarily perceptive and creative guesses. Can't we program a computer to do the same thing? Not likely, for we don't know how we do it. It would seem, then, that computers should get better and better in their variety of point-by-point, short-focus intelligence, and that human beings, thanks to increasing knowledge and understanding of the brain and the growing technology of genetic engineering, may improve in their own variety of whole-problem, long-focus intelligence. Each variety of intelligence has its advantages, and in combination, human intelligence and computer intelligence each filling in the gaps and compensating for the weaknesses of the other, can advance far more rapidly than either one could alone. It will not be a case of competing and replacing at all, but of intelligences together working more efficiently than either alone within the laws of nature. My Robots I wrote my first robot story, Robbie, in May of 1939, when I was only 19 years old. What made it different from robot stories that had been written earlier was that I was determined not to make my robots symbols. They were not to be symbols of humanity's overweening arrogance. They were not to be examples of human ambitions trespassing on the domain of the Almighty. They were not to be a new Tower of Babel requiring punishment. Nor were the robots to be symbols of minority groups. They were not to be pathetic creatures that were unfairly persecuted so that I could make aesopic statements about Jews, blacks, or any other mistreated members of society. Naturally, I was bitterly opposed to such mistreatment, and I made that plain in numerous stories and essays, but not in my robot stories. In that case, what did I make my robots? I made them engineering devices. I made them tools. I made them machines to serve human ends. And I made them objects with built-in safety features. In other words, I set it up so that a robot could not kill his creator. And having outlawed that heavily overused plot, I was free to consider other, more rational consequences. Since I began writing my robot stories in 1939, I did not mention computerization in their connection. The electronic computer had not yet been invented, and I did not foresee it. I did foresee, however, that the brain had to be electronic in some fashion. However, electronic didn't seem futuristic enough. The positron, a subatomic particle exactly like the electron but of opposite electric charge, had been discovered only four years before I wrote my first robot story. It sounded very science-fictional indeed, so I gave my robots positronic brains and imagined their thoughts to consist of flashing streams of positrons coming into existence, then going out of existence almost immediately. These stories that I wrote were therefore called the Positronic Robot Series. 
but there was no greater significance than what I have just described to the use of positrons rather than electrons. At first I did not bother actually systematizing or putting into words just what the safeguards were that I imagined to be built into my robots. From the very start, though, since I wasn't going to have it possible for a robot to kill its creator, I had to stress that robots could not harm human beings, that this was an ingrained part of the makeup of their positronic brains. Thus, in the very first printed version of Robbie, I had a character refer to a robot as follows. He just can't help being faithful and loving and kind. He's a machine, made so. After writing Robbie, which John Campbell of Astounding Science Fiction rejected, I went on to other robot stories which Campbell accepted. On December 23, 1940, I came to him with an idea for a mind-reading robot, which later became Liar, and John was dissatisfied with my explanations of why the robot behaved as it did. He wanted the safeguards specified precisely so that we could understand the robot. Together, then, we worked out what came to be known as the Three Laws of Robotics. The concept was mine, for it was obtained out of the stories I had already written, but the actual wording, if I remember correctly, was beaten out then and there by the two of us. The Three Laws were logical and made sense. To begin with, there was the question of safety, which had been foremost in my mind when I began to write stories about my robots. What's more, I was aware of the fact that even without actively attempting to do harm, one could quietly, by doing nothing, allow harm to come. What was in my mind was Arthur Hugh Clough's cynical The Latest Decalogue, in which the Ten Commandments are rewritten in deeply satirical Machiavellian fashion. The one item most frequently quoted is, Thou shalt not kill, but needst not strive, officiously to keep alive. For that reason, I insisted that the first law, safety, had to be in two parts, and it came out this way. 1. A robot may not injure a human being, or through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Having got that out of the way, we had to pass on to the second law, service. Naturally, in giving the robot the built-in necessity to follow orders, you couldn't forfeit the overall concern of safety. The second law had to read as follows, then. 2. A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And finally, we had to have a third law, prudence. A robot was bound to be an expensive machine, and it must not needlessly be damaged or destroyed. Naturally, this must not be used as a way of compromising either safety or service. The third law, therefore, had to read as follows. 3. A robot must protect its own existence, as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. Of course, these laws are expressed in words, which is an imperfection. In the positronic brain, they are competing positronic potentials that are best expressed in terms of advanced mathematics, which is well beyond my ken, I assure you. However, even so, there are clear ambiguities. What constitutes harm to a human being? Must a robot obey orders given it by a child, by a madman, by a malevolent human being? Must a robot give up its own expensive and useful existence to prevent a trivial harm to an unimportant human being? What is trivial and what is unimportant? These ambiguities are not shortcomings as far as a writer is concerned. If the three laws were perfect and unambiguous, there would be no room for stories. It is in the nooks and crannies of the ambiguities that all one's plots can lodge, and which provide a foundation, if you'll excuse the pun, for Robot City. I did not specifically state the three laws in words in Liar, which appeared in the May 1941 Astounding. I did do so, however, in my next robot story, Runaround, which appeared in the March 1942 Astounding. In that issue, on line 7 of page 100, I have a character say, Now look, let's start with the three fundamental rules of robotics, and I then quote them. That, incidentally, as far as I or anyone else has been able to tell, represents the first appearance in print of the word robotics, which, apparently, I invented.
Since then, I have never had occasion, over a period of over forty years during which I wrote many stories and novels dealing with robots, to be forced to modify the three laws. However, as time passed, and as my robots advanced in complexity and versatility, I did feel that they would have to reach for something still higher. Thus, in Robots and Empire, a novel published by Doubleday in 1985, I talked about the possibility that a sufficiently advanced robot might feel it necessary to consider the prevention of harm to humanity generally as taking precedence over the prevention of harm to an individual. This I called the zeroth law of robotics, but I'm still working on that. My invention of the three laws of robotics is probably my most important contribution to science fiction. They are widely quoted outside the field, and no history of robotics could possibly be complete without mention of the three laws. In 1985, John Wiley and Sons published a huge tome, Handbook of Industrial Robotics, edited by Shimon Y. Knopf, and at the editor's request I wrote an introduction concerning the three laws. Now, it is understood that science fiction writers generally have created a pool of ideas that form a common stock into which all writers can dip. For that reason, I have never objected to other writers who have used robots that obey the three laws. I have rather been flattered, and honestly, modern science fictional robots can scarcely appear without those laws. However, I have firmly resisted the actual quotation of the three laws by any other writer. Take the laws for granted is my attitude in this matter, but don't recite them. The concepts are everyone's, but the words are mine. The Laws of Humanics My first three robot novels were essentially murder mysteries, with Elijah Bailey as the detective. Of these first three, the second novel, The Naked Son, was a locked-room mystery, in the sense that the murdered person was found with no weapon on the site, and yet no weapon could have been removed either. I managed to produce a satisfactory solution, but I did not do that sort of thing again. The fourth robot novel, Robots and Empire, was not primarily a murder mystery. Elijah Bailey had died a natural death at a good old age, the book veered toward the Foundation universe so that it was clear that both my notable series, the Robot series and the Foundation series, were going to be fused into a broader whole. No, I didn't do this for some arbitrary reason. The necessities arising out of writing sequels in the 1980s to tales originally written in the 1940s and 1950s forced my hand. In Robots and Empire, my robot character, Giscard, of whom I was very fond, began to concern himself with the laws of humanics, which, I indicated, might eventually serve as the basis for the science of psychohistory, which plays such a large role in the Foundation series. Strictly speaking, the laws of humanics should be a description, in concise form, of how human beings actually behave. No such description exists, of course. Even psychologists who study the matter scientifically, at least I hope they do, cannot present any laws, but can only make lengthy and diffuse descriptions of what people seem to do. And none of them are prescriptive. When a psychologist says that people respond in this way to a stimulus of that sort, he merely means that some do at some times. Others may do it at other times, or may not do it at all. If we have to wait for actual laws prescribing human behavior in order to establish psychohistory, and surely we must, then I suppose we will have to wait a long time. Well, then, what are we going to do about the laws of humanics? I suppose what we can do is to start in a very small way, and then later slowly build it up if we can. Thus, in Robots and Empire, it is a robot, Giscard, who raises the question of the laws of humanics. Being a robot, he must view everything from the standpoint of the three laws of robotics, these robotic laws being truly prescriptive, since robots are forced to obey them and cannot disobey them. The three laws of robotics are, one, a robot may not injure a human being, or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. 2. A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. 
Three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Well, then, it seems to me that a robot could not help but think that human beings ought to behave in such a way as to make it easier for robots to obey those laws. In fact, it seems to me that ethical human beings should be as anxious to make life easier for robots as the robots themselves would. I took up this matter in my story The Bicentennial Man, which was published in 1976. In it, I had a human character say, in part, if a man has the right to give a robot any order that does not involve harm to a human being, he should have the decency never to give a robot any order that involves harm to a robot, unless human safety absolutely requires it. With great power goes great responsibility, and if the robots have three laws to protect men, is it too much to ask that men have a law or two to protect robots? For instance, the first law is in two parts— the first part, a robot may not injure a human being, is absolute, and nothing need be done about that. The second part, or through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm, leaves things open a bit. A human being might be about to come to harm because of some event involving an inanimate object. A heavy weight might be likely to fall upon him, or he may slip and be about to fall into a lake or any one of uncountable other misadventures of the sort may be involved. Here the robot simply must try to rescue the human being, pull him from under, steady him on his feet, and so on. Or a human being might be threatened by some form of life other than human, a lion, for instance, and the robot must come to his defense. But what if harm to a human being is threatened by the action of another human being? There a robot must decide what to do. Can he save one human being without harming the other? Or if there must be harm, what course of action must he pursue to make it minimal? It would be a lot easier for the robot if human beings were as concerned about the welfare of human beings as robots are expected to be. And indeed, any reasonable human code of ethics would instruct human beings to care for each other and to do no harm to each other, which is, after all, the mandates that humans gave robots. Therefore, the first law of humanics from the robot's standpoint is, 1. A human being may not injure another human being, or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. If this law is carried through, the robot will be left guarding the human being from misadventures with inanimate objects and with non-human life, something which poses no ethical dilemmas for it. Of course, the robot must still guard against harm done a human being unwittingly by another human being. It must also stand ready to come to the aid of a threatened human being if another human being on the scene simply cannot get to the scene of action quickly enough. But then even a robot may unwittingly harm a human being, and even a robot may not be fast enough to get to the scene of action in time, or skilled enough to take the necessary action. Nothing is perfect. That brings us to the second law of robotics, which compels a robot to obey all orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. This means that human beings can give robots any order without limitation, as long as it does not involve harm to a human being. But then a human being might order a robot to do something impossible, or give it an order that might involve a robot in a dilemma that would do damage to its brain. Thus, in my short story, Liar, published in 1940, I had a human being deliberately put a robot into a dilemma where its brain burnt out and ceased to function. We might even imagine that as a robot becomes more intelligent and self-aware, its brain might become sensitive enough to undergo harm if it were forced to do something needlessly embarrassing or undignified. Consequently, the second law of humanics would be to a human being must give orders to a robot that preserve robotic existence, unless such orders cause harm or discomfort to human beings. The third law of robotics is designed to protect the robot, but from the robotic view it can be seen that it does not go far enough. The robot must sacrifice its existence if the first or second law makes that necessary. Where the first law is concerned, there can be no argument. A robot must give up its existence if that is the only way it can avoid doing harm to a human being or can prevent harm from coming to a human being. 
If we admit the innate superiority of any human being to any robot, which is something I am a little reluctant to admit, actually, then this is inevitable. On the other hand, must a robot give up its existence merely in obedience to an order that might be trivial or even malicious? In the Bicentennial Man I have some hoodlums deliberately order a robot to take itself apart for the fun of watching that happen. The third law of humanics must therefore be, three, a human being must not harm a robot, or through inaction allow a robot to come to harm, unless such harm is needed to keep a human being from harm, or to allow a vital order to be carried out. Of course, we cannot enforce these laws as we can the robotic laws. We cannot design human brains as we design robot brains. It is, however, a beginning, and I honestly think that if we are to have power over intelligent robots, we must feel a corresponding responsibility for them, as the human character in my story, The Bicentennial Man, said. Cybernetic Organism A robot is a robot, and an organism is an organism. An organism, as we all know, is built up of cells. From the molecular standpoint, its key molecules are nucleic acids and proteins. These float in a watery medium, and the whole has a bony support system. It is useless to go on with the description, since we are all familiar with organisms and since we are examples of them ourselves. A robot, on the other hand, is, as usually pictured in science fiction, an object more or less resembling a human being, constructed out of strong, rust-resistant metal. Science fiction writers are generally chary of describing the robotic details too closely, since they are not usually essential to the stories, and the writers are generally at a loss how to do so. The impression one gets from the stories, however, is that a robot is wired so that it has wires through which electricity flows, rather than tubes through which blood flows. The ultimate source of power is either unnamed, or is assumed to partake of the nature of nuclear power. What of the robotic brain? When I wrote my first few robot stories in 1939 and 1940, I imagined a positronic brain of a spongy type of platinum-iridium alloy. It was platinum-iridium because that is a particularly inert metal, and is least likely to undergo chemical changes. It was spongy so that it would offer an enormous surface on which electrical patterns could be formed and unformed. It was positronic because four years before my first robot story, the positron had been discovered as a reverse kind of electron, so that positronic in place of electronic had a delightful science fiction sound. Nowadays, of course, my positronic platinum-iridium brain is hopelessly archaic. Even ten years after its invention, it became outmoded. By the end of the 1940s, we came to realize that a robot's brain must be a kind of computer. Indeed, if a robot were to be as complex as the robots in my most recent novels, the robot brain computer must be every bit as complex as the human brain. It must be made of tiny microchips, no larger than, and as complex as, brain cells. But now let us try to imagine something that is neither organism nor robot, but a combination of the two. Perhaps we can think of it as an organism robot or orbot. That would clearly be a poor name, for it is only robot with the first two letters transposed. To say orgabot instead is to be stuck with a rather ugly word. We might call it a robot organism or a robotanism, which again is ugly, or roborg. To my ears, Roborg doesn't sound bad, but we can't have that. Something else has arisen. The science of computers was given the name cybernetics by Norbert Wiener a generation ago, so that if we consider something that is part robot and part organism, and remember that a robot is cybernetic in nature, we might think of the mixture as a cybernetic organism, or a cyborg. In fact, that is the name that has stuck and is used. To see what a cyborg might be, let's try starting with a human organism and moving toward a robot. And when we are quite done with that, let's start with a robot and move toward a human being. To move from a human organism toward a robot, we must begin replacing portions of the human organism with robotic parts. 
We already do that in some ways. For instance, a good percentage of the original material of my teeth is now metallic, and metal is, of course, the robotic substance par excellence. The replacements don't have to be metallic, of course. Some parts of my teeth are now ceramic in nature, and can't be told at a glance from the natural dentine. Still, even though dentine is ceramic in appearance and even to an extent in chemical structure, it was originally laid down by living material and bears the marks of its origin. The ceramic that has replaced the dentine shows no trace of life, now or ever. We can go further. My breastbone, which had to be split longitudinally in an operation a few years back, is now held together by metallic staples, which have remained in place ever since. My sister-in-law has an artificial hip joint replacement. There are people who have artificial arms or legs, and such non-living limbs are being designed, as time passes on, to be ever more complex and useful. There are people who have lived for days and even months with artificial hearts, and many more people who live for years with pacemakers. We can imagine, little by little, this part and that part of the human being replaced by inorganic materials and engineering devices. Is there any part which we would find difficult to replace, even in imagination? I don't think anyone would hesitate there. Replace every part of the human being but one, the limbs, the heart, the liver, the skeleton, and so on, and the product would remain human. It would be a human being with artificial parts, but it would be a human being. But what about the brain? Surely, if there is one thing that makes us human, it is the brain. If there is one thing that makes us a human individual, it is the intensely complex makeup, the emotions, the learning, the memory content of our particular brain. You can't simply replace a brain with a thinking device off some factory shelf. You have to put in something that incorporates all that a natural brain has learned, that possesses all its memory, and that mimics its exact pattern of working. An artificial limb might not work exactly like a natural one, but might still serve the purpose. The same might be true of an artificial lung, kidney, or liver. An artificial brain, however, must be the precise replica of the brain it replaces, or the human being in question is no longer the same human being. It is the brain, then, that is the sticking point in going from human organism to robot. And the reverse. In The Bicentennial Man, I described the passage of my robot hero, Andrew Martin, from robot to man. Little by little he had himself changed, till his every visible part was human in appearance. He displayed an intelligence that was increasingly equivalent or even superior to that of a man. He was an artist, a historian, a scientist, an administrator. He forced the passage of laws guaranteeing robotic rights and achieved respect and admiration in the fullest degree. Yet at no point could he make himself accepted as a man. The sticking point here, too, was his robotic brain. He found that he had to deal with that before the final hurdle could be overcome. Therefore we come down to the dichotomy body and brain. The ultimate cyborgs are those in which the body and brain don't match. That means we can have two classes of complete cyborgs, a, a robotic brain in a human body, or b, a human brain in a robotic body. We can take it for granted that in estimating the worth of a human being, or a robot for that matter, we judge first by superficial appearance. I can very easily imagine a man seeing a woman of superlative beauty and gazing in awe and wonder at the sight. What a beautiful woman, he will say, or think, and he could easily imagine himself in love with her on the spot. In romances, I believe that happens as a matter of routine. And, of course, a woman seeing a man of superlative beauty is surely likely to react in precisely the same way. If you fall in love with a striking beauty, you are scarcely likely to spend much time asking if she, or he, of course, has any brains, or possesses a good character, or has good judgment, or kindness, or warmth. If you find out eventually that good looks are the person's only redeeming quality, you are liable to make excuses and continue to be guided, for a time at least, by the conditioned reflex of erotic response. Eventually, of course, you will tire of good looks without content, 
but who knows how long that will take. On the other hand, a person with a large number of good qualities, who happen to be distinctly plain, might not be likely to entangle you in the first place, unless you were intelligent enough to see those good qualities, so that you might settle down to a lifetime of happiness. What I am saying, then, is that a cyborg with a robotic brain in a human body is going to be accepted by most, if not all, people as a human being while a cyborg with a human brain in a robotic body is going to be accepted by most, if not all, people as a robot. You are, after all, at least to most people, what you seem to be. These two diametrically opposed cyborgs will not, however, pose a problem to human beings to the same degree. Consider the robotic brain in the human body and ask why the transfer should be made. A robotic brain is better off in a robotic body, since a human body is far the more fragile of the two. You might have a young and stalwart human body in which the brain has been damaged by trauma and disease, and you might think, why waste that magnificent human body? Let's put a robotic brain in it so that it can live out its life. If you were to do that, the human being that resulted would not be the original. It would be a different individual human being. You would not be conserving an individual, but merely a specific mindless body. And a human body, however fine, is, without the brain that goes with it, a cheap thing. Every day half a million new bodies come into being. There is no need to save any one of them if the brain is done. On the other hand, what about a human brain in a robotic body? A human brain doesn't last forever, but it can last up to ninety years without falling into total uselessness. It is not at all unknown to have a ninety-year-old who is still sharp and capable of rational and worthwhile thought. And yet we also know that many a superlative mind has vanished after twenty or thirty years because the body that housed it, and was worthless in the absence of the mind, had become uninhabitable through trauma or disease. There would be a strong impulse, then, to transfer a perfectly good, even superior brain into a robotic body to give it additional decades of useful life. Thus, when we say cyborg, we are very likely to think, just about exclusively, of a human brain in a robotic body, and we are going to think of that as a robot. We might argue that a human mind is a human mind, and that it is the mind that counts and not the surrounding support mechanism, and we would be right. I'm sure that any rational court would decide that a human brain cyborg would have all the legal rights of a man. He could vote, he must not be enslaved, and so on. And yet suppose a cyborg were challenged, prove that you have a human brain and not a robotic brain, before I let you have human rights. The easiest way for a cyborg to offer the proof is for him to demonstrate that he is not bound by the three laws of robotics. Since the three laws enforce socially acceptable behavior, this means he must demonstrate that he is capable of human, that is, nasty, behavior. The simplest and most unanswerable argument is simply to knock the challenger down, breaking his jaw in the process, since no robot could do that. In fact, in my story, Evidence, which appeared in 1947, I use this as a way of proving someone is not a robot. But in that case there was a catch. But if a cyborg must continually offer violence in order to prove he has a human brain, that will not necessarily win him friends. For that matter, even if he is accepted as human and allowed to vote and to rent hotel rooms and do all the other things human beings can do, there must nevertheless be some regulations that distinguish between him and complete human beings. The cyborg would be stronger than a man, and his metallic fists could be viewed as lethal weapons. He might still be forbidden to strike a human being, even in self-defense. He couldn't engage in various sports on an equal basis with human beings, and so on. Ah, but need a human brain be housed in a metallic, robotic body? What about housing it in a body made of ceramic and plastic and fiber, so that it looks and feels like a human body, and has a human brain besides? But, you know, I suspect that the cyborg will still have his troubles. He'll be different. No matter how small the difference is, people will seize upon it. 
We know that people who have human brains and full human bodies sometimes hate each other because of a slight difference in skin pigmentation, or a slight variation in the shape of the nose, eyes, lips, or hair. We know that people who show no difference in any of the physical characteristics that have come to represent a cause for hatred may yet be at daggers drawn over matters that are not physical at all but cultural, differences in religion or in political outlook or in place of birth or in language or in just the accent of a language. Let's face it, cyborgs will have their difficulties no matter what. The Sense of Humor would a robot feel a yearning to be human? You might answer that question with a counter-question. Does a Chevrolet feel a yearning to be a Cadillac? The counter-question makes the unstated comment that a machine has no yearnings. But the very point is that a robot is not quite a machine, at least in potentiality. A robot is a machine that is made as much like a human being as it is possible to make it and somewhere there may be a boundary line that may be crossed. We can apply this to life. An earthworm doesn't yearn to be a snake. A hippopotamus doesn't yearn to be an elephant. We have no reason to think such creatures are self-conscious and dream of something more than they are. Chimpanzees and gorillas seem to be self-aware, but we have no reason to think that they yearn to be human. A human being, however, dreams of an afterlife, and yearns to become one of the angels. Somewhere, life crossed a boundary line. At some point, a species arose that was not only aware of itself, but had the capacity to be dissatisfied with itself. Perhaps a similar boundary line will someday be crossed in the construction of robots. But if we grant that a robot might someday aspire to humanity, in what way would he so aspire? He might aspire to the possession of the legal and social status that human beings are born to. That was the theme of my story, The Bicentennial Man, and in his pursuit of such status, my robot hero was willing to give up all his robotic qualities, one by one, right down to his immortality. That story, however, was more philosophical than realistic. What is there about a human being that a robot might properly envy? What human physical or mental characteristic? No sensible robot would envy human fragility or human incapacity to withstand mild changes in the environment or human need for sleep or aptitude for the trivial mistake or tendency to infectious and degenerative disease or incapacitation through illogical storms of emotion. He might more properly envy the human capacity for friendship and love his wide-ranging curiosity, his eagerness for experience. I would like to suggest, though, that a robot who yearned for humanity might well find that what he would most want to understand, and most frustratingly fail to understand, would be the human sense of humor. The sense of humor is by no means universal among human beings, though it does cut across all cultures. I have known many people who didn't laugh, but who looked at you in puzzlement or perhaps disdain if you tried to be funny. I need go no further than my father, who routinely shrugged off my cleverest sallies as unworthy of the attention of a serious man. Fortunately, my mother laughed at all my jokes, and most uninhibitedly, or I might have grown up emotionally stunted. The curious thing about the sense of humor, however, is that, as far as I have observed, no human being will admit to its lack. People might admit they hate dogs and dislike children. They might cheerfully own up to cheating on their income tax or on their marital partner as a matter of right, and might not object to being considered inhumane or dishonest through the simple expediency of switching adjectives and calling themselves realistic or businesslike. However, accuse them of lacking a sense of humor, and they will deny it hotly every time, no matter how openly and how often they display such a lack. My father, for instance, always maintained that he had a keen sense of humor, and would prove it as soon as he heard a joke worth laughing at, though he never did in my experience. Why, then, do people object to being accused of humorlessness? My theory is that people recognize, subliminally if not openly, that a sense of humor is typically human, more so than any other characteristic, and refuse demotion to subhumanity. Only once did I take up the matter of a sense of humor in a science fiction story, 
and that was in my story Jokester, which first appeared in the December 1956 issue of Infinity Science Fiction, and which was most recently reprinted in my collection The Best Science Fiction of Isaac Asimov, Doubleday, 1986. The protagonist of the story spent his time telling jokes to a computer. I quoted six of them in the course of the story. A computer, of course, is an immobile robot, or, which is the same thing, a robot is a mobile computer. So the story deals with robots and jokes. Unfortunately, the problem in the story for which a solution was sought was not the nature of humor, but the source of all the jokes one hears. And there is an answer, too, but you'll have to read the story for that. However, I don't just write science fiction. I write whatever it falls into my busy little head to write, and by some undeserved stroke of good fortune, my various publishers are under the weird impression that it is illegal not to publish any manuscript I hand them. You can be sure that I never disabuse them of this ridiculous notion. Thus, when I decided to write a joke book, I did, and Houghton Mifflin published it in 1971, under the title of Isaac Asimov's Treasury of Humor. In it, I told 640 jokes that I happened to have as part of my memorized repertoire. I also have enough for a sequel, to be entitled Isaac Asimov Laughs Again, but I can't seem to get around to writing it no matter how long I sit at the keyboard and how quickly I manipulate the keys. I intersperse those jokes with my own theories concerning what is funny and how one makes what is funny even funnier. Mind you, there are as many different theories of humor as there are people who write on the subject, and no two theories are alike. Some are, of course, much stupider than others, and I felt no embarrassment whatever in adding my own thoughts on the subject to the general mountain of commentary. It is my feeling, to put it as succinctly as possible, that the one necessary ingredient in every successful joke is a sudden alteration in point of view. The more radical the alteration, the more suddenly it is demanded, the more quickly it is seen, the louder the laugh and the greater the joy. Let me give you an example with a joke that is one of the few I made up myself. Jim comes into a bar and finds his best friend Bill at a corner table gravely nursing a glass of beer and wearing a look of solemnity on his face. Jim sits down at the table and says sympathetically, What's the matter, Bill? Bill sighs and says, My wife ran off yesterday with my best friend. Jim says in a shocked voice, What are you talking about, Bill? I'm your best friend. To which Bill answers softly, Not any more. I trust you see the change in point of view. The natural supposition is that poor Bill is sunk in gloom over a tragic loss. It is only with the last three words that you realize quite suddenly that he is in actual fact delighted and the average human male is sufficiently ambivalent about his wife, however beloved she might be, to greet this particular change in point of view with delight. Now, if a robot is designed to have a brain that responds to logic only, and of what use would any other kind of robot brain be to humans who are hoping to employ robots for their own purposes, a sudden change in point of view would be hard to achieve. It would imply that the rules of logic were wrong in the first place, or were capable of a flexibility that they obviously don't have. In addition, it would be dangerous to build ambivalence into a robot brain. What we want from him is decision, and not the to be or not to be of a Hamlet. Imagine, then, telling a robot the joke I have just given you, and imagine the robot staring at you solemnly after you are done, and questioning you thus. Robot. But why is Jim no longer Bill's best friend? You have not described Jim as doing anything that would cause Bill to be angry with him or disappointed in him. You. Well, no, it's not that Jim has done anything. It's that someone else has done something for Bill that was so wonderful that he has been promoted over Jim's head and has instantly become Bill's new best friend. Robot. But who has done this? You. The man who ran away with Bill's wife, of course. Robot, after a thoughtful pause, but that can't be so. Bill must have felt profound affection for his wife and a great sadness over her loss. Is that not how human males feel about their wives, and how they would react to their loss? You, in theory, yes. However, it turns out that Bill strongly disliked his wife and was glad someone had run off with her. Robot, 
after another thoughtful pause, but you did not say that was so. You, I know, that's what makes it funny. I led you in one direction and then suddenly let you know that was the wrong direction. Robot, is it funny to mislead a person? You, giving up. Well, let's get on with building this house. In fact, some jokes actually depend on the illogical responses of human beings. Consider this one. The inveterate horse player paused before taking his place at the betting windows and offered up a fervent prayer to his maker. Blessed Lord, he murmured with mountain-moving sincerity, I know you don't approve of my gambling, but just this once, Lord, just this once, please let me break even. I need the money so badly. If you were so foolish as to tell this joke to a robot, he would immediately say, but to break even means that he would leave the races with precisely the amount of money he had when he entered. Isn't that so? Yes, that's so. Then if he needs the money so badly, all he need do is not bet at all, and it would be just as though he had broken even. Yes, but he has this unreasoning need to gamble. You mean even if he loses? Yes. But that makes no sense. But the point of the joke is that the gambler doesn't understand this. You mean it's funny if a person lacks any sense of logic and is possessed of not even the simplest understanding? And what can you do but turn back to building the house again? But tell me, is this so different from dealing with the ordinary humorless human being? I once told my father this joke. Mrs. Jones, the landlady, woke up in the middle of the night because there were strange noises outside her door. She looked out, and there was Robinson, one of her boarders, forcing a frightened horse up the stairs. She shrieked, What are you doing, Mr. Robinson? He said, Putting the horse in the bathroom. For goodness sake, why? Well, old Higginbotham is such a wise guy. Whatever I tell him, he answers, I know, I know, in such a superior way. Well, in the morning he'll go to the bathroom, and he'll come out yelling, There's a horse in the bathroom, and I'll yawn and say, I know, I know. And what was my father's response? He said, Isaac, Isaac, you're a city boy, so you don't understand. You can't push a horse up the stairs if he doesn't want to go. Personally, I thought that was funnier than the joke. Anyway, I don't see why we should particularly want a robot to have a sense of humor, but the point is that the robot himself might want to have one. And how do we give it to him? Robots in Combination I have been inventing stories about robots now for very nearly half a century. In that time, I have rung almost every conceivable change upon the theme. Mind you, it was not my intention to compose an encyclopedia of robot nuances. It was not even my intention to write about them for half a century. It just happened that I survived that long and maintained my interest in the concept. And it also just happened that in attempting to think of new story ideas involving robots, I ended up thinking about nearly everything. For instance, in the sixth volume of the Robot City series, there are the Chemfets, which have been introduced into the hero's body in order to replicate and eventually give him direct psychoelectronic control over the core computer and hence all the robots of Robot City. Well, in my book Foundation's Edge, Doubleday, 1982, my hero, Golan Trevise, before taking off in a spaceship, makes contact with an advanced computer by placing his hands on an indicated place on the desk before him. And as he and the computer held hands, their thinking merged. He saw the room with complete clarity, not just in the direction in which he was looking, but all around, and above, and below. He saw every room in the spaceship, and he saw outside as well. The sun had risen, but he could look at it directly without being dazzled. He felt the gentle wind and its temperature and the sounds of the world about him. He detected the planet's magnetic field and the tiny electrical charges on the wall of the ship. He became aware of the controls of the ship. He knew that if he wanted to lift the ship or turn it or accelerate or make use of any of its abilities, the process was the same as that of performing the analogous process to his body. He had but to use his will. That was as close as I could come to picturing the result of a mind-computer interface, and now, in connection with this new book, I can't help thinking of it further. 
I suppose that the first time human beings learned how to form an interface between the human mind and another sort of intelligence was when they tamed the horse and learned how to use it as a form of transportation. This reached its highest point when human beings rode horses directly, and when a pull at a rein, the touch of a spur, a squeeze of the knees, or just a cry, could make the horse react in accordance with the human will. It is no wonder that primitive Greeks seeing horsemen invade the comparatively broad Thessalian plains, the part of Greece most suitable to horsemanship, thought they were seeing a single animal with a human torso and a horse's body. Thus was invented the centaur. Again, there are trick drivers. There are expert stuntmen who can make an automobile do marvelous things. One might expect that a New Guinea native who had never seen or heard of an automobile before might believe that such stunts were being carried through by a strange and monstrous living organism that had, as part of its structure, a portion with a human appearance within its stomach. But a person plus a horse is but an imperfect fusion of intelligence, and a person plus an automobile is but an extension of human muscles by mechanical linkages. A horse can easily disobey signals, or even run away in uncontrollable panic, and an automobile can break down or skid at an inconvenient moment. The fusion of human and computer, however, ought to be a much closer approach to the ideal. It may be an extension of the mind itself, as I tried to make plain in Foundation's Edge, a multiplication and intensification of sense perception, an incredible extension of the will. Under such circumstances, might not the fusion represent in a very real sense a single organism, a kind of cybernetic centaur? And once such a union is established, would the human fraction wish to break it? Would he not feel such a break to be an unbearable loss, and be unable to live with the impoverishment of mind and will he would then have to face? In my novel, Golan Treviz could break away from the computer at will, and suffered no ill effects as a result, but perhaps that is not realistic. Another issue that appears now and then in the Robot City series concerns the interaction of robot and robot. This has not played a part in most of my stories, simply because I generally had a single robot character of importance in any given story, and I dealt entirely with the matter of the interaction between that single robot and various human beings. Consider robots in combination. The first law states that a robot cannot injure a human being, or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. But suppose two robots are involved, and that one of them, through inadvertence, lack of knowledge, or special circumstances, is engaged in a course of action, quite innocently, that will clearly injure a human being. And suppose the second robot, with greater knowledge or insight, is aware of this. Would he not be required by the first law to stop the first robot from committing the injury? If there were no other way, would he not be required by the first law to destroy the first robot without hesitation or regret? Thus, in my book Robots and Empire, Double Day, 1985, a robot is introduced to whom human beings have been defined as those speaking with a certain accent. The heroine of the book does not speak with that accent, and therefore the robot feels free to kill her. That robot is promptly destroyed by a second robot. The situation is similar for the second law, in which robots are forced to obey orders given them by human beings, provided those orders do not violate the first law. If of the two robots, one through inadvertence or lack of understanding does not obey an order, the second must either carry through the order itself or force the first to do so. Thus, in an intense scene in Robots and Empire, the villainous gives one robot a direct order. The robot hesitates because the order may cause harm to the heroine. For a while, then, there is a confrontation in which the villainess reinforces her own order while a second robot tries to reason the first robot into a greater realization of the harm that will be done to the heroine. Here we have a case where one robot urges another to obey the second law in a truer manner, and to withstand a human being in so doing. It is the third law, however, that brings up the naughtiest problem where robots in combination are concerned. The third law states that a robot must protect its own existence, where that is consistent with the first and second laws. 
But what if two robots are concerned? Is each merely concerned with its own existence, as a literal reading of the third law would make it seem? Or would each robot feel the need for helping the other maintain its own existence? As I said, this problem never arose with me as long as I dealt with only one robot per story. Sometimes there were other robots, but they were distinctly subsidiary characters, merely spear carriers, so to speak. However, first in The Robots of Dawn, Doubleday, 1983, and then in its sequel, Robots and Empire, I had two robots of equal importance. One of these was R. Daniil Olivaw, a humaniform robot who could not easily be told from a human being, who had earlier appeared in The Caves of Steel, Doubleday, 1954, and in its sequel, The Naked Sun, Doubleday, 1957. The other was R. Giscard Reventlov, who had a more orthodox metallic appearance. Both robots were advanced to the point where their minds were of human complexity. It was these two robots who were engaged in the struggle with the villainous, the Lady Vasilia. It was Giscard who, such were the exigencies of the plot, was being ordered by Vasilia to leave the service of Gladia, the heroine, and enter her own and it was Daniil who tenaciously argued the point that Giscard ought to remain with Gladia. Giscard has the ability to exert a limited mental control over human beings, and Daniil points out that Vasilia ought to be controlled for Gladia's safety. He even argues the good of humanity in the abstract, the zeroth law, in favor of such an action. Daniil's arguments weaken the effect of Vasilia's orders, but not sufficiently. Giscard is made to hesitate, but cannot be forced to take action. Vasilia, however, decides that Daniil is too dangerous. If he continues to argue, he might force Giscard his way. She therefore orders her own robots to inactivate Daniil, and further orders Daniil not to resist. Daniil must obey the order, and Vasilia's robots advance to the task. It is then that Giscard acts. Her four robots are inactivated, and Vasilia herself crumples into a forgetful sleep. Later, Daniil asks Giscard to explain what happened. Giscard says, When she ordered the robots to dismantle you, friend Daniil, and showed a clear emotion of pleasure at the prospect, your need, added to what the concept of the zeroth law had already done, superseded the second law, and rivaled the first law. It was the combination of the zeroth law, psychohistory, my loyalty to Lady Gladia, and your need that dictated my action. Daniil now argues that his own need, he being merely a robot, ought not to have influenced Giscard at all. Giscard obviously agrees, yet he says, It is a strange thing, friend Daniil. I do not know how it came about. At the moment when the robots advanced toward you, and Lady Vasilia expressed her savage pleasure, my positronic pathway pattern reformed in an anomalous fashion. For a moment I thought of you as a human being, and I reacted accordingly. Daniil said, That was wrong. Giscard said, I know that. And yet, and yet, if it were to happen again, I believe the same anomalous change would take place again. And Daniil cannot help but feel that if the situation were reversed, he too would act in the same way. In other words, the robots had reached a stage of complexity where they had begun to lose the distinction between robots and human beings, where they could see each other as friends and have the urge to save each other's existence. End of Robot Visions by Isaac Asimov Illustrations by Ralph McQuarrie Read by Richard Howenstein in the studios of the American Printing House for the Blind, Louisville, Kentucky, for the Library of Congress, November 2000. Published by the Penguin Group, Penguin Books USA, Incorporated, 375 Hudson Street, New York, New York, 10014, USA. Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. End of book.